This is an NBC News special report. The trial of Donald J. Trump. Here is Lester Holt. Good day, everyone. It's 1 o'clock in the East. We're coming on the air to bring you NBC News live coverage of the Senate impeachment trial of President Trump and what a fateful day it could be. Five and a half months after a whistleblower complaint triggered the sequence of events that led to the president's impeachment and this trial, the Senate may now be on the verge of bringing it all to a close without calling for new witnesses or new evidence. Today, the Senate will deliberate and vote on that question before reaching a verdict on the president himself. Either way, the consequences will be felt for a very long time to come, including nine months from now on Election Day. There have been a lot of developments already today. Let's get right to Hallie Jackson at the White House with more about the Bolton book. Hallie. And Lester, this is just all coming out in the last 30 minutes or so with a new revelation now from The New York Times that is sure to play out with Democrats in particular as this impeachment trial appears to be starting to wrap up. It is yet another that shoe you could say that is dropping. And it is this. The New York Times is reporting on that as yet unpublished book by former National Security Advisor John Bolton. And talking now in, in this book, Bolton apparently writes, according to the Times, of a meeting that President Trump had with him and others in early May. So that is two months before that now infamous July 25th phone call between President Trump and the Ukrainian president, Pre President Vladimir Zelensky. The Times says that President Trump told Ambassador Bolton at the time to call President Zelensky to ensure that Zelensky would meet with Rudy Giuliani, the president's personal attorney, who was planning a trip to Ukraine to talk about the investigations that the president wanted. In the room, according to the New York Times reporting on this Bolton manuscript, were others, including Pat Cipollone, Lester, the lead White House counsel, uh, manning point on this impeachment trial defense, Mick Mulvaney, the acting chief of staff as well, and Rudy Giuliani. We have reached out to all of these entities for comment, and I can tell you that in just the last couple of minutes, NBC News is getting a statement on this from President Trump that says, I never instructed John Bolton to set up a meeting for Rudy Giuliani, one of the greatest corruption fighters in America and by far the greatest mayor in the history of New York City, to meet with President Zelensky. The president saying definitively that meeting never happened. Now, Lester, you could say fine. Is this now a he said, he said situation? There are others who were, according to the manuscript that The New York Times is reporting on, in the room as well, including Cipollone, including Mulvaney, who could either back up or deny what either of these individuals is saying here. Uh, I can tell you that I spoke with an aide to former Ambassador Bolton, who says that he is not expected to comment, at least not right now. We'll be waiting and watching for more on that. But already, this is, again, something that I think you will expect to see Democrats pick up on. This is harkens back to earlier this week, right, Lester, on Sunday, when that first sort of Bolton revelation came out from this unpublished manuscript. This is yet another piece of information that Democrats may point to to say this is why we need documents and witnesses. This is why we want to have more information and we want to hear from John Bolton directly in this call for witnesses, despite overnight news that indicates that that is not likely to happen, given that a key Republican senator, Lamar Alexander, has indicated he will vote no on witnesses, Lester. So a lot of moving pieces here at the White House on Capitol Hill this morning. All right, let's talk about some of the other moving pieces by turning to Casey Hunt on Capitol Hill. Casey, we went into this day thinking this would be over at some point, even if late tonight. Now there's some question about that. There is, Lester, uh, and it actually has nothing to do necessarily with what Hallie was just reporting about the Bolton Book News, although that, of course, is reverberating across Capitol Hill this morning. This has to do with how exactly uh, we move from this witness vote to what's expected to be the end of this trial, which we've known all along was going to end in the acquittal of President Trump, because it takes a supermajority to actually convict a president, and there are simply not that many votes to do it here in the Senate. So there was some thinking, and certainly we've talked to many Republicans who really want this to be over and done with as fast as possible. There was uh, speculation and, and discussion of a potential acquittal vote uh, almost immediately after uh, the vote on witnesses. That witness vote set to take place 5, 6 o'clock this afternoon after approximately four hours of debate around uh, moving on to that motion. Uh, now, though, there are some conversations about perhaps extending this trial a few more days, and we're nailing down exactly uh, how this may unfold, and it's all still very fluid as we open the proceedings today. Uh, but there are conversations that this could go as long as Wednesday, that potentially uh, you could see some additional speaking around uh, the conclusion of the trial before we actually moved to an acquittal vote. Now, of course, 
That would put the acquittal vote, if it extended out that long, past the President's State of the Union address. And we know that the White House defense team uh, was particularly interested in having this wrap up before that happened so that he wasn't coming down here to the Capitol building with a cloud still hanging over his head. But we do know senators uh, in the Clinton impeachment trial were given a period of time to make closing remarks. There were uh, deliberations in a closed session. And it seems like there may be some uh, interest among senators in having a period of time for each of them to make their views known. We're not sure what that means uh, through the weekend. And we should really underscore that the drama of what is unfolding is going to be here this afternoon on this witness question. This really is kind of the hinge uh, that will either tell us, OK, we're on a path to acquitting the president or opening the door uh, to more witnesses. And as we've been reporting, uh, the Republicans are confident that they have the votes to prevent witnesses from being called, Lester. All right. Uh, thank you, Casey. Joining me here, moderator of Meet the Press. Chuck Todd, an NBC News legal analyst and former U.S. attorney Carol Lamb. Chuck, uh, let me begin with you. Uh, Lamar Alexander kind of put the nail in this last night. He did, um, and it was an interesting rationale that he made. He essentially accepted the Democrats' case, said what the president did was inappropriate, and made the decision because it was a partisan impeachment process um, that in his mind it didn't, one of the reasons that it didn't rise to ousting him from office. And he made mention of the current that he thought if you did do this, it could pour gasoline on a fire. What's interesting here is that we now have another new senator that has come out against witnesses, but actually believes the president did commit an impeachable offense. This is Marco Rubio. Marco Rubio um, does believe it's impeachable, but he says this, just because actions meet a standard of impeachment, he writes, does not mean it is in the best interest of the country to remove a president from office. And his rationale is completely on this issue of because it's partisan and essentially it will div divide the country unnecessarily. So we are ending in what I think is an interest, an awkward period politically. You now have, this is now the third senator that is, that is now publicly saying they believe the Democrats made their case. The third senator is Republican Senator Jerry Moran of Kansas. He didn't give a long explanation. He said he was against witnesses because he doesn't believe they're going to change the facts that the Democrats have presented. But are, but are those statements that are designed to get on the record of yes. history? I, that's exactly what they are. And I think this is a Marco Rubio who I think does believe he wants to have a future in the Republican Party. And I think we all know, you look at someone like him, he may be writing this with the assumption more information is going to come out. Lo and behold, as he posts this on Medium, more information about what else, how much, how many other people the president involved in this scheme. But it is interesting, the president, on one hand, the Democrats clearly have a majority of the United States Senate that believes they've made their case. Um, at the end of the day, because the president has so successfully has this base of support inside the Republican Party, he has made it politically nearly impossible for people, even in his own party, who believe he committed wrongdoing, perhaps to go that next step. And, and Carol, where does that leave the House managers if they begin to wrap up their case right now? What's left to be said? Yeah, well, if, any, if anything points out to how this is really a political process and not a court process, it's these kinds of these kinds of statements. Because, you know, if, if I could try a criminal case and at the end have the jurors say to me, you know what, you proved your case, I just, you know, I'm just going to nullify this entire proceeding because, uh, because I like the guy or because I'm worried about what my friends will say to me. This would be the kind of result. I mean, I, I think what this... What this, practically speaking, has done is it has raised the bar for impeachment any time going forward mm -hmm. to basically, uh, you better find a way of characterizing what the president did as a crime because uh, you need to knock out all of these arguments that people listen to for hours and hours and hours about how you have to charge So maybe crime. you would have to shoot someone in the middle of Fifth Avenue. Or, or, or the or, other, I think the other thing is it has to be yeah. bipartisan. Right, it has to be. But that, I suppose that's that's another way to do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But but um, but the the part that concerns me is that uh, there will be enough concern going forward if you have a close vote that uh, you know maybe in this instance they would have charged bribery if they had known it was I, going to end up like this. I think the thing that's uncomfortable here is the idea that if you can if you basically can harness enough support in the public, you can bulldoze, you can essentially bulldoze the Constitution. Um, perhaps, or you can, and look, we are a democracy. Uh, that is what we are. We're a republic. Um, we're a democratic republic. But that is, I mean, we are essentially saying 
if you commit impeachable offenses, you can get away with it if you're popular enough. And perhaps that is the standard the framers thought they would have in mind. Perhaps that's why they put politicians in charge of, of, of being the jurors, although we should remember the framers had the Senate be the jurors back when they weren't directly elected by the people. They were appointments um, by state legislatures. But so at the end of the day, we can't fully know exactly what the framers thought, what kind of best interests in the country the, the Senate would think of. But at the end of the day, this is, it, it is fascinating that we're going to have, I think you're going to have quite a few senators that fall into this Rubio Alexander rubric here, which is, yes, he did it. But there's only one punishment you've given me, and I won't do that. I'm not doing the death penalty. Does that, does that revive the censure talk? I wonder if it does. I don't know. Um, I know Democrats are not ready, I think, to offer that lifeline let, yet. And I don't, I think they would like to see, okay, Republican Party, if, if that's where you are, you do it. I think if, a, if Mitt Romney and Marco Rubio introduced uh, a censure resolution, it probably would get a lot of... Uh, a lot of bipartisans. Let me bring uh, Pete Williams, our justice correspondent, into the conversation. Pete? Well, this is just one way that the, an impeachment is different from a criminal trial. As Carol knows, if you're a juror and you conclude that the defendant did it, you're duty-bound to vote guilty. And by the way, when the Senate comes to voting guilty, that's or on the, on the um, impeachment articles, that's how they'll vote. Not yes or no, but guilty or not guilty. That's the actual vote that will be taken. One other point here, Lester, I think we have to talk about over and over again is this question of there, whether there could be a tie on whether to call witnesses and whether Chief Justice John Roberts as the presiding officer can break the tie. I think it's fair to say there's only one person in the country who knows the answer, and that's John Roberts. Uh, there's no clear answer to this. You know, we don't do this very often, but it does seem to me that all the factors are against that. He doesn't have the authority to vote. It's the senators who are supposed to vote. And perhaps most importantly, a 50-50 vote doesn't call for breaking the tie. A 50-50 vote simply means whoever made the motion fails. All right. We are waiting for the, uh, the trial to resume. While we do that, let me go back to the White House and Hallie Jackson, who can talk a little more about the timing now is going forward. Yeah, and, and Lester, I want to be clear here, too. Based on the reporting that I've been doing and our colleagues have been doing this morning and, and my conversation briefly with a source familiar with the thinking of the president's legal team, this this what you could call delay or perhaps timeline extension of the trial, possibly in the next week, that is not something that the White House defense team uh, is pushing based on our reporting. It's not something they necessarily want. They understand uh, that if they're resigned to it, if that is what Senator Mitch McConnell believes he needs to do to be able to move the ball forward here, then sure, they'll go along with that. But it is not the case to say that they are pushing for more time for closing arguments because, in fact, I'm told that they expect closing arguments to be on the shorter side, Lester, which would track with what they have been doing so far all along, right? The president's defense team you've seen not take all of their allotted time, for example, during that question and answer Senate, uh, or question and answer session or the, the opening argument session that happened earlier this week as well. So I do think that that tracks somewhat. Again, if it has to go into next week, it has to. The key thing for everybody that we have been talking to in and around the White House over the last several days has just been they believe that an acquittal is likely to happen. Nobody is dancing in the end zone, as one source put it to me this morning. They are still wary of any last-minute curveballs that could ha come happen. But they want to get to the point where President Trump can stand up and say, I am now an acquitted but impeached president, essentially. I also want to talk about something else, because as we wait for this trial to begin today, Lester, you're going to see Pat Cipollone on the Senate floor, right? He is the person who has been sitting there right next to Jay Sekulow. One of the, he's the, he is the White House counsel. He is the lead attorney in this case. He brought home the opening arguments for the president's defense team. And you have to remember what happened just in the opening days of this trial, just before it began, when House Democrats essentially raised ethical questions about Cipollone, given his potential involvement in the matter at hand here, which is the questions that the president was asking as it related to investigations into his political rivals from Ukraine and House Democrats raising the prospect, if you have information, you need to hand it over, essentially. Uh, the White House obviously dismissed that uh, and, and, and their team at, pretty much out of hand when that letter was first sent over. But the Bolton revelations or allegations that are coming up again today in The New York Times are certain to raise more questions about that at this point, Lester. Okay, Hallie, thanks. Look, I remember we talked about this early on. Pat Cipollone's decision, he is not the lawyer for the president of the United States, for, for Donald J. Trump. He is the lawyer for the office of the presidency within the executive branch. And so to be the also the attorney that's defending him was always putting him in an awkward position. And so, Carol, I'm curious that's what you think. This story in the New York Times 
has Pat Cipollone in the room. Right. That he knew this scheme. Obviously, there's attorney-client privilege, and, and plenty of def- defense lawyers know their client did it and defend them anyway and have that information. But this is a different situation because, again, his job was not to be the counselor to the Donald J. Trump, but his office of the president. Yeah, you've put your finger on something that lawyers always have to watch out for, and that is whether they are acting in capacity as an, an attorney, and then it turns out they're also a, what we call a percipient witness, a person who has actually observed uh, firsthand, like an eyewitness, the events being, um, uh, you know, at at issue. And uh, Pat Cipollone is now getting uh, dangerously close, if he's not already there, to being in that situation. It becomes a huge ethical issue for any attorney. And uh, at a certain point, if it gets, you know, fraught enough, they've got to withdraw his counsel. It's almost like he's part of the obstruction. Well, I mean, that, that's what somebody could yeah. allege, correct? Sure, sure. And uh, only, only he actually knows. So he's got an ethical obligation to evaluate this for himself and, if necessary, remove himself as counsel. As we uh, await the trial to resume, and it should be starting uh, very quickly, let me go back to uh, Casey Hunt. Casey, we're not going to see House Manager Jerry Nadler today. Uh, you've got some information about that. That's right, Lester. Some sad news for the Nadler family. They announced uh, earlier this week, and and Nadler missed some of the proceedings because his wife was recently diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And he put out a tweet uh, this morning essentially writing that he will not be uh, on the floor for this historic uh, vote, saying that they have some difficult decisions to make as a family. So some heartbreaking news uh, for the Nadler family. He has, of course, been a key figure throughout this impeachment trial, and his position as chairman of the Judiciary Committee in the House, very traditionally uh, central and important role to any proceeding, any impeachment proceeding. So uh, I know Chuck has covered a little bit of the back and forth between Schiff and Nadler, and and Schiff has been named the lead manager here, uh, but Jerry Nadler has obviously played a very critical role. And so we are, of course, thinking of his family and what is a difficult uh, time for them. I also, uh, Lester, on the politics of this, I think we should point out we're starting to hear uh, from Lisa Murkowski's team. NBC News reporting her statement should come uh, within minutes as to which way she's going to vote on this critical witness vote. We're looking at her because we want to know if there's going to be a 50-50 tie a draw, essentially, on the Senate floor, or uh, if Republicans will have 51 votes to block witnesses. This is important, of course, because there is some precedent for a chief justice stepping in uh, and weighing in in the event of a 50-50 result and uh, putting his uh, vote out there as 51. We do not expect that to happen in this case, as our Pete Williams has repeatedly uh, reported. And actually, Lester, it looks like we're just getting this information in uh, right now from uh, our producers telling telling us that Murkowski is going to vote no on the witness question. So there you have it. No 50-50 draw uh, example. You are going to instead uh, see Murkowski voting no, again, according to a statement just in uh, to NBC News. So she's joining Lamar Alexander, who we were also watching late last night, uh, who, as uh, Chuck has discussed, you know, explained the rationale behind his vote as saying that he thought this conduct was inappropriate, but not worthy of removing a president from office. So again, to underscore the news, Senator Lisa Murkowski, that last critical vote on witnesses that were watching. She will vote no uh, to uh, on calling witnesses. All right. Uh, Leader McConnell is speaking now. Let's go back to the Senate. Three, the Senate has provided up to four hours of argument by the parties equally divided on the question of whether or not it shall be in order to consider and debate under the impeachment rules any motion to subpoena witnesses or documents. Mr. Manager Schiff, are you a proponent or opponent? Mr. Cipollone, are you a proponent or opponent? Thank you. Then, Mr. Schiff, you may proceed. Before I begin, uh, Mr. Chief Justice, the House managers will be reserving the balance of our time to respond to the argument of counsel for the President. Mr. Chief Justice, uh, Senators, fellow House managers and counsel for the President, I know I speak for my fellow managers uh, as well as counsel for the President in thanking you for your careful attention to the arguments that we have made uh, over the course of many long days. Today we were greeted to yet another development uh, in the case when the New York Times reported with a headline that says, Trump told Bolton 
to help his Ukraine pressure campaign, Book says. The President asked his national security advisor last spring in front of other senior advisors to pave the way for a meeting between Rudolf Giuliani and Ukraine's new leader. According to the New York Times, more than two months before he asked Ukraine's president to investigate his political opponents, President Trump directed John R. Bolton, then his national security advisor, to help with his pressure campaign to extract damaging information on Democrats from Ukrainian officials, according to an unpublished manuscript by Mr. Bolton. Mr. Trump gave the instruction, Mr. Bolton wrote, during an Oval Office conversation in early May that included the acting White House Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney, the President's personal lawyer Rudy Giuliani, and the White House counsel Pat Cipollone, who is now leading the President's impeachment defense. Now you will see in a few moments and you will recall Mr. Cipollone suggesting that the House managers were concealing facts from this body. He said all the facts should come out. Well, there's a new fact which indicates that Mr. Cipollone was among those who were in the loop. Yet another reason why we ought to hear from witnesses. Just as we predicted, and it didn't require any great act of clairvoyance, the facts will come out. They will continue to come out. And the question before you today is whether they will come out in time for you to make a complete and informed judgment as to the guilt or innocence of the President. Now, the Times article goes on to say that Mr. Trump told Mr. Bolton to call Vladimir Zelensky, who had recently won election as President of Ukraine, to ensure Mr. Zelensky would meet with Mr. Giuliani, who was planning a trip to Ukraine to discuss the investigations that the President sought in Mr. Bolton's account. Mr. Bolton never made the call, he wrote. Never made the call. Mr. Bolton understood that this was wrong. He understood that this was not policy. He understood that this was a domestic political errand and refused to make the call. The account in Mr. Bolton's manuscript portrays the most senior White House advisors as early witnesses in the effort that they have sought to distance the President from, including the White House counsel. Over several pages, according to the Times, Mr. Bolton laid out Mr. Trump's fixation on Ukraine and the President's belief based on a mix of scattershot events, assertions, and outright conspiracy theories that Ukraine tried to undermine his chances of winning the presidency in 2016. As he began to realize the extent and aims of the pressure campaign, Mr. Bolton began to object, he wrote in the book, affirming the testimony of a former National Security Council aide, Fiona Hill, who had said that Mr. Bolton warned that Mr. Giuliani was a hand grenade who's going to blow everybody up. Now, as you might imagine, the President denies this. The President said today, I never instructed John Bolton to set up a meeting for Rudy Giuliani, one of America's, one of the greatest corruption fighters in America. So here you have the President saying, John Bolton is not telling the truth. Let's find out. Let's put John Bolton under oath. Let's find out who's telling the truth. The trial is supposed to be a quest for the truth. Let's not fear what we will learn. As Mr. Cipollone said, let's make sure that all the facts come out. Mr. Chief Justice, Senators, Counsel for the President, last Tuesday at the onset of this trial, we moved for Leader McConnell's resolution to be amended to subpoena documents and witnesses from the onset, from the outset. This body decided to hold the question over. You have now heard opening arguments from both sides. You have seen the evidence that the House was able to collect you have heard about the documents and witnesses President Trump blocked 
from the House's impeachment inquiry. We have vigorously questioned both sides. The President's counsel has urged you to decide this case and render your verdict upon the record assembled by the House. The evidence in the record is sufficient. It is sufficient to convict the President on both articles of impeachment, more than sufficient. But that's simply not how trials work. As any prosecutor or defense lawyer would tell you, when a case goes to trial, both sides call witnesses and subpoena documents to bring before the jury. That happens every day in courtrooms all across America. There is no reason why this impeachment trial should be any different. The common sense practice is born out of precedence. There has never been, never before been a full Senate impeachment trial without a single witness. In fact, you can see in the slide, in every one of the 15 prior impeachment trials, the Senate has called multiple witnesses. Today, we ask you to follow this body's uniform precedence and your common sense. We urge you to vote in favor of subpoenaing witnesses and documents. Now, I'd like to address one question at the offset. There has been much back and forth about whether if the House believes it, in its, it has sufficient evidence to convict, which we do, why do we need more witnesses and documents? So I'd like to be clear. The evidence presented over the past week and a half strongly supports a vote to convict the president. The evidence is overwhelming. We have a mountain of evidence. It's direct, it's corroborated by multiple sources, and it proves that the president committed grave, impeachable offenses to cheat in the next election. The evidence confirms that if left in office, President Trump will continue to harm our, America's, national security. He will continue to seek to corrupt the upcoming election, and he will undermine, he will undermine our democracy, all to further his own personal gain. But this is a fundamental question that must be addressed. Is this a fair trial? Is this a fair trial? Is this a fair trial? Without the ability to call witnesses and produce documents, the answer is clearly and unequivocally no. It was the president's decision to contest the facts, and that is his right. But because he has chosen to confess the fact, uh, contest the facts, he shall not be heard to complain. He shall not be heard to complain that the House wishes to further prove his guilt to answer the questions he would raise. He complains that few witnesses spoke directly to the president about his misconduct beyond his damning conversations with Sondland and Mulvaney. Okay, let's hear from others then. The witnesses the House wishes to call directly to the president's own words, his own admissions of guilt, his own confessions of responsibility. If they did not, all the president's men would be on their witness list, not ours. These witnesses and the documents that their agencies produce tell the full story. And I believe that we are interested in hearing the full story. You should want to hear it. More than that, the American people, we know they want to hear it. The House Republicans' own expert witness in the House, Professor Turley, said if you could prove the president used our military aid 
to pressure Ukraine to investigate a political rival and interfere in our elections, it would be an impeachable abuse of power. And Senator Graham, too, recognized that if such evidence existed, it could potentially change his mind on impeachment. Well, we now have another witness, a fact witness, who would reportedly say exactly that. Ambassador Bolton's new manuscript, which we will discuss in more detail in a moment, reportedly confirms that the president told him in no uncertain terms we're talking about the former National Security Advisor saying the president told him in no uncertain terms, no aid until investigations, including the Bidens. For a week and a half, the president has said no such evidence exists. They are wrong. But if you have any doubt about the evidence, if you have any doubt about the evidence, the evidence is at your fingertips. The question is, will you let all of us, including the American people, hear, simply hear the evidence and make up their own minds, and you can make up your own minds, but will we let the American people hear all of the evidence? You'll recall that Ambassador Bolton, the President's former National Security Advisor, is one of the witnesses we asked for last Tuesday. We did not know at the time what he'd say. We didn't know what kind of witness that he would be, but Ambassador Bolton made clear that he was willing to testify and that he had relevant first-hand knowledge that did, hadn't yet been heard. We urge, we argue that we all deserve to hear that evidence, but the president opposed him. Now we know why. Because John Bolton could corroborate the rest of our evidence and confirm the president's guilt. So today, today, senators, we come before you and we urge, we argue again that you let this witness and the other key witnesses we have identified come forward so you have all of the information available to you when you make this consequential decision. If witnesses are not called here, these proceedings will be a trial in name only. And the American people clearly know a fair trial when they see one. Large majorities of the American people want to hear from witnesses in this trial. And they have a right to hear from witnesses in this trial. Let's hear from them. Let's look them in the eye, gauge their credibility, and hear what they have to say about the president's actions. For the same reasons, this body should grant our request to subpoena documents, the documents that the president also blocked the House from obtaining, documents from the White House, the State Department, DOD, and OMB that will complete the story and provide the whole truth, whatever they may be. We ask that you subpoena these documents so that you can decide for yourself. If you have any doubt as to what occurred, Let's look at this additional evidence. To be clear, we're not asking you to track down every single document or to call every possible witness. We have carefully identified only four key witnesses with direct knowledge who can speak to the specific issues that the president has disputed. And we targeted key documents which we understand have already been collected, for example, at the State Department. They've already been collected. They, this will not cause a substantial delay. As I made clear last night, these matters can be addressed in a single week. As we made clear last night, these matters can be addressed in a single week. We know that from President Clinton's case. 
There, the Senate voted to approve a motion for witnesses on January 27. The next day, it established procedures for those depositions and adjourned as a court of impeachment until February 4. In that brief period, the parties took three depositions. The Senate then, then resumed its proceedings by voting to accept the deposition testimony into the record. In this trial, too, let's do the same. We should take a brief one-week break for witness testimony and document collection, during which time the Senate can re return to its normal business. The trial should not be allowed to be different from each from every other impeachment trial or any other kind of trial, simply because the president doesn't want us to know the truth. The American people, the American people that we all represent, the American people that we all love and care about, deserve to know the truth. And a fair trial requires it. This is too important of a decision to be made without all of the relevant evidence. Before turning to the specific need for these witnesses and documents, I want to make clear we are not asking you again to break new ground. We're asking quite the opposite. We are asking you to simply follow the Senate's unbroken precedence and to do so in a manner that allows you to continue the Senate's ordinary business. The Senate sitting as a court of impeachment has heard witness testimony in every other, as we've said earlier, in every other 15 impeachment trials in the history of the Republic. And in fact, these trials have had an average of 33 witnesses. And the Senate has repeatedly subpoenaed and received new documents while adjudicating cases of impeachment. That makes sense. Under our Constitution, the Senate does not just vote on impeachments. It does not just debate them. Instead, the Senate is commanded by the Constitution to try all cases of impeachment. Well, a trial requires witnesses. A trial requires documents. This is the American way, and this is the American story. If the Senate denies our motions, it would be the only time in history it has rendered a judgment on articles of impeachment without hearing from a single witness or receiving a single relevant document from the president whose conduct is on trial. And why? Why can we justify, how can we justify this break from precedence? How would we justify, for what reason would we break precedence in these proceedings? There are many compelling reasons beyond precedence that demand subpoenas for witnesses and cases and documents in this case. And at this time, I yield to Manager Garcia. Mr. Chief Justice, President's Council, Senators. Last week, I shared with you that I was reflecting on my first days at a school for baby judges. Y'all may recall that. Uh, and I mentioned to you that one of the first things they told us was that we had to be good listeners and be patient. Uh, and you as judges in this trial have certainly passed the test. Thank you for being good listeners uh, and for being patient with us. Uh, it's been um, quite a long journey, uh, but we're here today uh, to talk about the other thing they told us in baby judge school, and that was that we had to give all the parties in front of us a fair hearing, an opportunity to be heard, an opportunity to cross-examine witnesses, an opportunity to bring 
uh, evidence. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Because in terms of fundamental fairness, subpoenas by the Senate in this trial would mitigate the damage caused by the President's wholesale obstruction of the House inquiry. The President claims that there is no direct evidence of his wrongdoing, despite direct evidence to the contrary in Ambassador Bolton's offer to testify to even more evidence in a trial. But let's not forget that the President is arguing that there is no direct evidence while blocking all of us from getting that direct evidence. It's a remarkable position that they have taken. Quite frankly, never as a lawyer or a former judge have I ever seen anything like this. And for the first time in our history, President Trump ordered his entire administration, his entire administration, to defy every single impeachment subpoena. The Trump administration has not produced a single document in response to the congressional subpoenas. Not a single page. Nada. That's never happened before. There is no legal privilege to justify the, the blanket <coughs> blocking of all of these documents. We know that there are more relevant documents. There is no dispute about that. It is uncontested. Witnesses have testified in exceptional detail about these documents that exist that the President is simply hiding. President Trump blanket order prohibiting the entire executive branch from participating in an impeachment investigation also ex extended to witnesses. Twelve in all followed that order and refused to testify. Much of the critical evidence we have is a result of career officials bravely coming forward despite the president's obstruction. But those closest to the president, some may say, like in the musical Hamilton, those in the room when it happened, followed his instruction. The president does not dispute that these witnesses have information that is relevant to this trial, that these individuals have personal and direct knowledge of the president's actions and motivations and can provide the very evidence he says now that we don't have. Now the president's counsel alleged the house managers hid evidence from you. Because as house managers, really their goal should be to give you all of the facts. Because they're asking you to do something very, very consequential and ask yourself, ask yourself, given the facts you heard today that they didn't tell you, who doesn't want to talk about the facts? Who doesn't want to talk about the facts? Impeachment shouldn't be a shell game. They should give you the facts. This is nice rhetoric, but it's simply incorrect. The President's counsel cherry-picked misleading bits of evidence, cited disposition transcripts of witnesses who subsequently corrected their testimony in public hearings, and said the opposite, and in some cases simply left out the second half of witness statements. That's how the House managers accurately presented the relevant evidence to you. We spent about 20 hours presenting the facts and the evidence the President's counsel spent four hours focusing on the facts and the evidence. And that evidence shows that the President is guilty. But to the extent certain facts were shown to you, let's be very clear. We are not the ones hiding the facts. The House managers did not hide that evidence. President Trump hid the evidence. And that's why we are the ones standing up here asking you to not let the president silence these witnesses and hide these documents. We don't know precisely what the witnesses will say or what the documents will show, but we all deserve to hear the truth. And more importantly, the American people 
deserve to hear the truth. Never before has a president been put, put himself above the law and hit the facts of his offenses from the American people like this one. We cannot let this president be different. Quite simply, the stakes are too high. Second, as this builds on what we have been arguing, the Senate requires and should want a complete evidentiary record before you vote on the most sacred task that the Constitution entrusts in every single one of you. I can respect that some of you have deep beliefs that the removal of this president would be divisive. Others, you may believe that allowing this president to remain in the Oval Office would be catastrophic to our republic and our democracy. But regardless of where you are, or regardless of where you land on this spectrum, you should want a full and complete record before you make a final decision and to understand the full story. It should not be about party affiliation. It should be about seeing all the evidence and voting your conscience based on all the relevant facts. It should be about doing impartial justice. Consider the harm done to our institutions, our constitutional order, and the public faith in our democracy. If the Senate chooses to close its, close its eyes to learning the full truth about the President's misconduct, how can the American people have confidence in the result of a trial without witnesses? Third, the President should want a fair trial. He has repeatedly said that publicly, that he wants a trial on the merits. He specifically said it, you saw a clip, that he wanted a fair trial in the Senate. And that would, would, would have to be with witnesses that testify, including John Bolton and Mick Mulvaney. He said that he wants a complete and total exoneration. Well, whatever you say about this trial, there cannot be a total an exoneration without hearing from those witnesses because an acquittal on an incomplete record after a trial lacking witnesses and evidence will be no exoneration. It will be no vindication, not for the president, not for this chamber, and not for the American people. And if the president is telling the truth and he did nothing wrong and the evidence would prove that, then we all know that he would be an enthusiastic supporter of subpoenas. He would be here probably himself if he could, urging you to do subpoenas if he had information that would prove he was totally in, in, not in the wrong. If he is innocent, he should have nothing to hide. His counsel should be the ones here asking today to subpoena Bolton and Mulvaney and others for testimony. The president would be eager to have the people closest to him to testify about his innocence. He would be eager to present the documents that show he was concerned about corruption and burden sharing. But the fact that he has so strenuously opposed the testimony of his closest advisors and all the documents speaks volumes. You sh should issue subpoenas to the president so that the president can get the fair trial that he wanted. But more importantly, so the American people can get the fair trial that they deserve. The American people deserve a fair trial. I said at the onset of this trial that one of the most important decisions you would make at this moment in history will not be whether you convict or acquit, but whether the president and the American people will get a fair trial. The process is more than just the ultimate decision because the faith in our institution depends on the perception of a fair process. A vote against witnesses and documents under, undermines that faith. Senators, the American people want a fair trial. The overwhelming majority of Americans 
three in four voters, three in four, as of this past Tuesday, believe that this trial should have witnesses. Now, there's not much that the American people agree on these days, but they do agree on that. And they know what a fair trial is. That involves witnesses and it involves evidence. The American people deserve to know the facts about their president's conduct and those around him. And they deserve to have confidence in this process, confidence that you made the right decision. In order to have that confidence, the Senate must call relevant witnesses and obtain relevant documents withheld thus far by this president. The American people deserve a fair trial. I now yield to my colleague, Manager Parsons. Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate, counsel for the President. Last week, the House managers argued for the testimony of four witnesses. Ambassador John Bolton, Mick Mulvaney, Robert Blair, and Michael Duffy. And during the presentations from both parties, it has become abundantly clear why the direct testimony from those witnesses is so critical. And new evidence continues to underscore that importance. So let's start with John Bolton. The President's counsel has repeatedly stated that the President didn't personally tell any of our witnesses that he linked the military aid to the investigations. There is simply no evidence anywhere that President Trump ever linked security assistance to any investigations. Most of the Democrats' witnesses have never spoken to the President at all, let alone about Ukraine security assistance. Not a single witness testified that the President himself said that there was any connection between any investigations and security assistance, a presidential meeting, or anything else. Simply not true, as the testimony of Ambassador Sondland and the admission of Mick Mulvaney make very clear. The evidence before you proves that the President not only linked the aid to the investigations, he also conditioned both the White House meeting and the aid on Ukraine's announcement of the investigations. But if you want more, a witness to acknowledge that the President told them directly that the aid was linked, a witness in front of you, then you have the power to ask for it. I mentioned uh, this portion, there's a, a slide, I mentioned this portion of Ambassador's manuscript uh, in the bin, uh, beginning, and uh, Manager Schiff uh, referenced it as well. Uh, but he says directly that the President told him this. Now the President has publicly lashed out in recent days in Ambassador Bolton. He says that Ambassador Bolton is, uh, what Ambassador Bolton is saying is nasty and untrue. But denials in 280 characters is not the same as testimony under oath. We know that. Let's put Ambassador Bolton under oath and ask him point blank. Did the President use $391 million of taxpayer money, military aid, intended for an ally at war to pressure Ukraine to investigate his 2020 opponent? The stakes are too high not to. I'd like to briefly walk you through why Ambassador Bolton's testimony is essential to ensuring a fair trial. Also addressing some of the questions that you've asked in the past two days. First, turning back to Ambassador Bolton's manuscript. The President's counsel has said no scheme existed. And the President's counsel has cited repeated de denials, public denials, of President Trump's inner circle about Bolton's allegations. None of them, of course, under oath. And as we know from the testimony of Ambassador Bolton, how important being sworn in really is. But Ambassador Bolton, as the top national security aide, has direct insight into the President's inner circle. And he is willing to testify under oath whether, quote, everyone was in the loop, as he testified before. Ambassador Bolton reportedly knows, quote, new details about senior cabinet officials who have publicly tried to sidestep involvement, end quote, including Secretary Pompeo 
in Mr. Mulvaney's knowledge of the scheme. Second, Ambassador Bolden has direct knowledge of key events outside of the July 25th call that confirm the President's scheme. Remember, this is exactly the type of direct evidence the President's counsel say doesn't exist. That's partly because they would like you to believe that the July 25th call makes up all of the evidence of our case. The call, of course, is just a part of the large body of evidence that you've heard about the past week, but it is a key part. But Ambassador Bolden has critical insight into the President's misconduct outside of this call, and you should hear it. Take, for example, the July 10th meeting with U.S. and Ukrainian officials at the White House. Dr. Hill testified during the meeting that Ambassador Sondland said that he had a deal with Mr. Mulvaney to schedule a White House meeting if the Ukrainians did the investigations. According to Dr. Hill, when Ambassador Bolton learned this, he told her to go back to the NSE's legal advisor, John Eisenberg, and tell him, quote, I am not a part of whatever drug deal Sondland and Mulvaney are cooking up on this, end quote. We already have corroboration of Dr. Hill's testimony from other witnesses like Lieutenant Colonel Vindman. And we have new corroboration from Ukraine, too. Alexander Deniluk, President Zelensky's former national security advisor, recently confirmed in an interview that the, quote, roadmap for U.S.-Ukraine relations should have been the substance, but the investigations were raised, end quote. Deniluk also explained why this was so problematic. He raised concerns that being, quote, dragged into this internal process would be really bad for the country. And also, if there's something that violates U.S. law, that's up to the U.S. to handle, end quote. Denny Look elaborated that there were serious things to discuss at the meeting. But if instead Ukraine was being dragged into, quote, internal politics using our president who is fresh on the job and experience, that could just destroy everything, end quote. Another key defense raised by the president has been that Ukraine felt no pressure, that these investigations are entirely proper. Well, here's Ukraine saying the opposite of that. You know what else Denny Luck said in the interview? Quote, it was definitely John who I trusted, end quote, talking about Ambassador Bolton. So if you want to know whether Ukrainians felt pressured, call John Bolton as a witness. He was trusted by Ukraine and he was there for these key meetings. And he was so concerned that he characterized the scheme as a drug deal and urged Dr. Hill and others to report their concerns to NSC legal counsel, who reports to White House counsel Cipollone. So let's ask Ambassador Bolton these questions directly under oath. The president says Ukraine felt no pressure, that soliciting these investigations wasn't improper. Is that true? If it is true, why is Ukraine publicly saying that the talk of investigations could destroy everything? And if the, if the president's administration thought this was okay, why did you use the words drug deal? We should ask him that. Why did you urge your staff to report concerns to lawyers? These are all questions that we can get the answers to. Third, the president has suggested the House managers have not presented any direct evidence about Mr. Giuliani's role in the scheme. In fact, it appears the House committee wasn't particularly interested in presenting you with any direct evidence of what Major Mayor Giuliani did or why he did it. Instead, they ask you to rely on hearsay, speculation, and assumption, evidence that would be inadmissible in any court. Well, once again, that's simply not true. But if you want more evidence, we know that Ambassador Bolton has direct evidence of Mr. Giuliani's role regarding Ukraine and expressed concerns about it. The President has suggested that Mr. Giuliani wasn't doing anything improper, and he was not involved in conducting policy by their own admission. They said he wasn't doing policy. So let's ask John Bolton what Giuliani was doing and whether the investigations were politically motivated or part of our foreign policy. He would know. Dr. Hill testified that Ambassador Bolton said Mr. Giuliani was, quote, a hand grenade, which she explained referred to, quote, all of the statements that Mr. Giuliani was making publicly, that the investigations that he was promoting, that the storyline he was promoting, the narrative he was promoting was going to backfire, 
end quote. The narrative Mr. Giuliani was promoting, of course, was asking Ukraine to dig up dirt on Biden. Dr. Hill also testified that Ambassador Bolton was so concerned, he told Dr. Hill and other members of the NSC staff, quote, nobody should be meeting with Giuliani, end quote. And that was, quote, closely monitoring what Mr. Giuliani was doing and the messaging that he was sending out, end quote. So let's ask Ambassador Bolton. If Mr. Giuliani wasn't doing anything wrong, why were you so concerned about his behavior? And that you directed your staff to have no part in this. If Mr. Giuliani wasn't trying to dig up dirt on Biden, why did you seem to think he was, uh, that he could, quote, blow everything up? Fourth, the president has said that there was nothing wrong with the July 25th call. But once again, the evidence suggests that Ambassador Bolton would testify that the opposite is true. According to witness testimony, Ambassador Bolton expressed concerns even before the call that it would be, quote, a disaster because he thought there would be, quote, talk of investigations or worse. Now, if the president would have you believe that the call was perfect, as he's repeatedly stated, why don't we find out? because all of the evidence before you suggests otherwise. And Ukraine knows this is not the case. The call was not perfect. Then he looked as clear on this point. He said, quote, one thing I can tell you that was clear from this July 25th call is that the issue of the investigations is an issue of concern for Trump, end quote. Or it was clear. But if there's still any uncertainty, we must ask Ambassador Bolton. If there was no scheme, how did you know President Trump would raise investigations on the call? What made you so concerned a call would be a disaster? Fifth, the President's main defense once again is that he withheld the military aid for a legitimate reason. But the evidence doesn't support that. We've heard a lot. The evidence doesn't support that. Witness testimony, emails, and other documents confirm that Ambassador Bolton and his subordinates on many occasions, including through in-person meetings with the President himself, urged the president that there was no legitimate reason to withhold the aid. But if you're not sure, if you think this could in any way have been about a legitimate policy reason, let's ask the National Security Advisor, who was in charge of that. If this was simply a policy dispute, as the president argues, let's ask John Bolton whether that's true. The president also argues that you cannot evaluate the president's subjective intent that the president can use his power any way he feels is appropriate. That's, of course, not the case. Whether his intent was a corrupt is a central part of this case, as it is in nearly every criminal case in the country. As a backup arg argument, however, the president claims that, that, you know, we want you to read the president's mind. Juries, of course, this are routinely... The entire impeachment process is about the House manager's insistence that they are able to read everybody's thoughts, they can read everybody's intention, they think you can read minds. They want to tell you what President Trump thought. Of course, are routinely asked to determine the defendant's state of mind. That's central to almost every criminal case in the country. And it's disingenuous for the president's counsel to argue that the defendant's state of mind is unknowable, that it requires a mind reader, or is anything but the most common element of proof of any crime, constitutional or otherwise. But if you want more information, let's ask the president whether John Bolton can help fill in any gaps about his state of mind. Uh, if you think about it, John, he knows some of my thoughts. He knows what I think about leaders. The case is about the president's conduct in Ukraine. John Bolton knows a lot about that. Let's hear from him. A fair trial demands it. And it's more than just ensuring a fair trial. It's about remembering that in America, truth matters. As Mr. Bolton said on January 30th, quote, the idea that somehow testifying to what you think is true is destructive to the system of government we have, I think is very nearly the reverse. The exact reverse of the truth, end quote. 
Now, as manager Schiff started this out, the truth continues to come out. Again, in an article today, more information. The truth will come out, and it's continuing to. The question here before this body is what do you want your place in history to be? Do you want your place in history to be, let's hear the truth, or that we don't want to hear it? Given our time constraints, we will now summarize the reasons why Mr. Mulvaney, Mr. Duffy, and Mr. Blair are also important. Let's turn first to Mr. Mulvaney. To begin with, Mr. Mulvaney participated in meetings and discussions with President Trump at every single stage of this scheme. We just talked about motive and intent. Well, if you want further insight, into the president's motives or intent, further direct evidence of why he withheld the military aid in the White House meeting, you should call his acting chief of staff, who had more access than anyone. Mr. Mulvaney is important because the president's counsel continues to argue incorrectly that our evidence is just hearsay and speculation. Faced with Ambassador Sondland and Mr. Holmes saying this was all as clear as two plus two equals four. The president says they are just guessing. That is simply not true. The evidence is direct. The evidence is compelling and confirmed by many witnesses, corroborated by text messages, emails, and phone records. But if you want more evidence, if you want another first-hand account for why the aid was withheld for the undisputed quid pro quo for that White House meeting, let's just hear from Mick Mulvaney. Over and over again, Ambassador Sondland described to multiple witnesses how Mr. Mulvaney was directly involved in the President's scheme. Here's some of that testimony. And so when I came in, uh, Gordon Sondland uh, was basically saying, well, look, we have a deal here that there will be a meeting. I have a deal here with, uh, with uh, Chief of Staff Mulvaney. There will be a meeting if the Ukrainians open up or announce these investigations and, uh, into 2016 in Burisma. And I cut it off immediately there. Ambassador Bolton told me that I am not part of uh, this whatever drug deal that Mulvaney and Sondland are cooking up. What did you understand him to mean by the drug deal that Mulvaney and Sondland were cooking up? I took it to mean investigations for a meeting. Did you go speak to the lawyers? I certainly did. What I want to ask you about is he makes reference in that drug deal to a drug deal cooked up by you and Mulvaney. Um, it's the reference to Mulvaney that I want to ask you about. Um, you've testified in that Mulvaney was aware of this quid pro quo, of this condition that the Ukrainians had to meet, that is, announcing these public investigations to get the White House meeting. Is that right? Yeah, a lot of people were aware of it. Um, and In including, about, including Mr. Mulvaney. Correct. Remarkably, the president is still denying the facts, even as they argue that if it's true, it's still not impeachable. But if the president did nothing wrong, if he held up the aid because of so-called corruption or burden-sharing reasons, he should want his chief of staff to come testify under oath before this distinguished body and say just that. Why doesn't he want Mulvaney to appear before the United States Senate? Well, we know the answer, because Mr. Mulvaney will confirm the corrupt shakedown scheme. 
because Mr. Mulvaney was in the loop. Everyone was in the loop. As Ambassador Sondland summarized in his testimony on July 19th, he emailed several top administration officials, including Mr. Mulvaney, that President Zelensky was prepared to receive POTUS's call and would assure President Trump that he intends to run a fully transparent investigation and will turn over every stone. Mr. Mulvaney replied, I asked NSC to set it up for tomorrow. The above email seems clear. Ambassador Sondland testified that it was clear, that he was confirming to Mr. Mulvaney that he had told President Zelensky he had to tell President Trump on that July 25th call that he would announce the investigation, which he explained was a reference to one of the two phony political investigations that President Trump wanted. And Mr. Mulvaney replies that he'll set up the meeting, consistent with the agreement that Sondland explained he'd reach with Mr. Mulvaney to condition a meeting on the investigations. But if there's any uncertainty, if there's any lingering questions about what this means, let's just question Mick Mulvaney under oath. Mr. Mulvaney also matters because we have heard several questions from this distinguished body of senators wanting to understand when or why or how the president ordered the hold on the security aid. As the head of the Office of Management and Budget, Mr. Mulvaney has unique insights into all of these questions. Your questions. Remember that email exchange between Mr. Mulvaney and his deputy, Rob Blair, on June 27th? when Mulvaney asked Blair about whether they could implement the hold, and Blair responded that it could be done but that Congress would become unhinged. It wasn't just Congress. It was the Independent Government Accountability Office that determined that the President's hold violated the law. But if the President's counsel is going to argue without evidence that he withheld the aid as part of U.S. foreign policy, seems to make sense that the Senate should hear directly from Mr. Mulvaney, who has first-hand knowledge of exactly these facts. He said so himself. Again, I was, I was involved with the, uh, the process by which the money was held up temporarily. Okay. Why doesn't President Trump want Mick Mulvaney to testify? Why? Perhaps here's why. Did he also mention to me in the past that the, 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 the corruption related to the DNC server? Absolutely. No question about that. Um, but that's it. And that's why we held up the money. Now, there was a report. So, so, so the demand for an investigation into the Democrats was part of the reason that he it was ordered on to withhold funding to Ukraine. The, the look back to what happened in 2016 certainly was, was part of the thing that he was worried about in corruption with that nation. And that is holding, absolutely appropriate. But to be clear, what you just described is a quid pro quo. It is funding will not flow unless the investigation into the into the Democratic server uh, happened as well. We, we, do, we do that all the time with foreign policy. We were holding up money at the same time for, uh, what was it, the Northern Triangle com countries. We were holding up aid at the Northern Triangle countries so that they, uh, so that they would change their policies on immigration. By, by the way, and this speaks, to a, this speaks to an important, I'm sorry? 
This speaks to an important point, because I heard this yesterday, and I can never remember the gentleman who testified. Was it McKinney, the guy? Is that his name? I don't know him. He testified yesterday. And if you go, and if you believe the news reports, okay, because we've not seen any transcripts of this. The only transcript I've seen was Sondland's testimony morning, this morning. If you read the news reports and you believe them, what did McKinney say yesterday? Well, McKinney said yesterday that he was really upset with the political influence in foreign policy. That was one of the reasons he was so upset about this. And I have news for everybody. Get over it. There's going to be political influence in foreign policy. Is that what the Constitution requires? Get over it? Is that good enough for this body, the world's greatest deliberative body? Get over it? The President's counsel can try to emphasize Mr. Mulvaney and his attorney's efforts to walk back this statement. But as you've seen with your own eyes, the statement was unequivocal. And even when given the chance in real time on that day, on October 17th, to deny a quid pro quo, he doubled down. Get over it, he said. But if you have any questions about what the real answer is, where the truth lies, there's only one way to find out. Let's all just question Mr. Mulvaney under oath during a Senate trial. After all, counsel said that cross-examination was the greatest vehicle in the history of American jurisprudence ever invented to ascertain the truth. Your standard. Finally, I'd like to touch briefly on the importance of Mr. Blair and Mr. Duffy to this case. The President's lawyers have argued that withholding foreign aid is entirely within his right as Commander-in-Chief, that this was a normal, ordinary decision, and that this is all just one big policy disagreement. We have proven exactly the opposite. This can't be a policy disagreement because the president's hold actually went against U.S. policy. The hold was undertaken outside of the normal channels by a president who they admit was not conducting policy. The hold was concealed not only from Congress, but from the president's own officials responsible for Ukraine policy. And most importantly, the hold violated the law. The president has the right to make policy, but he does not have the right to break the law and coerce an ally into helping him cheat in our free and fair elections. And he doesn't have a right to use hundreds of millions of dollars in taxpayer funds as leverage to get political dirt on an American citizen who happens to be his political opponent. But if you remain unsure about all of this, who better to ask than Mr. Blair or Mr. Duffy? They oversaw and executed the process of withholding the aid. They can tell us exactly how unrelated to business as usual this whole shakedown scheme was when it was underway. They can testify about why the aid was withheld and whether there was any legitimate explanation for withholding it. Some of you have asked that very question. Multiple officials, including Ambassador Sondland, Ambassador Taylor, David Holmes, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, Jennifer Williams, and Mark Sandy all testified that they were never given a credible explanation for the hold. So let's ask Mr. Blair, let's ask Mr. Duffy if this happens all the time, as Mick Mulvaney suggests. Why at this time, in connection with this scheme, were all of those witnesses left in 
the dark. Despite the president's refusal to produce a single document, to produce a shred of information in this impeachment inquiry undertaken in the House, his administration did produce 192 pages of Ukraine-related email records in Freedom of Information Act lawsuits, albeit in heavily redacted form. These documents confirm Mr. Duffy's central role in executing the hold. He's on nearly every single email released. Nearly every single email. Here's an important email from that production. Just 90 minutes after the July 25th call, Mr. Duffy emailed officials at the Department of Defense that they should hold off on any additional DOD obligations of these funds. Mr. Duffy added that the request was sensitive and that they should keep this information closely held. The timing is important because if the aid wasn't linked to the July 25th call, if it wasn't related, why the sensitive, closely held request made within two hours of that call? Let's just ask Mr. Duffy. Mr. Duffy and Mr. Blair can testify about the concerns raised by DOD to the Office of Management and Budget, about the illegality of the hold, and why it remained in place even after DOD warned the administration that it would violate the Impoundment Control Act. Now, the President, of course, has disputed this fact. But we have demonstrated that OMB was warned repeatedly by DOD officials of two things. First, continuing to withhold the aid would prevent the Department of Defense from spending the money before the end of the fiscal year. And second, the hold was potentially illegal, as turned out to be the case. By August 9th, DOD told Mr. Duffy directly that DOD, the Department of Defense, could no longer support the Office of Management and Budget's claims that the hold would not preclude timely execution of the aid for Ukraine, our vulnerable ally at war with Russian-backed separatists. Yet, as Mr. Duffy reportedly told Ms. McCuster at the Department of Defense on August 30th, there was a clear direction from POTUS to continue to hold. Clear direction from the President of the United States to continue the hold. So how did Mr. Duffy understand the clear direction to continue the hold? Why is the President claiming that this wasn't unlawful? when DOD, the Department of Defense, repeatedly warned his administration that it was. Wouldn't we all like to ask Mr. Duffy these questions? Finally, here's another reason why we know this was not business as usual. On July 29th, Mr. Duffy, a political appointee with zero relevant experience, abruptly seized responsibility for withholding the aid from Mark Sandy, a career Office of Management and Budget official. Seized the responsibility from a career official. Mr. Duffy provided no credible explanation for that decision. Mr. Sandy testified that nothing like that had ever happened 
in his entire governmental career. Let's think about that. If this is as routine as the president claims, why is a career official saying he's never seen anything like this happen before? Mr. Duffy knows why. Shouldn't we just take the time to ask him? The American people deserve a fair trial. The Constitution deserves a fair trial. The president deserves a fair trial. A fair trial means witnesses. A fair trial means documents. A fair trial means evidence. No one is above the law. I now yield to my distinguished colleague, Manager Lofgren. Mr. Chief Justice and Senators, it's not just about hearing from witnesses. You need documents. The documents don't lie. There are specific documents relevant to this, to this impeachment trial in the custody of the White House, OMB, DOD, and the State Department, and the President has hidden them from us. I'm not going to go through <coughs> each category again in detail, but here are some observations. This is, of course, an impeachment case against the President of the United States. Nothing could be more important. And the most important documents, documents that go directly to who knew what when, are being held by the executive branch. Many of these records are at the White House. The White House has records about the phone calls with President Zelensky, about scheduling uh, an Oval Office meeting with President Zelensky about the President's decision to hold security assistance, about communications among his top aides, about concerns raised by public officials with legal counsel. We've heard about Ambassador Bolton's handwritten notes and book manuscript and Lieutenant Colonel Vindman's presidential policy memorandum. We know of reports about a number of emails in early August trying to create after-the-fact justifications for the hold, but we haven't seen any of them. They're at the White House, being hidden by the President. I think it's a cover-up. Documents at the State Department. Records about the recall of Ambassador Yovanovitch, about Mr. Giuliani's efforts for the President, about concerns raised about the hold, about the Ukrainian reaction to the hold, and when exactly they learned about it. About negotiations with the Ukrainians for an Oval Office meeting. We know of Ambassador Taylor's first person cable and notes and Mr. Kent's memos to file. We know about Mr. Sondland's emails with Pompeo and Breckbull and Mulvaney and Perry, but we haven't seen them. They're sitting at the State Department. DOD and OMB also have records. Records about President Trump's hold on military aid to Ukraine, about the justification for the hold, about hiding the hold from Congress and trying to justify the hold after the fact, and about why the hold was lifted, but we haven't seen them. They're at DOD and OMB. Why haven't we seen them? Because the President directed all of his agencies not to produce them. This trial should not reward the President's really unprecedented obstruction by allowing him to control what evidence you see and what will remain hidden. You should ask for these documents on behalf of the American people, and you should ask for these documents to get the truth yourself. Now let's come back to the issue of delay, since the President's lawyers have suggested that having witnesses and documents would make this trial take too long. There will be lengthy court battles, they say. The President might even invoke executive privilege for the very first, very first time in this entire impeachment process. It would be better, we're told, to skip straight to the final verdict, to break from centuries of precedent and end this trial without hearing from a single witness, without reviewing a single document that the President ordered hidden. Respectfully, that shouldn't happen. 
House managers aren't interested in delaying these proceedings. We're interested in the full truth. In a trial that is fair to the parties and to the American people, in the facts that the President's counsel agrees are so critical to this trial. It's why we've said we won't go to court. We'll follow all the rulings of the Chief Justice. We can get the witness depositions done in a week. In fact, I know we can because if you, the senators, order it, that's the law. You have the sole power to try impeachments. If questions or objections come up, including objections based on executive privilege, the Senate itself and the Chief Justice in the first instance can resolve them. We aren't suggesting that the President waive executive privilege. We simply suggest that the Chief Justice can resolve issues related to any assertion of executive privilege. As the Supreme Court recognized in the case of Judge Walter Nixon, judges will stay out of disputes over how the Senate exercises its sole power to try impeachments. That ensures there will be no unnecessary delay, and it's why we propose we suspend the trial for one week, and that during that time, you go back to business as usual. While the trial is suspended, we'll take witness depositions, review the documents that are provided at your direction. The four witnesses you should hear from are readily available. Ambassador Bolton has already said he will appear. We can and would move quickly to depose these witnesses within a week of the issuance of subpoenas. The documents, too, are ready to be produced. We're ready to review them quickly and to present additional evidence. Meanwhile, the Senate can continue going about its important legislative work as it did during the depositions in the Clinton impeachment trial. The President's opposition to this suggestion says a lot. The President is the architect of the very delay he warns against. He could easily avoid it. He could move things along. He could stop trying to silence witnesses and hide evidence. I think he's afraid the truth will come out. He hopes his threats of continued delay, however unjustified, will cause you to throw up your hands and give up on a fair trial. Please don't give up. This is too important for our democracy. A decision to forego witnesses and documents at this trial would be a big departure from Senate precedent. When the Senate investigated Watergate, it heard from the highest White House officials. That happened because a bipartisan majority of the Senate insisted. We got to the truth then because the Senate came together and put a fair proceeding above party loyalty. We should all want the truth, and so we ask you, do it again, that you put aside any politics, party loyalty, belief in your president, which we understand and sympathize with, but subpoena the documents and the witnesses necessary to make this a fair trial, to hear and see the evidence you need to impartially administer justice. Now, there's been a lot of discussion of executive privilege during this trial. Even if the President asserts executive privilege, something he has not yet done, it wouldn't harm the President's legal rights or cause undue delay, and here's why. Let's focus on John Bolton, since this week's revelations confirm the importance of his testimony. First, as a private citizen, John Bolton is fully protected by the First Amendment if he wants to testify. There's no basis for imposing prior restraint for censoring him just because some of his testimony could include conversations with the president. That's commonplace. As long as his testimony isn't classified, it is shielded by the free speech clause, by the First Amendment. Ambassador Bolton has written a book. It's inconceivable that he is forbidden from telling the United States Senate, sitting as a high court of impeachment, information that shortly will be in print. If the President did attempt to invoke executive privilege, he would fail. It's true for se two separate reasons. First, claims of executive privilege always involve a balancing of interests. The Supreme Court confirmed in U.S. v. Nixon, the Nixon tapes case, that executive privilege can be overcome 
by a need for evidence in a criminal trial. That is even more true here in an impeachment trial of the President of the United States, which is probably the most important interest under the Constitution. It would certainly outweigh any claim of privilege. Precedent confirms the point. To name just a few, national security advisors for President Carter, Zbigniew Brzezinski, President Clinton, Samuel Berger, President George W. Bush, Condoleezza Rice, and President Obama, Susan Rice, testified in congressional investigations. These advisors discussed their communications with top government officials, including the presidents they served. There is no reason why all of these officials uh, could, not testif could testify in the normal course of events and hearings, but Ambassador Bolton, a former official, couldn't testify in the most important trial there could possibly be. The second reason is the President waived any claim of executive privilege about Ambassador Bolton's testimony. All 17 witnesses testified in the House about these matters without any assertion of privilege by the President. President Trump, as well as his lawyers and senior officials, have publicly discussed and tweeted about these issues at some length. The President has also directly denied reports about what Ambassador Bolton will say in his forthcoming book. Under these circumstances, the President can be, uh, cannot be allowed to tell his version of the story to the public while using executive privilege to silence a key witness who would contradict him. You shouldn't let the President escape responsibility only to later see clearly what happened in Ambassador Bolton's book. There are no national security risks here. The President has declassified the two phone calls with President Zelensky. All 17 witnesses testified about the President's conduct regarding Ukraine. We aren't interested in asking about anything other than Ukraine. That's simply a bogus argument. The Constitution uses the word sole power only twice. First, when it gives the House sole power to impeach. And second, Article 1, Section 3, where it gives the Senate sole power to try impeachments. And here's what it says. The Senate shall have the sole power to try all impeachments. When the President of the United States is tried, the Chief Justice shall preside. Now, I think that provision in the Constitution means something. It's up to the Senate to decide how to try this impeachment with fairness, with witnesses, and documents. Privileges asserted can be decided using the process that you devise. That's not unconstitutional. It's what the Constitution provides. You have the power. You decide. Please decide for a fair trail that will yield the truth and serve our Constitution and the American people. I yield now to Manager Schiff. Senators, before we yield to uh, counsel for the President, I'd like to take a moment by talking about uh, what I think is at stake here. A no vote on the question before you will have long-lasting and harmful consequences long after this impeachment trial is over. We agree with the President's counsel on this much. This will set a new precedent. This will be cited in impeachment trials from this point to the end of history. You can bet in every impeachment that follows, whether it is a presidential impeachment or the impeachment of a judge, if that judge or president believes that it is to his or her advantage that there shall be a trial with no witnesses, they will cite the case of Donald J. Trump. They will make the argument that you can adjudicate the guilt or innocence of the party who is accused without hearing from a single witness, without reviewing a single document. And I would submit that will be a very dangerous and long-lasting precedent that we will all have to live with. President Trump's wholesale obstruction of Congress strikes at the heart of our Constitution and democratic system of separation of powers. Make no mistake, 
The President's actions in this impeachment inquiry constitute an attack on congressional oversight, on the co-equal nature of this branch of government, not just on the House, but on the Senate's ability as well to conduct its oversight to serve as a check and balance on this President and every President that follows. If the Senate allows President Trump's obstruction to stand, it effectively nullifies the impeachment power. It will allow future presidents to decide whether they want their misconduct to be investigated or not, whether they would like to participate in an impeachment investigation or not. That is a power of the Congress. That is not a power of the president. By permitting a categorical obstruction, it turns the impeachment power against itself. How do we respond to this unprecedented obstruction will shape future debates between our branches of government and the executive forever. And it's not just impeachment. The ability of Congress to conduct meaningful and probing oversight, oversight that by its nature is intended to be a check and balance on the awesome powers of the executive branch, hinges on our willingness to call witnesses and compel documents that President Trump is hiding with no valid justification, no precedential support. If we tell the President effectively, you can act corruptly, you can abuse the powers of your office to coerce a foreign government to helping you cheat in an election by withholding military aid, and when you're caught, you can further abuse your powers by concealing the evidence of your wrongdoing, the president becomes unaccountable to anyone. Our government is no longer a government with three co-equal branches. The president effectively, for all intents and purposes, becomes above the law. This is, of course, the opposite of what the framers intended. They purposely entrusted the power of impeachment to the legislative branch so that it may protect the American people from a president who believes that he can do whatever he wants. So we must consider how our actions will reverberate for decades to come and the impact they will have on the functioning of our democracy. And as we consider this critical decision, it's important to remember that no matter what you decide to do here, whether you decide to hear witnesses and relevant testimony, the facts will come out in the end. Even over the course of this trial, we have seen so many additional facts come to light. The facts will come out. In all of their horror, they will come out. And there are more court documents and deadlines under the Freedom of Information Act. Witnesses will tell their stories in future congressional hearings in books and in the media. This week has made that abundantly clear. The documents the president is hiding will come out. The witnesses the president is concealing will tell their stories. And we will be asked why we didn't want to hear that information when we had the chance when we could consider its relevance and importance in making this most serious decision. What answer shall we give if we do not pursue the truth now, if we allow it to remain hidden until it is too late to consider on the profound issue of the president's innocent or guilt? What we are asking you to do on behalf of the American people is simple. Use your sole power to try impeachment by holding a fair trial. Get the documents they refuse to provide to the House. Here are the witnesses they refuse to make available to the House, just as this body has done in every single impeachment trial until now. Let the American people know that you understand they deserve the truth. Let them know you still care about the truth, that the truth still matters. Though much divides us, on this we should agree. A trial stripped 
of all its trappings should be a search for the truth. And that requires witnesses and testimony. Now you may have seen just this afternoon the President's former Chief of Staff, General Kelly, said that a Senate trial without witnesses is a job only half done. Trial without witnesses is only half a trial. Well, I have to say I can't agree. Trial without witnesses, no trial at all. You either have a trial or you don't. And if you're going to have a real trial, you need to hear from the people who have firsthand information. Now, we presented some of them to you. But you know as well as we, there are others that you should hear from. But let me close this portion with words, I think, more powerful than General Kelly's. And they come from John Adams, who in 1776 wrote, together with the right to vote, those who wrote our Constitution considered the right to trial by jury the heart and lungs, the mainspring and the center wheel of our liberties, without which the body must die, the watch must run down, the government must become arbitrary. Now, what does that mean? Without a fair trial, the government must become arbitrary. Now, of course, he's talking about the right of an average citizen to a trial by jury. Well, if in courtrooms all across America, when someone is tried, but they're a person of influence and power, they can declare at the beginning of the trial, if the government's case is so good, let them prove it without witnesses. If people of power and influence can insist to the judge that the House, that the prosecutors, that the government, that the people must prove their case without witnesses or documents, a right reserved only for the powerful. Because you know, only Donald Trump, only Donald Trump of any defendant in America can insist on a trial with no witnesses. If that should be true in courts throughout the land, then as Adams wrote, the government becomes arbitrary. Because whether you have a fair trial or no trial at all depends on whether you are a person of power and influence like Donald J. Trump. The body will die, the clock will run down, and our government becomes arbitrary. The importance of a fair trial here is not less than in every courtroom in America. It is greater than in any courtroom in America because we set the example for America. I said at the outset, and I'll repeat again, your decision on guilt or innocence is important, but it's not the most important decision. If we have a fair trial, however that trial turns out, whatever your verdict may be, at least we can agree we had a fair trial. At least we can agree that the House had a fair opportunity to present its case. At least we can agree that the President had a fair opportunity to present their case, if we have a fair trial. And we can disagree about the verdict, but we can all agree the system worked as it was intended. We had a fair trial, and we reached a decision. Rob this country of a fair trial and there can be no representation that the verdict has any meaning. How could it if the result is baked in by the process? Assure the American people, whatever the result may be, that at least they got a fair shake. There's a reason why the American people want to hear from witnesses. And it's not just about curiosity. It's because they recognize that in every courtroom in America, that's just what happens. And if it doesn't happen here, the government has become arbitrary. There is one person who is entitled to a different standard, 
and that's the President of the United States. And that is the last thing the Founders intended. We reserve the balance of our time. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Mr. Chief the Justice. The Majority Leader is recognized. I request the Senate take a 15-minute recess. Without order. All right, so the House managers beginning to make their case in a formal way for uh, new witnesses and evidence. Uh, we are in, uh, in the middle of a what could be a very long day with a questionable outcome, although uh, let me go to uh, Casey Hunt on Capitol Hill. It seems more likely than ever this thing is going to extend into next week, no matter what we see happen today. That's right, Lester. NBC News' latest reporting is that senators are considering extending the trial into next week. Uh, that would potentially allow for additional closing arguments. It would also have the side effect of allowing many of the 2020 presidential candidates on the Democratic side to campaign in Iowa through the weekend. Uh, but we should underscore this plan has not been finalized or signed off on yet. It's going to take uh, both sides agreeing to proceed this way for it to actually happen. So we're still watching it minute to minute, but the proposal uh, potentially has the Senate coming back 1 o'clock on Monday for closing arguments, deliberations uh, on Tuesday. That, of course, is the State of the Union here uh, at the Capitol. The President uh, planned to deliver that annual address uh, Tuesday evening. That would set up a potential acquittal vote for Wednesday. Now, of course, uh, the White House has been pushing for the fastest possible timeline, and this would drag this impeachment cloud over the President's head through that major speech on Tuesday. That's been something that they have been trying to avoid. But there is an acknowledgement that at the end of the day, uh, it's up to the Senate. It's up to Mitch McConnell and, in this case, Chuck Schumer, agreeing to how to kind of finish this process out. And if that's uh, what they can get agreement on uh, tonight, Lester, that may be how it plays out. This is, of course, different from what we were expecting as of the end of the day yesterday when we had been hearing that Republicans were going to try to push to hold this acquittal vote potentially as soon as tonight. So. Uh, again, we're still watching this. It's still fluid, and the plan could change. Uh, but that's what's taking shape here on the Hill at this hour, Lester. Right, but all throughout this process, we've seen the Republicans, by virtue of the number of votes they have, they have been controlling this process every step along the way. So what's in it for them to extend this and, and to allow it to be extended? Well, to a certain extent, Lester, uh, there's a little bit of humanity in it. The trial typically goes on Saturdays. That's something uh, that a lot of uh, weary senators here may be looking to avoid. If, in fact, they end this process in, in an acrimonious way, if Republicans don't agree to go along with what Democrats want, Democrats can actually control what happens next. Uh, once we go and finish this uh, witness vote that we've been talking about for so many days now, uh, there's a big question mark about what happens next. And under the rules, Democrats could offer amendments after amendment that would potentially require two hours of debate for each. They could potentially push the process late into the evening. It seems like this is a collective uh, stepping back from the brink, trying to find a little bit of agreement for a way to close this out that gives both sides the opportunity uh, to say their final piece, uh, even as uh, we know that the outcome here uh, seems to be predetermined. All right, sir. Casey. Hallie Jackson is at the White House. Hallie, and of course, the big breaking news was today more revelations from the John Bolton book. And now we've got uh, uh, John Kelly who's making some, some more comments that, that will be no doubt reverberating around uh, Capitol Hill. Right. The former chief of staff here at the White House, Lester, who is saying that you can't do, and I'm paraphrasing here, essentially half a job, if you will, when it comes to this. Uh, and this is not the first time that we have heard from John Kelly throughout this process. Remember, he said just a matter of hours ago, really, a days ago, that he believes John Bolton, the former national security advisor, whose unpublished manuscript, according to The New York Times, contains revelations uh, that deal with the central issue in this impeachment inquiry. President Trump and what Bolton and others describe as this pressure campaign against President Zelensky of Ukraine to investigate President Trump's political rivals like the Bidens. What Bolton is now describing in the new report out from the New York Times, Lester, is a meeting with others in the room, right? So people, including Pat Cipollone, the, the lead White House counsel, who you will hear from shortly as soon as this break resumes in the Senate trial. And, and timeline-wise, Lester, it puts that conversation, that Oval Office meeting, that Bolton describes, according to the Times in this book, about asking this ask that the president made for his personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, to reach out to President Zelensky, 
in early May. Now, that's a couple of months earlier than what we had initially heard about and talked about and been talking about, which is the July 25th phone call between President Trump and the leader of Ukraine. So it does shift the timeline a bit a little bit in the other direction. And it is perhaps no surprise that that is what you heard Democrats just in this in this trial here in these in these hours of debate come out swing it with the House managers there on that front, Lester. Yeah. As far as the timing of how this goes, uh, it is not expected, uh, according to a source familiar with the legal team's thinking, that they will take their necessarily full two hours here coming up after this break. That may have changed based on what the defense team has just heard now in these last couple of hours, but that was the expectation at least prior to 1 p.m. when this started. And as for whether or not this trial is going to go past State of the Union, we know that the preference would be to have this trial wrapped up prior to the president's big speech, which happens on Tuesday. Whether it happens or not, though, uh, the sense that we have been getting from talking with our sources here today has been they just want to get to a, and I'm paraphrasing here, a clean win, a clean acquittal one way or the other. We just had an opportunity to talk to a senior administration official about that State of the Union speech, Lester. They will not comment on how or whether or when the president will bring up impeachment in that address, but it certainly is going to create a, a fascinating moment. We've only seen it really once before. Former President Bill Clinton was in the middle of his impeachment trial when he delivered his State of the Union back in the late 90s, 1999. So there is some precedent for a president delivering a speech while being on trial in front of that very chamber, if in fact this does extend through Wednesday, as some of this speculation is is addressing, Lester. All right, Hallie, thanks. And Chuck, talk, let's talk about why it's important <clears throat> how this ends. And I don't mean by the votes. We think we yeah. know where it's going to end. But, but the, the manner or the way that this is perceived? Well, look, I do think, in some ways, I'm, I'm not surprised. I, I was wondering, are they really going to try to do this verdict in the dead of night, rush this through simply so the president of the United States could spike the football with Sean Hannity on Super Bowl Sunday and have this little State of the Union thing? It just seemed as if, you know, that's how you're going to rush this verdict. That seems like a real political ending, especially when you read all of these the early comments where there's a lot of Republican senators here that are voting to acquit, not because they think he did nothing wrong, but they've decided the country can't handle this. I think all of these lawmakers are concerned about what this verdict looks like, how, they, how the public consumes it. And it seems to me all of them are very, want to be able to explain themselves, not in the dead of night, but put this out there. Because if you're, let's say, Rob Portman, Marco Rubio, who both are, on, are in this sort of Yes, the case has been proven, but it's not, I'm, you know, I'm not, I can't go that next level. Then you want to have, for history's sake, at least a public explanation. I think that's where all of these senators came down on. And look, the Democrats could have made their life miserable with the, to, to sort of drag this out. I think the Republicans knew that and they decided, you know what, does the president really need everything? He's getting 90 percent of what he wants out of this. You don't have to give them the State of the Union, too. And, and Carol Lamb, as we were watching uh, Adam Schiff make the, the passionate arguments for witnesses, we were discussing this idea of precedent. And, it's, of course, it's not just presidents who are subject to being impeached. They're judges as well. Do we, have we potentially seen a change in, in how we view going forward impeachment? Well, as, as Adam Schiff was saying, this is going to be precedent for every impeachment going forward. Everyone's going to look backwards on this and say, you know, what did the Senate ultimately decide to do there and what were the arguments raised there? And, uh, you know, in judicial impeachments, uh, there has never been this kind of question brought to the fore that it, does it have to actually be a crime or, or is it an abuse of judicial power? And I... I uh, I do think that it could make things a little bit more difficult now that people feel like this this kind of argument has been aired now. There have been um, stories of judges doing some very improper things. Improper things that really are not uh, necessarily uh, violations of some codified law. You know, uh, look, go reread Federalist 65 if anybody wants I to was, understand. I was doing that. Well, <laughs> and I say this to folks, which is Alexander Hamilton made it clear the whole reason why the judiciary branch wasn't used, why they decided not to use the Supreme Court, is they assumed that, well, the courts may end up looking at actual crimes that were committed, implying that they knew that this court that they were doing of an impeachment was not designed to decide about crimes, because that was always going to be a, they wanted that separated out. In fact, one of the reasons they didn't want the Supreme Court adjudicating an impeachment is they thought it's possible the Supreme Court might be adjudicating these people two different times. Once for whether they're fit for office, and then a second time as a private citizen if they're charged for any crimes that they have been committing in the office. But the fact of the matter is, 
Alexander Hamilton himself makes the point that it is, is not about committing a crime in order to make an impeachment. In this impeachment, though, we keep hearing Clinton, 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 as if that's the model that they want to em emulate. Will the next impeachment be based on the Trump model? I think so because <laughs> oh, my word, I, I know. What does that I, you know, look like? Sadly, right? sadly, because it's not much of a it's not much of a model. I mean, let's let's be honest about it. Um, I mean, you can read in some of the senators' statements that. Uh, at the same time that they say we think that what the president did was wrong and inappropriate, they also take the House to task for for doing what they say is it was an incomplete and rushed investigation. Sure. So so it leaves everybody sort of uh, wanting to avoid the mistakes that uh, that are they're being accused of doing. Uh, here. We are going to just take a brief pause here to allow some of our stations to return to regular programming. For the rest of you, our coverage of the Senate impeachment trial of President Trump continues. The Senate trial in a break, and we continue to talk. Let me bring in, uh, if I can, John Meacham, NBC News contributor and presidential historian. And, John, I think you can contribute to the conversation we were just <laughs> happening on this notion of how does this change impeachment and how we view it going forward. Is this a one-off, or are we seeing real precedents that we'll hear, uh, God forbid, the next time we go down this road? Well, one of the things we know is that the presidency has not changed Donald Trump at all. What we don't yet know is whether the, he has changed the presidency itself and the processes of, of government. I think the significance of, of today and going into the weekend and into next week is I think it is now arguable. And Chuck, who's reading Federalist 65, <laughs> can, can check me on this uh, if you can look up from that. Uh, is that Donald Trump may well have now become the most powerful president in American history. So just pause for a second and think about that. He has the capacity, he has such a uh, standing with his political base that senior United States senators have decided that though he is guilty, they are not going to risk the wrath of the people in order to follow through on what is clearly spelled out in the Constitution. That is a raw and elemental definition of power. And I think it's something that we haven't fully grappled with. The idea that what President Trump has done, and this is why the, the example going forward is, is fraught, President Trump is functionally a monarch at this point. If the king does it, it's okay. That, that's what we're seeing unfold in Washington right now. And I think yeah. all Americans, whether you support the president or you don't, should pause significantly and think about the long-term implications of having a president who is above the law. Yeah, and John, stand by for me, if you will. I want to bring in Senator Kamala Harris, Democrat from California and a former candidate for president. Uh, Senator, good day to you. Thank you for taking a few moments for us. Good to be with you, Lester. Thank what you, you. What do you think when you begin to see some of these Republican senators peel off to the position that, yes, he did a horrible thing, no, it's not impeachable, and by the way, we don't think the public can really handle this? Well, one of the other things I've heard in addition to that is a concern about the fairness of a trial and what each senator, each member of the United States Senate has in their power at this very moment is to vote for a fair trial. And to vote for a fair trial means voting to have witnesses come forward so that this process has integrity because the outcome will not have integrity if the process has not had integrity. I will tell you, I feel very strongly that the end game has clearly been since the beginning to say that the president was acquitted, but there can be no true acquittal if there's not been a fair trial. So where we are right now is that moment where each senator has in her and his power the ability to make a decision about whether we are going to be true and act on the intention of the founders and framers of our Constitution, which is that there will be a meaningful process by which we determine if, in this case, Donald Trump has committed what the founders decided would be one of the most horrendous acts that a president can commit, which is to allow the interference of, of, of a foreign government into our democracy and into our republic. And, and Senator, D Democrats have been pushing this huge boulder uphill from all almost the beginning, so the outcome was, as many have said, uh, preordained. Are you reaching a point now where you're asking yourself, was it worth it? What is, what comes next after an acquittal, if in fact that happens? 
Well, I'm still in the fight, Lester, and I think a lot of us are. And um, you know, is it worth it? Is it worth it to fight for 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 a, a system that has integrity? To fight for our democracy? To fight for our republic? Is it worth it to fight to say that there will be accountability and consequence when the president of the United States puts his personal interest ahead of the interest of national security and the interest of, of the Constitution of the United States? Yes, it's worth it. It's worth it to fight for our Constitution. Each of us took an oath that we would support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Many of us have taken that oath a number of times. This is that moment, and as the, the, the managers made clear, there is only twice in the United States Constitution the, 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 the term sole authority, sole responsibility. And one of them has to do with the sole responsibility of the United States Senate to make a decision about the matters that are before us now. Let's have a fair trial. Uh, this is a serious matter. Do, do you think that, that the re Republicans now, do you think we're going to see more of them make this claim that, that he, he did something wrong but that it's not impeachable? Is that, is that what they're going to hang the hat on, you think? It, it seems that way, but it, it, it actually, there is no logic behind that. It, it, he did something wrong, and it is impeachable. That is what is before us. The very issue before us is that he has, in fact, done something wrong in violation of the Constitution of the United States. And I can't emphasize enough, Lester, of the three impeachments of a president of the United States, the, the grounds for this one are the most serious. It is literally about entanglement, foreign entanglement in our republic. You and so doing something wrong, this is not you know, just an error in judgment. This is literally about the President of the United States attempting to have a foreign leader investigate an American citizen who happens to be the former Vice President of the United States. And for what purpose? For his personal political benefit, while he withheld money and aid that was authorized by the United States Congress to help that ally defend themselves against an adversary of that ally and ours. You are no longer in the presidential race, but clearly you, you must be watching the nominating process very closely. How do you think this is going to affect the race? How will Donald Trump fare as a candidate, as an impeached candidate, but one who uh, would have uh, escaped um, expulsion from office? Well, again, I, if, if at the end result, and if, if, if at the end he is, um, he is acquitted by you know, the vote, I will say that, that it is not a true acquittal. He has not been truly exonerated because there was not a fair trial. But we know history tells us how he's going to act. He's going to walk around boasting as though he has accomplished something when, in fact, the process has lacked integrity if we do not actually bring witnesses forward. And let's just take for what's happening in the last 24 hours, not only John Bolton and more information about what he knows and direct evidence of what the president has, has indicated and directed. But the former chief of staff, John Kelly, a former general, um, who has also said that this is not and has not been essentially a fair trial and it is incomplete. All right. Senator so, Kamala you know, Harris. He'll, he'll boast, but, but, it, but it, lacks, it lacks credibility. Senator Kamala Harris, thank you for your time. We do appreciate it. Of course. Of and, course. and Chuck, what about the notion looking forward, uh, an acquitted Impeached but acquitted mm -hmm. President Trump. What kind of candidate does he become? More formidable? Well, I think, it, look, I actually think the politics of this are basically paralyzed. I don't think, I mean, I think we're, 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 we're pretty polarized, and so I think actually there won't be any impact. And, and Democrats have been more hesitant to make this a campaign issue. They have not run um, television ads making vulnerable Republican senators uncomfortable or vulnerable House Republicans. Meanwhile, the Republicans have done that. They've run ads against Doug Jones, for instance, Democratic senator, that they'd like to see vote to quit. So I, I am curious to see if Democrats try to actually weaponize this, all of their complaints about this trial, on the campaign trial. There's actually not a lot of evidence that they have the stomach to do it that way. I, I go back. I've said it a bunch. I, I think this is, this is like... Um, these votes are going to age poorly somewhere. Maybe, it, maybe it's the House impeachment votes that age poorly. Maybe it's the Senate acquittal votes that age poorly. But history tells us this vote, these votes are going to, some, some of these votes are going to age pretty badly, just like the Iraq war vote. And the question is, um, when does that happen? Maybe it's in six months. Maybe it's in five years. The Iraq war vote is still haunting people. Uh, to this day, and we're, that's nearly 20 years ago. And Chuck, we've got Senator John Barrasso, part of the uh, Republican leadership in the Senate. Senator, thank you for stopping by and talking to us for a few minutes. 
Thank you, Lester. We, we, we've seen a number of names uh, on the Republican side here who are essentially saying that you know, the president used bad judgment. I'm paraphrasing here, but that what he did was not impeachable, yet they will vote against witnesses. Uh, do, you, do you allow that room that the, the, the president did something inappropriate? Well, I think there are a lot of Republicans that would say improper, not impeachable. But then it gets back to the question you just asked Senator Harris, was it all worth it? And I hope the lesson from this, Lester, is to go back to what Chuck Schumer said in 1999 and Gerald Ad, um, Nadler said at the same time, which was you should not do a partisan impeachment. Nancy Pelosi said it last, time, uh, last year, a bipartisan, yes, but something that is purely partisan, purely political, is not in the best interest of the country. We've been at this now for weeks. There have been 17 witnesses, thousands of pages of documents, lots of work that hasn't been able to be done in the benefit of the people of the country. And we're ready to vote. I think just about every senator, if not every senator, has announced how they're going to vote on witnesses. So that debate is over. It's now time to vote on the final judgment call. I'm sure you've heard by now John Kelly was kind of weighing in on all this with regard to what's happening and, and the John Bolton book. He says if, if senators don't respond, essentially, it'll be a half-done job if you don't respond to 75 percent of the American public who wants to hear more witnesses. What do you think about what he had to say? Well, we're at the point when I was in Wyoming um, a week or so, two weeks ago, Thermopolis, Wyoming, McDonald's, and people said, we want witnesses. And every witness they named, they wanted, they wanted all of the Democrats. They wanted to see Adam Schiff. They wanted President, uh, Vice President Biden. They wanted uh, uh, his son. They wanted uh, the whistleblower. But the idea is they wanted, wanted so witnesses. So their idea so. was they, that um, every senator has now spoken. The debate over witnesses is over. We're going to have that final vote within the next two and a half hours. There will be no additional witnesses. People, members of the Senate, know how they're going to vote. They've had plenty of information. The, this has been actually a fair trial in the Senate compared to what the House did behind closed doors. Nothing has been in secret uh, sessions in the Senate. Everything has been open, visible on C-SPAN. There were, what, 180 some questions asked and answered by senators. So there's been a lot of information out there. Senators know how they go they're going to vote. I think it's going to be a bipartisan vote to uh, acquit the president of these charges and, and uh, that's where we are right now with a vote coming in the I'm next sorry, you said you said, by, you said bipartisan you think you'll have democratic votes uh, to acquit uh, i believe there will be and there are a number in the news and in the press that have been listed as potential and i expect to have uh, all the Repu Repu i expect to have a bipartisan vote in support <laughs> of the president on the final vote uh, I, I was just going to say in here, I think. very quickly you're not con there could be a bipartisan vote to convict as well. It sounds like you aren't convinced that every one of your members, namely perhaps the junior senator from Utah, um, has committed to uh, his vote yet. Fair enough? I, I will let every senator speak for themselves. Uh, there is going to be a bipartisan acquittal of President Trump. I and, believe and there that could there's be... certainly not going to be the 67 yeah. votes. Well, you can speculate on that and you can ask individual senators. I have a pretty good idea of how it's going to turn out. Let me ask you this final question. Mm -hmm. Because what is essentially happening, if you take Marco Rubio, who believes these are impeachable offenses, and Rob Portman, um, and Lisa Murkowski, and Lamar Alexander all made similar references to the, con the current climate the current political climate. Are you comfortable with the fact that if a president amasses enough of a political base, has enough of sort of a hold, stranglehold on a faction, that because of that ability to essentially politically intimidate, perhaps, um, that it is a rationalization to avoid following the Constitution to the letter of the, of the law? Well, if you go back to uh, the uh, principles of uh, Madison and Hamilton and those number 65, factions shouldn't control this. That's why they put the number at 67, two thirds of the Senate to remove a, a president. So you don't want this to become weaponized to right. a regular part of 
politics But in fairness, Mr. Usual. Hamilton, Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Madison assumed that there was a United States Senate that was not directly elected by the people. Um, and so, you know, it, it, we have, we, they, they assumed that the Senate would not be as influenced by this. It's possible the direct election of senators would have changed the way the framers viewed this. Fair point, Senator Barrasso? Well, that, and then we've changed that, uh, that was just, what, 107 years ago? So things have been working out all right be, up till this point when for partisan and political purposes, one party decided to go and file articles of impeachment when the Speaker of the House said this is a bad idea nine months ago, but then be fa based on the fact that a majority of her members said we're going to file and go and sign on and co-sponsor impeachment articles. That's how we got here. This is completely partisan, not like all of the others in the history that arose in bipartisan ways to, in the best interest of the country. Yeah, and, and Senator, before I let you go, can you confirm sure. whether there has been an agreement worked out between uh, a Republican leadership and, uh, and uh, Minority Leader uh, Schumer about the timing and how this all plays out over the next several days? Uh, it, it has not yet, uh, Lester, after we vote to not move to witnesses, and that'll be a little later this afternoon or early this evening, then there will be a resolution of the next steps forward. This happened in the, in the Clinton impe impeachment, the resolution to get to finality, and Chuck Schumer may introduce a dozen amendments or so to that, each debatable for up to two hours, like we had uh, occurred just the other night before this whole process started, and that could go well into the night this evening, and only once that final resolution is passed will we know how this ends. Is, is there any, any scenario where it ends before Wednesday? Uh, there are some scenarios that that would happen, yes. All right. Senator Barrasso, uh, again, thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Good talking to you. Thanks for having me. And, and Chuck, something's still ringing in my ears if, if uh, John Meacham is here. John Meacham, you said that you think that President Trump is the most powerful president. Say what you said again. It's arguable that he's the most pow politically powerful president in American history. And so just let's pause and think about it. You were just talking about it with the senator uh, and Chuck's question. How do you define power? The, in, elementally, it is the winning of the office and the keeping of it against all comers. And by surviving this documented activity, and again, this is not a partisan point. I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. This is a historically based view. By withstanding and surviving and even coming out potentially stronger politically with his own base, this particular episode where he attempted self-evidently to use the power of the government to benefit himself politically again using a nation at war and their vulnerabilities and then to come out and have United States senators senior members of the United States government say yes he's guilty of that but we're not going to remove him for it when there's almost no question in anyone's mind that if this were someone on the other side that same United States Senate would vote to remove that's an elemental definition of power. And it proves the tribalism of the moment in American life, yeah. where we, if we're on one team or the other team, the facts be damned. It proves that right now, Donald Trump is the chief beneficiary, if not the chief architect, of a world in which American politics is defined not by objective reality, but by partisan loyalty. Carol M. You know, I, it's something I've been thinking about for the past few days. Um, sometimes in a criminal trial, it's actually a little more difficult to convict somebody who the jurors feel um, doesn't actually understand right from wrong, as, as most people do. And, and I've wondered whether uh, this president has gotten a little bit of a bump um, by virtue of the fact that he sometimes seems actually very uh, clueless about where where certain lines of propriety have been drawn. You see this language inappropriate that some of the senators have used about about his um, his conduct, and it it brings me back to law school when I, I had a professor who said, uh, you know, we were talking about the um, insanity defense, and he said, but think about it, you know, sometimes people are, are acquitted uh, on the basis of the insanity defense, but um, because they don't know right from wrong. 
but think about it, who would you be more afraid of meeting in a dark alley, someone who knows right from wrong or someone who doesn't? And, and when I think about whether this will, how much precedent this is going to set in the future, um, it makes me wonder whether this president sort of gets a little bit of a pass from people who are just saying, oh, that's just, that's just the way he is, and whether we will spring back to more traditional norms in the future or whether this is actually going to be hard precedent. Um, I think that really remains to be seen. But Chuck, you heard Kamala Harris a moment ago say, you know, mm. pr predicting that he's going to come out, uh, you know, he's, he's been exonerated in his, in his words, and he will come out uh, strong. Well, not only that, it... He is going to take, I mean, you know, the, the role Alan Dershowitz was to play is clearly just to make the president think everything he did was legal. And he may use that and feel as if he's got carte blanche. Rudy Giuliani may feel he has carte blanche. And, and so, you know, the most compelling argument to me the Democrats were making about why you do this in election year was concerned that it wasn't going to be a fair election. I do think it is fair to have debated, and I actually think we didn't debate this enough, and I think the House impeachment manners didn't do this well enough, which is they should have embraced this conversation about, we know this is an even higher bar in an election year. But you know what they never seem to remind that Senate of is this is not overturning an election. Throwing out Donald Trump doesn't mean Hillary Clinton becomes president. Throwing out Donald Trump means Mike Pence becomes president. And it, 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 is, it, is, deal, it is clear to me that all of these folks who know that the president did this, are concerned about the political fallout. Some of it is for themselves. Some of it is for the country. I, 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 think, I, I, think, I think some of these senators are sincere about this current. I mean, we all see it. We know it's a tinderbox out there. Let's not, let's not pretend it's not. Um, but I think that debate was lacking, and that debate actually should have been had because I think, you know, forcing Lamar Alexander to say, so what's wrong with Mike Pence? And, and, and with that, you know, isn't that the way to heal the country? Isn't that the way? It's like nobody wants to throw out. For, for all we know, politically, Mike Pence might, you know, if, if the president's supporters don't like what happens, they may rally around him. It could actually strengthen the Republican Party politically and at the same time draw some norms, draw some lines. But the House impeachment managers didn't make that argument. They didn't ad address it. They wanted to focus more so on, on the president. And I wonder if that, maybe it doesn't change anything, but I wonder if it Changes the conversation a little changes bit. Changes the, the conversation, right? Yeah. Hallie, uh, Hallie Jackson at the White House right now as we await uh, the Senate trial to resume. Yeah. Uh, the, the president had, at times has seemed to be, well, you look at the tweets, it's one thing, but other times he seems to almost embrace the banner of being impeached and what's happening to him. He doesn't like it, Lester, uh, and that has been our reporting since the very beginning. Multiple sources around the president say that he is displeased to have this asterisk next to his name for, frankly, the rest of his life and legacy, right? At the same time, it happened. It's here. Uh, the president still sort of rails against this idea that he's been impeached. For example, at his rally overnight in Iowa just hours ago, uh, the president, when he was in Des Moines, said, look at everything I'm doing for the economy, and yet what do I get for it? I get impeached. So he has a bit of a chip on his shoulder about this, but he also understands this is the reality. That is why he and others around him are looking ahead to what is we presume going to be that acquittal vote and everything that you and Chuck and Carol are talking about is correct and that the White House is not counting sort of its, its victory in hand until they actually get there, whenever that will be, whether it's this weekend, next week, whenever. Uh, but, but this is not something, and having covered this president since sort of day one of his, his inauguration back in, in 2017, it, it's not something he wants. This is a president who wanted to, for example, win the Nobel Peace Prize, right? That is a far cry from impeachment. That said, there is a sense from some people around the president that this is something that politically could actually end up mobilizing his supporters. This is something we've talked about before. The president uses this as a talking point on the campaign trail, although I will say this, in the rallies that we've seen this week, Lester, it has not been the main talking point for the president on the campaign trail. It certainly comes up. It is certainly something he discusses, but we haven't heard extended, you know, 50-minute discussions about it in the same way that we heard about, for example, some of the discussion around the special counsel investigation at rallies back when that was going on uh, over the last couple of years. So it is sort of an interesting tonal 
discussion from President Trump. He also is not talking about it much with reporters in these times when he does have the ability to do question and answer sessions. The White House here likes to talk about how accessible this president is and how he answers questions from reporters at many, in many instances. And that may be the case, for example, in Davos. He did that press conference when he was overseas at that Swiss summit just uh, last week, actually, when this trial was starting. But we have been uh, with the president now for the last two weeks, and he has made very, very few on-camera comments about this. He did an interview on Fox News overnight in which he briefly addressed what he has long called this impeachment hoax. Uh, but it is not something where we necessarily see tons and tons of on-camera comments. Now, he is tweet storming about it oh, periodically, right? He said a record number of tweets in a single day when this trial was getting started. Uh, the president clearly wants to air his displeasure with the way that this is going down. But ultimately, I think that he and others see the direction this is headed, see that it is largely, and our reporting has been, they are deferring largely to Senator Mitch McConnell to do the wrangling of senators here, like Lamar Alexander, like Lisa Murkowski, for example, leaving it up to Republican leadership to have those conversations on the Hill, because frankly, this is a president who has offended some senators in the past, Republicans in his own party, with the comments that he has made uh, and has insulted some of the very senators who are sort of key to the way this impeachment trial is moving forward, Lester. So lots of, of balls to watch. The president, we should note, is heading down to his uh, his South Florida resort, Mar-a-Lago, later on this afternoon. We'll have another opportunity to maybe ask him some questions. And just in the interest of letting you know that, you know, there is other news in the world uh, that we are expecting a, a briefing here in just the next couple of minutes or so on the coronavirus outbreak that is spreading. And it's possible we may get some news on that. We'll, of course, bring that to you as well. Yeah, you bet. Obviously, another uh, one of the major stories we're following. Thank you, uh, Hallie Jackson. Let's go back to the Hill. Casey Hunt, uh, we had assumed by now that we would hear uh, the president's attorneys making their appeal against uh, questions. Do we know what the delay is? Lester, we're not sure. We've got a reporter watching the floor of the Senate right now, but of course no one's allowed to have electronics in the chamber, so we're relying on periodic updates, somebody running that information out. What we can tell you is that we know there are offers going back and forth and conversations happening behind the scenes about exactly how all of this will wrap up. And uh, your conversations both with uh, Senator Harris and Senator Barrasso, one from each side, uh, were telling to me and how they described this process. I think Democrats clearly want to make a stand and, you know, underscore, draw a line underneath uh, the idea that they are not simply letting this go, letting the president be acquitted simply because we know uh, what the outcome is going to be. They want to take this last stand. So the question is, how does that play out? And, you know, the d dynamics on the Republican side obviously uh, hinge quite a bit on uh, what President Trump wants to do. And I think there's a very real sense and a lot of pressure on them to make sure that this is wrapped up before the State of the Union. So I think that's going to be a real tension point to keep an eye on with Democrats more interested in seeing this vote uh, in the middle of next week, Wednesday, uh, as we've reported, uh, whereas Republicans, of course, uh, more interested in pushing it to Tuesday. So it's kind of leaving open uh, the, a variety of possibilities. I, I think uh, everyone seems to agree that there's not a ton of interest in being in this building over this weekend. Everyone's a little tired of each other, I would say. Uh, but at the same time, uh, clearly weighty uh, questions at hand and still uh, different possibilities on the table for how this ultimately all comes to a conclusion. Yeah, we will keep our eye open for when uh, Senate TV switches the cameras back on in the chambers to certainly take you there. Uh, uh, but Chuck Todd, I mean, one of the calculations mm -hmm. has to be, is the American public kind of just weary of the process? Oh. That's got to be weighing into how they, how they bring this to Oh, they're end. completely weary. I mean, the fact is, you know, one of the things that I thought was a, was a reminder about, I think, why Republicans felt comfortable that they were going to go on this sort of slow, this slow path to acquittal and why Democrats weren't so confident. You know what I didn't see in the Capitol this, the last couple of weeks? I didn't see groups of people coming, impeach him now. You didn't see people in the street doing it. You know, you have this sort of resignation about this issue. Um, that doesn't mean people aren't fired up against the president or people aren't fired up for the president. But the fact that the passions didn't make their way to Washington, D.C. We didn't think about some of the great Supreme Court divides we've had, right? In those moments, how quickly is Washington flooded? And I think that was, to me, the first sign um, I've heard from some senators. Phones weren't ringing off the hook in either direction. So I do think the public, in a weird way, was ahead of it. You know, 
Uh, I had a, a friend of mine say to me, well, if, uh, you know why we're not watching impeachment? I said, why? Because you've told us what the outcome is already. Yeah. We know it's not going we to happen. We read you the last chapter. We, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we already read the end of the book. Now, okay, you guys are going to go through the motions. I get it, but we already know the ending. So that is why I think how this ends actually does matter. I do think the public is going to overall on Election Day judge how how we all handle look i think we're all going to get judged on how we've handled the trump era this has put this has yeah. put strains on so many of these institutions sure. the institutions of government our institution of, of journalism i mean the president's constant attacks in trying to delegitimize individuals or in, or, or, or certain entities has, has certainly created created these extra strains but i think in a weird way the public you could argue they're ahead of us and and and, and when you, it was funny to me to read lamar alexander's statement cuz i thought you know he actually is writing, following the polls. What do the polls tell us? A majority of people believe he did it. And the country is about evenly divided, literally evenly divided about whether you should keep him, whether he should have to leave. Which means there's a chunk of people who believe he did it, but aren't comfortable sending him out. There's a two-third standard. The public is not at a two-third standard. So you could argue that no matter what you think of the trial, the public, they, they are responding to where public opinion is. And, and for instance, Mike Braun said to me, uh, one of the, sen the senator from Indiana, one of the reasons I'm voting to acquit is that's what my constituents want me to do, which then goes back to the Senate We're being just, directly elected. Yeah. Is, that, is, is that what the framers ever intended in the first place? Yeah, but John Meacham, uh, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll come to you saying, John Meacham, the, the idea that the American public, the sentiment of the American public, how much do you think it's driving this? We, we talk about, okay, no witnesses. Uh, is there a price to be paid for that? But... But talk about the weariness factor and how it plays. Oh, I think the senators are absolutely reflecting the will of their constituents, at least the constituents who they believe control their own political fates. You know, Edmund Burke in the 18th century uh, laid out two different theories of representation, that a representative either reflected the will of his or her constituents or offered those constituents his or her best judgment, no matter what the opinion of the constituents would be. It's a direct model and a, what's called a trustee model. And the House, in the American context, the House was supposed to be the direct model, and the Senate, it was supposed to be a trustee model, where you'd be a bit removed from the passions of the moment and be able to think a bit right. longer term. That's fallen apart. And I think that uh, we're, what, we're follow, what we're seeing here is the on, an ongoing chapter, a, a sequential chapter from the 2016 election in which the numbers don't move very much. I don't think the witness, the, the process questions are important, but ultimately I think what the senators are reacting to is not enough of the folks in their red states or possibly swing states want to, to impeach the president. And I think it's not a whole lot more complicated than that. Yeah, Carol. Yeah, but um, I mean, don't you think that the Democrats have gotten um, some huge concessions and talking points out of this? I mean, this, this went from the president saying that this was a perfect phone call mm -hmm. to Republican senators saying uh, what he did was wrong and inappropriate. I mean, oh, the words are there. I mean, you know, if you wanted yeah. to be a campaign ad person and you needed to write an ad, you have Rob Portman's words, you'd have Marco Rubio's words, you'd have Lamar Alexander's words. There's no doubt there is this if they choose to do it. Um, I've, and, and that may happen in these Senate races. That could be where that becomes becomes one of those issues. I will just say it, 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 has, been a, it has been my observation that the Democrats don't seem to be as interested in weaponizing this to be in a, in a political context as much as the Republicans decided to, but they were in some ways weaponizing it essentially to keep their folks in line, right? This was Trump's super PAC stepped in. It was almost throwing out little warning shots, right, at, at, at some of these senators. When Mitt Romney first perked up, the entire weight of the Trump army came down on him. That was almost like a warning to anybody else who chose to go off the reservation. Yeah, we um, we were told it was a 15-minute break. Uh, things have gone along. My, my new spidey sense tells me something's up, but I don't know what it is. Well, that usually means the case, and we know that they're trying to figure out if they can agree to this 
tentative schedule, and, and it does seem like they're trying to accommodate the presidential campaign we a little Senator bit. We heard Senator Bra also say there is some possi yeah. possibility it, 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 it ends before Wednesday. But there's probably other pressures about the, the, the whole State of the Union issue. Um, who knows? Who knows? Uh, Pete Williams. Well, a couple of thoughts occurred to me, Lester. Number one is you were talking earlier about the extent to which this impeachment will uh, set a precedent. Um, you have to remember that if you, you, there's sort of two things you would judge that on. One is how it was carried out, the process, and the other is the result. Now, think about the result in the Clinton impeachment. There were many senators who felt that President Clinton did what the articles of impeachment said he did, but still didn't think it was an impeachable offense. So if that's the lesson of this impeachment, we've already been there. Uh, I think the bigger lesson is that you can have an impeachment without witnesses. In the Andrew Johnson impeachment, there were a whole passel of witnesses who testified on the Senate floor. Then you come to the Clinton impeachment, where there were only three witnesses who appeared by videotape clips on the Senate floor after they'd been deposed off the Senate floor in committee. Now we come to this, where there weren't any witnesses at all. So I think that's, a, that's perhaps a bigger legacy for future impeachments, potentially, how this one was conducted, rather than the result, which we've already been through before. Remember, no president has ever been removed from office, even though three presidents have been impeached and have sen and Senate trials. Now, I'm, I'm assuming that the result of this one, even though we don't have it yet. The only people that have ever been removed from office by impeachment are federal judges. So... It seems to me that it's the process that's the bigger legacy, uh, perhaps. And then one other point I would make, Lester, is we still have a decision to make in terms of how the rules are carried out, because the rules say when the Senate comes to deliberate on how it's going to vote, and remember the final vote is guilty or not guilty, it does so in executive session, that we wouldn't see that. They'd either go to the old uh, uh, Senate chamber elsewhere in the Capitol or turn off the cameras and throw everybody out. We don't know yet how they're going to do that. It's possible they would do that in a, in a closed session, although I, guess, I gather there's some move by Democrats to make sure that doesn't happen. But the rules do call for the senators to deliberate in executive session. And uh, Casey Hunt, we understand no electronics uh, in the Senate, and you're running people in and out. Any word about yes. what's going on? So we've got some uh, details from upstairs, Lester. I'm down on the first floor of the, the chamber, of course, one floor above. Uh, senators were milling around on the floor, but most critically, until just moments ago, Mitch McConnell was in his office. He is now walking toward the Senate floor, according to our reporters, so we should keep an eye on that. Uh, but much longer set of deliberations than we anticipated, and I think, you know, this conversation about exactly how the rest of this process is going to unfold is being had right now uh, in this building. And what Pete touched on is part of it. They could decide that they're going to open up the deliberations, but that would have to be included in whatever formal organizing resolution they're going to use to figure out how to set all of this up going forward. And we do know that if there does happen to be a closed session, the plan would be to keep it in the main Senate chamber, shut off the cameras, kick everybody out. There is no plan to, like what they did in the Clinton impeachment, they walked down the hall to a different chamber where the Senate used to meet. That's not on the table uh, for this round. But again, there's some pressure to open it up entirely. And, and but, yeah, but the vote itself would, would certainly be open to the cameras? The vote itself, yes, will absolutely be open to the cameras. Everybody will have to walk down on the floor. They'll call their names one by one, uh, and Americans will be able to see how their senator voted. Yeah. And Chuck, one of the things I think has been notable here, I and mean, we pointed this out to our audience along the way, that the Senate TV controls these mm -hmm. pictures. And the picture has been the, 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 the well of the right. Senate, the, the front. We haven't seen reaction from the senators. So even when they vote, we likely won't see them. And that's important, isn't it? It is. And what I'm not sure if we're going to, if we will at least see them at the, at their, at, if they stand up and speak yeah. or not, I don't, I don't know what, and I think they may have to agree upon those rules. Um, you know, I've, re I've watched the drawings. I've read all of the um, pool reports of the individuals and they're, and they're scribing in there. Uh, it would have been nice to have reaction shots, but then there's part of me, Caroline, we're talking about this. Are cameras in a courtroom a good idea or a bad idea, right? right? And, and it cuts so many different ways, right? Yes, on one hand, if it's the people's, if it's something like this, the public should be watching, right? We're all invested in it. But sometimes there is playing to the TV cameras. And sometimes you wonder, with the closed deliberations, you, know, you hear how much the Senate really got to know each other during the Clinton impeachment when the cameras were off yeah. and the staff was off and it was just those hundred people sort of hashing it out. Um, 
the Senate could use something like that again. There's uh, Mitt Romney in, uh, making his way down the hall. Uh, so we're beginning to see some movement uh, of the senators. By the way, that is something. I thought it was interesting. John Barrasso, he, he wanted to trumpet the bipartisan vote to acquit. And he was about, to, and I heard him stumble. He was going to say, and I think, and then he would pull back. That essentially he wanted to say all Republicans were going to vote to acquit. And it's not clear, I think, that all Republicans are going to vote to acquit. And I think he himself. Well, he said there's going to be a bipartisan outcome. And I the, said, right, and I said, is there going to be a bipartisan outcome to convict? And he's, you know, the speculation being that Mitt Romney, we just saw him there walking with Lamar Alexander, mm -hmm. that Mitt Romney might be a vote to mm -hmm. convict that sort of denying the president, yes, he can get the talking point of bipartisan acquittal, but there would also be a bipartisan Why conviction. was it important for some of these senators to declare their vote? Lamar Alexander. Well, I think it was sort of to take, I think what McConnell wanted from them was take away the drama of the witness vote. Um, and Wait. I think at this point, it's pretty clear to me, by the way, that Lisa Murkowski would have, would have not have been a no vote if her vote would have gotten witnesses. She seems to have decided to be the no vote after she realized she, they weren't going to have the vote. Yeah, she said no fair trial in the Senate. That's right. She didn't want to see the chief justice sort of dragged into this. And I do think that's an interesting observation by her, who I think, again, this is, we're so cynical about all of these folks sometimes. And, uh, and I, individually, I think that there is, I, I think they, they mean what they say when they write these things. I think Lisa Murkowski was concerned that if John Roberts got dragged into this, that it would eat away at the, at the Supreme Court. So, I, again... I know folks' passions are really high and there's some anger out yeah, there, Senator but Collins take here. some of these words that they're, read all of their releases. I think in, in, in some ways these might be one of the few times where we're getting the genuine sense of how they feel about the body, how they feel about this process, and how they feel about this institution. Yeah, John Meacham could probably weigh in on that uh, as we see uh, uh, Leader McConnell. Uh, this idea of, of voting conscious and also how history will record your vote is more than a yes or no, but, but, but these words uh, like uh, Lisa Murkowski has as attached to hers? Well, words do matter, uh, particularly historically. And we, as we reconstruct this era, which we will do forever, uh, what's unfolding now will be a subject of historical and political and cultural uh, inquiry uh, as long as the phrase of Churchill's, as long as the English language is spoken in any corner of the globe. And one of the things that if you want to loom larger in legislative history in particular, but this is also true of presidents, you go against the expected grain. Uh, you want to be Margaret Chase Smith, uh, one of Senator Collins' predecessors, a senator from Maine who very early on opposed Joe McCarthy. Uh, she was four years ahead of the men. Uh, by the time Joe McCarthy was censured in 1954, 22 of the Republican senators joined Senator Smith, but she was first. Uh, John Kennedy once said that uh, Profiles in Courage, which he wrote, was not particularly long and only one volume. Uh, there, are, there isn't that much raw material for this. I think these senators had a chance uh, to change the first line of their obituary, and I think several of them have taken a pass, and that's just on the vanity grounds. Uh, I think there's substantive grounds that uh, would have led them to a different decision as well. All right, John, thank you. It looks like they are back in session. Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate, the House managers have said throughout their presentation and throughout all of the proceedings here again and again that you can't have a trial without witnesses and documents, as if it's just that simple. If you're going to have a trial, there have to be new witnesses and documents. But it's not that simple. And that's really something that is a trope that's being used to disguise the real issues, the real decisions that you'd be making on this, on this decision about witnesses. Because there's a lot more at stake there. And let me unpack that and explain what's really at stake there. The first is this idea that if you come to trial, you've always got to go to witnesses, have new witnesses come in and that. But that's not true. In every legal system, and in our legal systems on both civil and criminal sides, there's a way to, to decide right up front in some quick way whether there's really a triable issue, whether you really need to go to all the trouble of calling in new witnesses and having more evidence and something like that. 
And there's not here. There's no need for that. Because these articles of impeachment on their face are defective. And we've explained that. Let me start with the second article on the obstruction charge. We've explained that that charge is really trying to say that it's an impeachable offense for the president to defend the separation of powers. That can't be right. But it's also the case that no witnesses are going to say anything that makes any difference to the second article of impeachment. That all has to do with the validity of the grounds the president asserted, the fact that he asserted long-standing constitutional prerogatives of the executive branch in specific ways to resist specific deficiencies in the subpoenas that were issued. No fact witness is going to come in and say anything that relates in any way to that. It's not going to make any difference. And on the first article of impeachment, that too is defective on its face. And we've explained, we heard it again today here, that the way they, they have this subjective theory of impeachment, that will show abusive power by focusing just on the president's subjective motives. And they said again today here that the way they can show the president did something wrong is that he defied the foreign policy of the United States. And we talked, I talked about that before, this theory that he defied the agencies within the executive branch. He wasn't following the policy of the executive branch. That's not a constitutionally coherent statement. The theory of abuse of power that they framed in the first article of impeachment would do grave damage to the separation of powers under our Constitution because it would become so malleable they can pour into it anything they want to find illicit motives for some perfectly permissible action. It becomes so malleable, it's no different than maladministration, the exact ground that the framers rejected during the Constitutional Convention. The Constitution defines specific offenses. It limits and constrains the impeachment power. Now, there's also the fact that we actually heard from a lot of witnesses. We heard from a lot of witnesses in the proceedings so far. You've heard 192 video clips, by our count, from 13 different witnesses. There were 17 witnesses deposed in closed hearings in the House, and 12 of them testified again in open hearings. You've got all of those transcripts, so you can see the witnesses' testimony there. The key portions have been played for you on the screens. And you've got over 28,000 pages of documents and transcripts. You've got a lot of evidence already. But there's another principle that they overlook when they say, well, if you're going to have a trial, there just have to be witnesses, as if the most ordinary thing is you get to trial and then start subpoenaing new witnesses and documents. That's not true either. And we pointed this out. There's, in the regular courts, the way things work is you've got to do a lot of work preparing a trial called discovery to find out about witnesses and depose them and find out about documents before you get to trial. You can't show up the day of trial and say, oh, Your Honor, actually, we're not ready we didn't subpoena John Bolton, or Witness X, or Witness Y. And now we want to subpoena that witness. Now we want to do discovery. And why does that matter here? Because here, to show up not having done the work, and to expect that work to be done in the Senate by this body, has grave consequences for the institutional interests of this body, and it sets a precedent really sets an important precedent for two bodies, for the Senate and for the House. Because what the Senate accepts as an impeachment coming from the House determines not just precedent for the Senate, but really precedent for the House in the future as well. If the procedures used in the House to bring this proceeding here to this stage are accepted, if the Senate says, yes, We'll start calling new witnesses because you didn't get the job done. And whatever process you use to get it here, then that becomes the new normal. And that's important in a couple of ways. One is, as we've pointed out, the totally unprecedented process that was used in the House that violated all notions of due process. 
There are precedents going back 150 years in the House ensuring that someone accused in an impeachment hearing in the House has due process rights to be represented by counsel, to cross-examine witnesses, to be able to present evidence. They didn't allow the president to do that here. And if this body says that's okay, then that becomes the new normal. And they, they stand up here, the House managers, and say, this body would be unfair if this body doesn't call the witnesses. They talk about fairness. Where was the fairness in that proceeding in the House? And Manager Schiff says things would be arbitrary if you don't do what they say and call the witnesses they want. Well, wasn't it arbitrary in the House when they wouldn't allow the president to be represented by counsel, wouldn't allow the president to call witnesses? There was no precedent in a presidential impeachment inquiry to have open hearings where the president and his counsel were excluded. It also would set a precedent to allow a package of proceeding from the House to come here that the House managers say, well, now we need new witnesses. We haven't done all the work. And it's witnesses they didn't even try to get. They didn't subpoena John Bolton. And they didn't go through the process when other witnesses were subpoenaed. When Dr. Kupperman, Charlie Kupperman went to court, they withdrew the subpoena. And now to say that, well, fairness demands that this body has to do all that work, that sets a new precedent as well. And it changes, it would change for all the future the relationship between the House and the Senate in impeachment inquiries. It would mean that the Senate has to become the investigatory body. And the principles that they assert, they, they did a process that wasn't fair. They did a process that was arbitrary, that arbitrarily denied the president rights. They did a process that wouldn't allow witnesses. And then they came here on the first night Remember when we were all here until 2 o'clock and in very belligerent terms said to the members of this body, you're on trial. It will be treachery if you don't do what the House managers say. That's not right. When it was their errors, when they were arbitrary and they didn't provide fairness, they can't project that onto this body to try to say that you have to make up for their errors, and if you don't, the fault lies here. Now, they also suggest that it's not going to take a long time, that they only want a few witnesses. But of course, if things are opened up to witnesses, and it is going to be fair, it's not just one side, it's not just the witnesses that they would want. The president would have to be permitted to have witnesses. And with all respect, Mr. Chief Justice, the idea that if a subpoena is sent to a senior advisor to the president and the president determines that he will stand by the principle of immunity that's been asserted by virtually every president since Nixon, that that'll just be resolved by the Senate right here, whether or not that privilege exists by the Chief Justice sitting as presiding officer. That doesn't make sense. That's not the way it works. The, the Senate, even when the Chief Justice is the presiding officer here, can't unilaterally decide the privileges of the executive branch. That dispute would have to be resolved in another way, and it could involve litigation and it could take a lot of time. So the idea that this will all be done quickly, if everyone just does what the House managers say, is not realistic. It's not the way that the process would actually have to play out in accord with the Constitution. And that has another significant consequence. Again, affecting this institution as a precedent going forward. Because what it suggests, the new normal that would be created then is kind of an express path for precisely the sort of impeachments 
that the framers most feared. The framers recognized that impeachments could be done for illegitimate reasons. They recognized that there could be partisan impeachments. And if this is the new normal, this is the very epitome of a partisan impeachment. There was bipartisan opposition to it in the House. And it was rushed through with unfair procedures, 78 days total of inquiry. Think about that. In Nixon, there had been investigating committees and there was a special prosecutor long before the House Judiciary Committee started its investigation. In Clinton, there was a special counsel, an independent counsel, for the better part of a year before the House Judiciary Committee even started hearings. Everything from start to finish, in this case, from September 24th to the articles of impeachment were considered in the Judiciary Committee, was done in 78 days. In 78 days, and for the 71 of them, the President was entirely locked out. So the new normal would be slapdash, get it done quickly, unfair procedures in the House to impeach a President, then bring it to the Senate, and then all the real work of investigation and discovery is going to have to take place with that impeachment hanging over the President's head. And that's a particular thing that the framers also were concerned about. And I mentioned this the other day. In Federalist Number 65, Hamilton warned specifically about what he called, and I'm quoting, the injury to the innocent from the procrastinated determination of the charges which might be brought against them. Because he understood that if an impeachment charge from the House wasn't resolved quickly, it was hang if it was hanging over the President's head, that in itself would be a problem. And that's why they structured the impeachment process so that the Senate could be able to swiftly determine impeachments that were brought. That also suggests that's why there is a system for having thorough investigation, thorough process done in the House. And Hamilton explained that delay after the impeachment would afford an opportunity for intrigue and corruption. And it would also be, as he put it, a detriment to the state from the prolonged inaction of men whose firm and faithful execution of their duty might have exposed them to the persecution of an intemperate or designing majority in the House of Representatives. And that's what's happened here. And if you create a system now that makes the new normal a half-baked slapdash process in the House, just get the impeachment done and get it over to the Senate, and then once the President's impeached, and you have the head of the executive branch, the leader of the th free world, having something like that hanging over his head, then we'll slow everything down. And then we'll start doing the investigation and just drag it out. That's all part of what makes this even more political, especially in an election year. It's not the process that the framers had in mind. And it's not something the Senate should condone in this case. The Senate is not here to do the investigatory work that the House didn't do. Where there's been a process that denied all due process, that produced a record that can't be relied upon, the reaction from this body should be to reject the articles of impeachment, not to condone and put its imprimatur on the way the proceedings were handled in the House, and not to prolong matters further by trying to redo work that the House failed to do by not seeking evidence and not doing a fair and legitimate process to bring the articles of, impe of impeachment here. Thank you. Mr. Sekulow. Chief Justice, members of the Senate, over a seven-day period, you did hear evidence. You heard evidence from 13 different witnesses, 192 video clips, and as my colleague, the Deputy White House Counsel said, over 28,000 pages of documents. You heard testimony from Gordon Sondland. 
He's the United States Ambassador to the European Union. You heard that testimony. He testified in the House proceedings. I did not have an opportunity to cross-examine cross him. If we get witnesses, I have to have that opportunity. William Taylor, former acting United States Ambassador to the Ukraine, testified. You heard his testimony. We didn't get the opportunity to cross-examine him. He would be called. Tim Morrison, the former Senior Director for Europe and Russia of the National Security Council. You saw his testimony. They put it up. We didn't get an opportunity. We did not have an opportunity to cross-examine him. Jennifer Williams, Special Advisor on Europe and Russia for Vice President Mike Pence. You saw her testimony. They put it up. I did not have the opportunity to cross-examine her. If we call witnesses, we would have to have that opportunity. David Holmes, the political counsel at the United States Embassy in Ukraine, saw testimony from him. We're not able to cross-examine. If he's called, or if we get witnesses, we will call the ambassador, and we will cross-examine. Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman, you saw his testimony appear before the House. We didn't have the opportunity to cross-examine him. If we call witnesses, we will, of course, have that right to cross-examine him. Fiona Hill, she is the former Senior Director for Europe and Russia on National Security Council. She testified before the House. If we have witnesses, we have the opportunity to call her then and cross-examine Fiona Hill. Kurt Volker, former United States Special Representative for Ukraine negotiations. They called him. We did not have the opportunity to cross-examine. If we're calling witnesses, these are witnesses you've heard from, we would have the right to call witnesses and to cross-examine Mr. Volker. George Kent, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs. You saw his testimony. They called him. Here to allow some of our stations to we return to regular programming. The rest of you, coverage will right continue on NBC. And to cross-examine Deputy Assistant Secretary Kent. The former United States Ambassador to Ukraine, Ambassador Yovanovitch, they called her. You saw that testimony. We did not have the opportunity to cross-examine her. If we have witnesses, we would have to call her. Laura Cooper, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia. They called her. You saw her witness testimony right here. We did not have the opportunity to cross-examine her. We would have to be given that opportunity. These are witnesses against the President. Laura Cooper, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia. Again, same thing. David Hale, you're not Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. He was called by the House. You saw his testimony. We never had the opportunity to cross-examine. If we have witnesses, we have to have the opportunity to do that. There were other witnesses that were called, or you saw their testimony, or heard their testimony, where it was referred to Catherine Croft, the Special Advisor for Ukraine Negotiations, Department of the State, Mark Sandy, the Deputy Associate Director for National Security Programs, and Christopher Anderson, Special Advisor for Ukraine Negotiation, Department of State. You heard their testimony referred to. We did not have the opportunity to cross-examine them. So this isn't going to happen if witnesses are called in a week. Now, that's just the witnesses that have been produced that you have seen by the House managers. You are being called upon to make consequential constitutional decisions. Consequential decisions for our Constitution. We talk about the burden of proof I've said this before, I'll, I'll say it again, 31 times the manager said they proved their case, 29 times they said the evidence was overwhelming. Manager Nadler, he didn't only say it was overwhelming in his view. On page 739 of the congressional record, he's very clear. He says, not only is, is it strong, there is no doubt. 
That's what he says. The one thing that the House managers think the President and Council's got right is quoting me, talking about Mr. Nadler, Manager Nadler, as saying, beyond any doubt, it is indeed beyond any doubt. Now, of course, we think that they have not proven their case by any stretch of any proper constitutional analysis. In the Clinton investigation, they talk about witnesses being called, but the three witnesses that were called had either testified before the grand jury or before the House committees. These weren't new witnesses. What Mr. Philbin said is, is correct. Under our constitutional design, they're supposed to investigate. You are to deliberate. But what they're asking you to do is now become the investigative agency, the investigative body. If they needed all this additional evidence, which they said they don't need, and by the way, not only did they say it in the record, this is House Manager Nadler, quote, this is on, when he was on CNN back on the 15th of this month, we brought the articles of impeachment because despite the fact that we didn't hear from many witnesses, we could have heard from, we heard from enough witnesses to prove the case beyond any doubt at all. The same can be said of Representative Lofgren. You know we've had, we have evidence proving the case through, for example, at the meeting when Bolton said it was a drug deal. Well, we have fact witnesses. Hill was there, Vindman was there, Sondland was there. So this idea that they haven't had witnesses, is that's the smokescreen. You've heard from a lot of witnesses. The problem with the case the problem with their position is, even with all of those witnesses, it doesn't prove up an impeachable offense. The articles fail. I think it's very dangerous if the House runs up, which they did, articles of impeachment quickly, so quickly that they are clamoring for evidence despite the fact that they put all of this evidence forward. They got their wish of an impeachment by Christmas. That was the goal. But now they want you to do the work they failed to do. But as I said, time and time again we heard, you didn't hear from witnesses, you didn't hear from many witnesses. You, Mr. Schiff modified that a little bit today. A little bit. You heard from a lot of witnesses. But if we go down the road of witnesses, this is not a one-week process. Remember I talked about the waving the wand and Ukrainian corruption in Ukraine was gone. You're not going to have a witness wand here where we just say, okay, you got a week to do this and get it done. There's no way that would be proper under due process. But you know, due process is supposed to be for the person accused. And they are turning it on its head. They brought the articles before you. They're the ones that rushed the case up and then held it before you could actually start the proceedings. But they're the ones that passed the articles before Christmas. You know, we talked a lot about the court system and the fact that they were seeking witnesses. And when it got close to actually having a court proceeding, they decided that they didn't want to have that witness go through that proceeding. They actually withdrew the subpoena to moot the case out. How many constitutional challenges will we have in this body because they placed a burden on you that they wouldn't take themselves in putting their case forward? If we look at our constitutional framework and our constitutional structure, um, that's not the way it's supposed to work. Now, our opposition to this motion is rather straightforward, as I've said. We came here ready to try the case on the record that they presented. The record that the managers told us was overwhelming and complete. Mr. Schiff went through every sentence of the articles of impeachment just a few days ago and said, proved, proved, proved. The problem is, would it prove, prove, prove is not an impeachable offense. You could, you could have witnesses that prove a lot of things, but if there's not a violation of a law, if it doesn't meet the constitutional required process, the constitutional required substantive issues, of do these articles, these allegations rise to the level of a sufficient for a removal of office, 
for a duly elected president of the United States? It doesn't. And especially so, especially so, when we are in an election year. I am not going to take the time, your time, which is precious, to go over in each and every allegation about witnesses that I could. I could do it. I could stand here for a long time. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to say this. They created the record. Do not allow them to penalize the country and the Constitution because they failed to do their job. With that, Mr. Chief Justice, we yield our time. Thank you, Counsel. The House managers have 30 minutes remaining. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Uh, Senators, I want to walk through some of the arguments that you've just heard from the President's counsel. The first uh, were arguments made by Mr. Philbin. Mr. Philbin began by saying the House managers assert that you can't have a trial without witnesses. And he said, it's not that simple. Actually, it is. Uh, it is pretty simple. It is pretty simple. In every courthouse, in every state, in every county in the country, where they have trials, they have witnesses. And I think you heard Mr. Philbin tie himself into knots as to why this should be the first trial in which witnesses are not necessary. But you know, some things are just as simple as they appear. A trial without witnesses is simply not a trial. You can call it something else, but it's not a trial. Now, Mr. Sekulow said something very interesting. He said, the House investigates and the Senate deliberates. Well, he would rewrite our Constitution with that argument because the last time I checked the Constitution, it said that the House shall have the sole power of impeachment and the Senate shall try the impeachment, not merely deliberate about it, not merely think about it, not merely wonder about it. I know you're the greatest deliberative body in the world, but not even you can deliberate in a trial without witnesses. But Mr. Sekula would rewrite the Constitution. Your job is not to try the case, he says. Your job is merely to deliberate. That is not what the founders had in mind, not by a long shot. Now, Mr. Philbin says, none of these witnesses would have relevance on Article 2. I guess conceding that they would have relevant evidence on Article 1. But that's not true either. Imagine what you will see when you hear from the witnesses who ran the Office of Management and Budget, or imagine what you will see when you read the documents from the Office of Management and Budget. What you will see is what they have covered up. What you will see is the motive for their complete obstruction of Congress. When you see not the redacted emails, not the fully blacked out emails, that they deign to give in the litigation under the Freedom of Information Act, but you, when you see what is under those redactions, you will have proof of motive. When you see those documents, you will see just how fallacious these non-assertions of executive privilege are. You will see, in essence, what they have covered up. It could not be more relevant to whether their panoply of legal argumentation to justify we shall fight all subpoenas is merely a cover-up in legal window dressing. So these witnesses and documents are critical on both articles. Now, you also heard Mr. Philbin argue, and again, this is where we expected we'd be at the end of the proceeding, which is essentially they proved their case. They proved their case. We pretty much all know what's gone on here. We all understand just what this president did. No one really disputes that anymore. So what? So what? It's a 
version of the Dershowitz defense. So what? The president can do no wrong. The president is the state. If the president believes that corrupt conduct would help him get reelected, if he believes shaking down an ally and withholding military aid, if he believes soliciting foreign interference in our election, whether it be from the Ukrainians or the Russians or the Israeli prime minister or anyone else in any form that it may take, so what? He has a God-given right to abuse his power. And there's nothing you can do about it. It's the Dershowitz principle of constitutional lawlessness. That's, that's the end-all argument for them. You don't need to hear witnesses who will prove the president's misconduct because he has a right to be as corrupt as he chooses under our Constitution. And there's nothing you can do about it. God help us if that argument succeeds. Now, they say that these witnesses already testified. And so you don't need to hear from anybody. There were witnesses who already testified. And so the House doesn't get to call witnesses in the Senate. That would be like a criminal trial in any courthouse in America where the defendant, if he's rich and powerful enough, can say to the judge, hey, judge, the prosecution got to have witnesses in the grand jury. They don't get to call anyone here. They had their chance in the grand jury. They called witnesses in the grand jury. They don't get to call witnesses here. That's not how it works in any courtroom in America. And it's not how it should work in this courtroom. Of course, you heard the argument again, repeated uh, time and time again. The House is saying they're not ready for trial. Of course, we've never said we weren't ready for trial. We came here very prepared for trial. I would submit to you the President's team came here unprepared for trial. Unprepared for the fact that there would be, as we all anticipated, a daily drip of new disclosures that would send them back on their heels. We came here to try a case, prepared to try a case, and yes, we had, I hope, the not unreasonable expectation that in trying that case, like in every courtroom in America, we could call witnesses. That is not a lack of preparation, that is the presence of common sense. They didn't try to get Bolton, they argued. Mr. Philbin said they didn't even try to get Bolton. Of course we did try to get Bolton. And what he said when he refused to show up voluntarily is, if you subpoena me, I will sue you. I will sue you. He said basically what Don McGahn told us nine months ago. I will sue you. Good luck with that. Now, the public argument that was made by his counsel was that he and Dr. Kupperman, uh, out of, you know, just due diligence, they just want a court to opine that it's okay for them to come forward and testify. As soon as the court blesses their testimony, they're more than willing to come in. They just are going to court to get a court opinion saying they could do it. And so, of course, we said to them, if that's your real motivation, there's a court about to rule on this very issue of absolute immunity. And very shortly thereafter, that court did. That was the court, Judge Jackson in the McGahn case, and the judge said this argument about absolute immunity, which yes, presidents have always dreamed about and asserted, but which has never succeeded in any court in the land, it was ridiculed in the case of Harriet Myers, it was made short shrift in the case of Don McGahn, where the judge said, no, we don't have kings here. In the 250 years of jurisprudence, there is not a single case to support the proposition that the president can simply say that my advisors are absolutely immune from process. And of course, in every other non-impeachment context where the courts have looked at the issue, of a Congress's power to enforce its subpoenas against witnesses or documents, the courts have said 
the power to compel compliance through subpoena is co-equal, co-extensive with the power to legislate, because you can't do one without the other. If we can't find out whether the president is breaking the law, violating the Empowerment Control Act or any other when he is withholding aid we appropriated from an ally, how can we legislate a fix to make sure that this never happens again? We can't. If we can't get answers, we can't legislate. That is a proposition vindicated by every court in the land, and of course, in the context of impeachment, the courts have said that is never more important. Never more important. Now, I don't know why, after saying he would sue us, and we had to expect that, like Don McGahn, where we are still in court nine months later, I don't know why he's changed his mind. But I suspect it's for the reason that if this trial goes forward and he keeps this to himself, it will be very difficult to explain to the country why he saved it for the book. When he knew information of direct relevance and consequence to a decision that you have to make about whether a President of the United States should be removed from office, it will be very difficult to explain why that was saved for a book. Well, I would submit to you, it will be equally difficult for you to explain as it would be for him. But you can ask him that question. Why are you willing to testify before the Senate but not the House? And you should ask him that question. Now, it was uh, said and, and, and um, it has the, uh, the character of you should have fought harder to overcome our obstruction. The House should have fought harder to overcome our stonewalling. Shame on the House for not fighting harder to overcome our stonewalling. If only they had fought harder to overcome our stonewalling, maybe they could have gotten these witnesses earlier. That's a really hard argument to make while they're stonewalling. You should have tried harder. You should have taken the years that would be necessary to overcome our stonewalling. And the reason why that argument is in such bad faith, as I pointed out to you yesterday, that while they're in this body arguing the House was derelict, slapdash, they should have fought harder and longer and endlessly to overcome our stonewalling. While they're making that argument to you, the House should have fought up and down the courts from the District to the Court of Appeals, the Supreme Court, and back again. They're in the courthouse arguing the opposite. They're in the courthouse saying, Judge, they're trying to enforce a subpoena on Don McGahn. You need to throw it out. They don't have the jurisdiction this is non-justiciable. You can't hear this case. That is a really hard argument to make. I credit them for making it with a straight face. But that's the character of it. You should have fought harder to overcome our stonewalling and obstruction. Now, they also say the Chief Justice cannot decide issues of privilege. No, the Chief Justice can't make those decisions. You need to let us litigate this up and down the court system. That's a pretty remarkable argument because the Senate rules allow the presiding officer to make judgments to rule on issues of evidence, materiality, and privilege. That is permitted under your own rules. We don't need to go up and down the courts. We've got a perfectly good judge right here. Now, you heard our proposal yesterday that we take a week, just a week, to depose the witnesses that we feel are relevant, that they feel are relevant, and that the justice rules are relevant. Just one week. Now, they can say that the Constitution 
requires them to go to court, but of course it doesn't. There is absolutely no constitutional impediment from these fine lawyers saying, you know, that's eminently reasonable. We will allow a neutral party, the Chief Justice of the United States of America, to rule on whether a witness is material or immaterial, whether they're being called for purposes of probative evidence or harassment, and whether you're making a proper claim of privilege or merely trying to hide crime or fraud. The concern they have is not that this Chief Justice will be unfair, but rather that he will be fair. But do not make any mistake about it. Do not let them suggest that there is something constitutionally impermissible or it would violate the President's rights to allow the Chief Justice of the United States to make those decisions in this court because he is empowered to do so by your rules and by the Constitution which gives you the sole power to try impeachments. In the sole exercise of your power to try impeachments, you can say, we will allow the Chief Justice to make those decisions. Now, Mr. Sekulo said that you've heard the testimony of 13 witnesses. And I think the impression is meant to be given, if not to you who know otherwise, then maybe to the people watching at home that they must have been in between errands while watching the Senate trial and missed where those 13 witnesses came before the Senate and testified. But of course, you heard no live testimony in this body. There wasn't any live testimony before this body, and I don't recall any of you in that super secret basement bunker they've been talking about. Now, I'll admit there were 100 members eligible to be there, so maybe I missed one of you. But I don't think you were there for the live testimony in the House. Now, Mr. Sekulow says the President was deprived of his right of calling these witnesses himself and cross-examining these witnesses in the House, but that's not true either because the President was eligible to call witnesses in his defense, defense in the Judiciary Committee and chose not to do so if the President's counsel felt that, you know, Bill Taylor says that he spoke with Sondland right after this phone call with the President and Sondland talked about how the military aid was conditioned on these investigations. The president wanted Zelensky in a public box. And I'd really like to cross-examine that West Point grad Vietnam vet because I don't believe him. You know, they could have called Bill Taylor and the Judiciary Committee and cross-examined him. Or they could have called Mick Mulvaney and put him under oath and let him contradict what we now John Bolton would say. But of course they didn't do that. No, they said merely, just get, over, get it over with in the House. For all there was too quick, too slapdash, get it over with in the House. Because as the President said, when it comes to the Senate, we'll have a real trial where he gets to call witnesses. But they've changed their tune. Because now they know what they really have known all along, which is those witnesses would deeply incriminate this President. And so, instead, they have fallen back on the argument that if we're going to go down the road to having a real trial, if we're going to go down the road into having a real trial, we, the President's lawyers, are going to make you pay. And the form of this argument is we are going to call every witness under the sun. We're going to call every witness that testified before the House. We're going to call every witness that we can think of that would help smear the Bidens. We are going to keep you here until kingdom come. That's essentially the argument that they're making when Mr. Sekulo says we're going to bring in Fiona Hill and we're going to bring in Tim Morris and we're going to bring in this witness and bring in that witness. You have the sole power to try this case. You do not have to allow the president's lawyers to abuse your time or this process. You have the power to decide, no, we gave each side 24 hours to make their arguments. We're going to give each side a shared week to call their witnesses. 
You have that power. If you didn't, you couldn't have constricted the amount of time for our argument. You can likewise determine how much time should be taken with witness testimony. Now, Mr. Sekulow ended his argument against witnesses with where Mr. Philbin essentially began. It all comes back to the Dershowitz principle. What's the point of witnesses if the president can do whatever he wants under Article 2? What's the point of calling witnesses? What's the point of having a trial if the president can do whatever he wants under Article 2? The only constraining principle, and I think that uh, one of the senators asked yesterday, what's the limiting principle in the Dershowitz argument? If a president can corruptly seek foreign interference in his election because he believes that his election is in the national interest, then you cannot impeach him for it, no matter how damaging it may be to our national security. What is the limiting principle? And I suppose the limiting principle is only this. It only requires the president to believe that his reelection is in the national interest. Well, it would require an extraordinary level of self-reflection and insight for a president of the United States to conclude that his own re-election was not in the national interest. Not unprecedented, mind you. I think that was the decision that LBJ ultimately arrived at. But I would not want to consider that a meaningful limitation on presidential power. And neither should you. Finally, counsel expressed some indignance, indignance that we should suggest that it's not just the Senate, it's not just the president, rather, who is on trial here, but it is also the Senate. How dare the House manager suggest that your decisions should reflect on this body? That's just such a calumny. Well, let me read you a statement made by one of your former colleagues. This is what former U.S. Senator John Warner, a Republican of Virginia, had to say. As conscientious citizens from all walks of life are trying their best to understand the complex impeachment issues now being deliberated in the U.S. Senate, the rules of evidence are central to the matter. Should the Senate allow additional sworn testimony from fact witnesses with first-hand knowledge and include relevant documents, he asks. As a lifelong Republican and a retired member of the U.S. Senate, who once served as a juror in a presidential impeachment trial, I am mindful of the difficult responsibilities those currently serving now shoulder. I believe, as I'm sure you do, that not only is the president on trial, but in many ways, so is the Senate itself. As such, I am strongly supportive of the efforts of my former Republican Senate colleagues who are considering that the Senate accept the introduction of additional evidence that they deem relevant. Not long ago, senators of both major parties always worked to accommodate fellow colleagues with differing points of view to arrive at outcomes that would best serve the nation's interests. I wit I, if witnesses are suppressed in this trial, and a majority of Americans are left believing the trial was a sham. I can only imagine the lasting damage done to the Senate and to our fragile national consensus. The Senate embraces its legacy and delivers for the American people by avoiding the risk. Throughout the long life of our nation, federal and state judicial systems have largely supported the judicial norms of evidence, witnesses, and relevant documents. I respectfully urge the Senate to be guided by the rules of evidence and follow our nation's judicial norms, precedents, and institutions to uphold the Constitution and the rule of law by welcoming relevant witnesses, 
and documents as part of this impeachment trial. That is your colleague, former Senator John Warner. Senators, there is a storm blowing through this Capitol. Its winds are strong and they move us in uncertain and dangerous directions. Jefferson once said, I consider trial by jury as the only anchor yet imagined by man by which a government can be held to the principles of its constitution. The only anchor ever imagined yet imagined by man by which a government can be held to the principles of its constitution. I would submit to you, remove that anchor and we are adrift. But if we hold true, if we have faith that the ship of state can survive the truth, this storm shall pass. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Mr. Chief Justice. The Majority Leader I is recognized. the absence of a quorum. The Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. All right, um, Leader McConnell calling for a quorum call here, which would suggest that, uh, Chuck, that, that well, not everyone was there. I, which I would find to be odd. I, we have heard every day I've in the last two weeks, pain of imprisonment. Pain of imprisonment, <laughs> yeah. right. So that, you know, perhaps they're just delaying here while they figure out. Uh, <laughs> well, let's bring folks up to the, speed. Ready and, for the witness vote. Yeah. That is what we expect next. Yeah, well, um, the uh, president's lawyers. Uh, Seemed they only took up a little bit of time, so they have more time, although we were led to believe they wouldn't use all their time to make the argument against uh, 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 not calling uh, witnesses in this case, uh, whether they're going to uh, continue on here shortly. But either way, once that, uh, that discussion is over and those arguments are made, our understanding is that they will move right to the vote on the issue of whether to allow new witnesses and new evidence in this case. So we're, uh, we haven't even heard the quorum call begin here, so it's a little unclear what's going on. Is uh, Casey Hunt, no, Casey's not, not up yet, okay. So we're going to just continue to watch this and try to get a sense of, of what's happening here. Uh, you've heard uh, uh, Adam Schiff making his impassioned call for the need for witnesses and even uh, uh, using the name of uh, a former Democratic, uh, former Republican colleague of some of these senators, uh, trying to impress upon them the need to uh, uh, have what he said would be a fair trial uh, and that would involve the calling of witnesses. You heard the president's lawyers uh, suggest that uh, there's other people they might want to talk to and, and reading basically from the witness list that was in the congressional uh, uh, hearings. Uh, Casey's with us now. Casey, I'm vamping here because I'm not really quite sure what's going on. Lester, honestly, I'm right there with you. I actually <laughs> uh, was just upstairs in the chamber uh, watching the floor when they suddenly, uh, Mitch McConnell, uh, delivered that line, which you know we hear all the time in the Senate, I suggest the absence of a quorum. That's essentially Senate procedure speak for, I need a minute. And you know what this suggests to me is that they are trying to figure out exactly how to proceed next. Uh, we've been doing a lot of reporting about what's been going on behind the scenes in terms of how this is all going to play out over the course of the next 24, 48, 72 hours. And you know, my latest reporting is essentially that they're at some sort of point of disagreement. Republicans had huddled in McConnell's office during the last break, and we were chatting about how that went on for longer than we expected. Uh, they eventually did go to the floor, listen to some more of these arguments, but uh, I spoke to sources afterward who said that there's disagreement among Republicans about how to proceed. We know that Democrats had suggested a plan that would have led to an acquittal vote on Wednesday, the day after the state of the union uh, that would have their candidates in Iowa over the weekend, that would have some senators coming back Monday to be able to give some statements uh, Monday and Tuesday and then put that vote on that third day. However, the, the question mark here is whether Republicans were going to go along with that. 
Uh, and that, that's what we just don't know. I was watching the floor carefully. Lindsey Graham was in the Republican cloakroom on his cell phone. I'm interested to know exactly who he was talking to. We know he keeps lines open uh, to the White House. Uh, there also was some note passing on the Republican side. Uh, James Lankford, uh, senator from Oklahoma, got a note, uh, walked back into the cloakroom. He and Rob Portman of Ohio uh, came out together. They've been people that we've been watching throughout this Im impeachment process. So uh, I think that the, the, the challenge here here is figuring out exactly when to place that acquittal vote. And there's some tension between what Republicans want up on the Hill, what Democrats want, and obviously what President Trump wants, which of course, uh, in a process like this, you know, he's actually been pretty restrained, I think, is the general feeling among Republicans on the Hill. He hasn't necessarily intervened in the process in a way that's been detrimental to what Mitch McConnell's goals have been throughout. And, you know, frankly, this is on track to give him the outcome he wants, an acquittal without calling those additional witnesses. Uh, but at the same time, you know, every minute that ticks by, you never know uh, when the president may be tweeting something out. So, uh, again, we're still waiting for that critical vote uh, on witnesses. We expect that tally to be 51 uh, to 49 and that Republicans will prevent uh, the calling of witnesses based on based on our count. Uh, we also have some new reporting just in uh, from our producers here uh, that Schumer and McConnell are currently talking to each other on the floor. That's really where this deal is going to be hammered out is between the two of them. So perhaps we'll learn some more uh, as that comes conversation unfolds and we start to uh, hear uh, if we can get some senators out of the chamber that's our best way to find out uh, information around here Lester it's been a bit of a challenge compared to our usual uh, circumstances having them all trapped on the floor all together uh, without their electronic devices yeah, interesting so to, to you as we had it yeah interesting to note that Senate TV has not uh, cut off the cameras and let's take let's just take a chance here let's listen see if the mics are open we can get a sense Okay, that was a big fail there. Uh, not feeding audio, but hey, the guy, guy has to take a Flat shot. Television. Uh, but uh, yeah, some interesting conversations clearly going on here. Um, it, what doesn't seem in doubt is that this is going to lead to a vote against witnesses. They seem to be worried on um, the, the 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 choreography. They're trying to land to the plane. Like we know, they, I mean, they're really they're trying to figure out how to land the plane. We don't know what time they're landing it, right? We don't know what kind of rough conditions it's going to be when they land it. We just know it's going to get landed. And then the, the, the next question is, what is the, what is the purpose? What are, what are Democrats hoping to get out of this, short of, obviously, um, a, a conviction? But what are they hoping to get out of? Well, if you're them, you want to, you, you want to drag this out. You don't want to give a quick acquittal. And you want to hope, even at a minimum. It was interesting this morning, Chris Van Hollen, Democratic senator from Maryland, I had an interesting thing. He says, you know, Republicans ought to explain their rationales in as great of a detail as Lamar Alexander did. So he was, while disappointed at what Lamar Alexander came across, he was certainly embracing the fact that, hey, he heard the evidence. He believes that, that what, what the president did was wrong. He has decided that other considerations, including the current polarization, climate, and all of that are reasons to do this. But it was interesting. He goes, it's important that every senator explain their rationale in full. Uh, explain why you do or do not believe the facts as they are. So I do think Democrats see some utility in trying to make them do that. And again, when you look at what Marco Rubio and some others, the needles they're trying to thread, which is they're uncomfortable totally saying what the president did was good, I think some of them do want to be able to explain this vote not in the dark of night. So that's the sense that, that, that I get with these senators. Yeah, uh, Senators <laughs> Schumer and McConnell at one point were seen there uh, near the lower right of your screen uh, uh, chatting a little bit. Uh, Casey, you, got, you have some more? Uh, Lester, we're just trying to identify exactly who um, I'm watching. I'm watching the screen here, uh, and again, uh, we're getting some lots of arm waving going on uh, down on the floor. You can see at the very bottom of the screen that's uh, John Cornyn. He's no longer uh, the minority whip or majority whip, excuse me, the number two, but he plays a key role. There we go. Now yeah. we can see a little bit more. Cover the banner, going on. right, Casey? Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. That so Thune, that's uh, that yeah. John Thune, yeah, right underneath the NBC News logo on your screen. Uh, Mitch McConnell, right there. Uh, that's also one of the the staffers for the Democratic side. Uh, unfortunately, I, I can't do much with the two hairlines that are right down in front, but uh, I think one of them may be Senator Chuck Schumer. So this seems to be a huddle that's going to determine exactly where uh, this uh, day goes as Chuck was laying out. I think landing the plane is an apt analogy in this case. Yeah. Did, was it clear whether the president's lawyers had concluded their their presentation or did this did, did something did, did McConnell get a signal to stop things? Yeah. 
So, Senator, um, C Congressman Schiff was uh, speaking there uh, at the end and had concluded what he had to say. And as he sat down, McConnell rose and simply said, uh, I suggest the absence of a quorum. So uh, beyond that, uh, we don't uh, really know if, if, if it, there was no kind of formal signal that the White House uh, had concluded its argument it's argument time. So uh, again, it, it really, like I said, I was sitting in the in the front row of the, the press gallery, uh, not necessarily expecting that we were going to get a break here for quite some time uh, when this unfolded rather abruptly. Well, it's always encouraging to see uh, senators talking among themselves uh, in what has been a largely partisan uh, process that we've been witnessing here. But uh, clearly, uh, uh, we, we sensed something was afoot during the last break that uh, went from uh, what was supposed to be 15, 20 minutes to almost an hour, and then this uh, abrupt halt here uh, and these uh, sidebar conversations. That, that is the top of Schumer's head, and uh, on the bottom left there talking, and you can see McConnell. There, there is. I wish yeah. I could see the person. We should let you know that we actually, we've actually blown this picture up here a little bit. So this is yeah, I heard. It. This is yeah. great. The digital, we were able to switch to a different feed that allows the, the you know, just like you might on your own. On your own device, you, you, you zoom in, yeah. and we're able to do that um, here on our normal, regular television feed as well now. So these uh, look like to be uh, serious discussions here and uh, about what we don't know. Uh, well, well, look, we know they want to figure out when to do the vote on witnesses. One of the trickier things is, is if they do want to, you know, when the, Senate's in, when the Senate is in an impeachment trial, then there's all these specific rules. But they want to kind of not be an impeachment trial for two days while they let senators fly and back and forth from Iowa. And they do. The, so I do think there's a little bit of a complicated procedure um, a sort of dance that they have to do in order to actually lay out what Casey's been reporting. I mean, let's say they want to do that. That still isn't navigating the Senate rules here are actually going to be complicated, even if you want to do it. Yeah. Carol, uh, we, we, we talked to Senator um, uh, Barrasso a little bit earlier, and, and he left open the possibility this thing could end before, before Wednesday. Um, any thoughts as to, as to, as you watch these arguments we've heard, what, what yeah. difference they may make at this point? So um, it, it is very strange to be uh, talking about or to be listening to closing arguments when uh, a number of senators have already come out in written statements to say how they're going to vote. Uh, as, as a trial lawyer, I'm having little trouble um, <laughs> adjusting to this process. Um, but I, I thought that some of the, um, some of the arguments were, were kind of interesting because you, had a, uh, you have a situation where Jay Sekulow was saying, um, and, and Pat Philbin for the, for the White House and for the president were saying, uh, it's crazy to call witnesses in, uh, in the Senate because it will take, it will take days, weeks, months uh, to, to litigate the privilege issues. It was witness purgatory, uh, right? Yes. Witness purgatory, um, but at the same time he's saying, and that is exactly what the House managers should have done during their investigation. So there's a little bit of an internal inconsistency there, obviously. And, um, and then Schiff turned it around by basically saying he was caught in this vicious circle right, of, right. of you know, obstruction and, and why didn't you but try saying, hard enough? You didn't try hard enough to overcome our obstruction. Yeah, that was that, that <laughs> I think was, that was, that was right. And, and, and that, that, is, uh, that is pretty indicative of the, of the problem here is that there is no more accommodation. You know, there, there, are, there is supposed to be an attempt at accommodation by both sides, but it does take two to tango, and we haven't seen any tango. What's interesting yet. here, we see the president's lawyers off on the right. We saw a moment ago. They don't appear to be involved in whatever is, uh, is, is happening here. And there's the house managers. That's uh, Adam Schiff there walking uh, slowly and again, they don't appear to be part of whatever is going on. Or no, this is definitely. You see Laura Dove down there, who I think is the Mitch McConnell's uh, right. um, essentially floor manager uh, on 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 these procedural. Chief moves. Justice is. I can't see who he's speaking to there. It looks uh, like Ed Markey from here. Okay. If I uh, if if I'm not if I so recognize it, that it jawline, like, basically it looks like several cordial conversations and then one business conversation that we were watching at the yeah. lower uh, lower part of your screen. Uh, uh, let's bring in uh, uh, Pete Williams here. Pete? Yes, I can solve the mystery. That man in the gray jacket who's just walking out of the frame is Jeff Manier. He is Ooh, the okay. top uh, staff aide to uh, the Chief Justice at the Supreme Court. His, his title is Counselor to the Chief Justice. He's, in essence, his administrative assistant. And now, apparently, he wants to walk over and try to find out what's <laughs> going on for the Chief. <laughs> Yeah, and the Chief Justice has, has stepped down as well. And again, these look like perhaps uh, 
more uh, cordial conversations, but if you can see the right well, look, the bottom of your everybody, screen, that, no, that, I mean, let's be realistic. The only conversation that matters is what the one that McConnell that's the business, and Schumer, yeah, yep. that's the business. Everybody else is speculating as to what McConnell and Schumer are doing, just like us. Yeah. It, let's not, let's, let's, let's not, let's be honest. I mean, Hallie Jackson at the White House, uh, you know, is, is there any sense that they might hold off the vote on witnesses or, or even that some of these votes may have changed? You know, you, you would hear it before we would, I think, on this yeah. end, because the White House has largely taken that hands-off approach. I, I, I laughed when Chuck said the only conversation that matters is, is the one that's, that's at the center of the screen down there, and I think that's exactly right, as you're seeing a little bit of that shot now. Senate Leader Mitch McConnell, he's there with some of his Republican leadership, and uh, I think that uh, I'm looking to see if allies of the president are down there. You can see John Thune, it looks like. Um, listen, the president's team has largely in this process throughout, Lester, deferred to McConnell as it comes to issues of timing, et cetera. What I am still working on trying to report out is where the president's head is at on this. It's my understanding, uh, based on many conversations that I've had over this past week, that he wants to get to the acquittal vote. He'd like it sooner rather than later, but nobody around the president's orbit wants to do anything that would shake that up, right? That would that would shake loose anything that could be a wild card or have the president disrupt that process, uh, it, perhaps inadvertently, if you will. The, the question is, is he okay, is the president, is he going to put any of his political capital behind this push to perhaps speed up the trial, to, to make some changes? I don't get the sense that that's going to happen, at least based on where our reporting is right now. But I'll tell you, the president just left the White House, Lester. I'm, I'm, I just ran back inside in here to the briefing room at the White House from the South Lawn, where the president and First Lady have, have now departed. They are on their way to South Florida. The president is spending Super Bowl weekend down at his Mar-a-Lago resort. It is often a place, I will tell you where he works the phones with his friends and allies back home on Capitol Hill. And I would ex certainly expect that to be the case this time around. Uh, but our sense for, from talking with people close to the president's legal team is that, yes, they had expected the witness vote today. Although, again, this is uh, sort of an interesting, interesting delay here. And we're, we're all I think we're in the same boat as you wondering where this is going to go and yeah. what Senator McConnell there is going to say. Yeah, on the Super Bowl weekend, it kind of looks like, a, you know, do you go for go for two? The onside kick. Uh, <laughs> like there's some serious uh, <laughs> negotiations about what what play here. You're down down by seven. All right. Uh, enough enough of that metaphor. Let's go to uh, uh, Casey Hunt since that was going nowhere. What have you learned? <laughs> we're all well, over the place. We're... Airplanes, football. <laughs> you try one, Casey. Give us one. Yeah, Go ahead. no, you for pick real. One. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Um, no, I, we just watched Senator Schumer walk off the floor and then back onto the floor. And this conversation has really uh, continued among Republicans. And that's been the piece of this that's actually the most interesting to me. My sense of how this morning has played out based on our reporting is that Democrats sent this offer over to Republicans. Republicans, Mitch McConnell in particular, seemed receptive to it. But there seemed to be some issues mm. inside the Senate Republican conference about what to do next. So there's a couple things that they have to resolve here in terms of how this plays out. And obviously, uh, with the stakes so high, uh, it all, every single little bit of this matters uh, in different ways. So one key question, of course, is do they wrap up tonight, potentially, late into the evening, get it over with? That was, of course, what many Republicans were pushing for. Uh, that had seemed to become less of a possibility through the day. Uh, this matters quite a bit, of course, to the 2020 presidential candidates, those Democrats who are have been missing out on campaigning in Iowa. That, of course, happens on Monday. Uh, the second piece of this is, do senators want a chance to have their own say in this trial? In the Clinton trial in 1999, this was all the deliberation at the conclusion of the trial were all done in a closed session. So they did those in the old Senate chamber, which is just down the hallway from where everyone is right now. Uh, they did it without cameras, just uh, person to person. They were given special permission to release their own remarks afterward because there is actually a technicality in the Senate rules that says in an impeachment trial in a closed session, uh, a senator can be expelled or a staffer fired for publicly putting out anything that's said in that closed session. That's how stiff the consequences would be if you actually said uh, or, or re repeated something that was said in a closed session. So they have to grapple with how to set up the rules that might allow an open version of this session. We've heard a lot of interest from senators in being able to make public remarks on the record in context of this trial. That would mean that the Senate has to figure out an interesting new way to do it because by definition, if the courts gaveled in, all 100 of them have to be sitting there. That's why we heard this idea of, okay, well, 
will perhaps we'll come back on Monday. We'll do a normal session of the Senate, but focus it on impeachment. Give each senator a chance to say their piece, mm -hmm. uh, talk about it, and then ultimately put that acquittal vote on Wednesday. But that's caused some consternation because yet another political dynamic, that key one that we've been talking about throughout this conversation, the State of the Union. And what is this president who is so keenly tuned to headlines, chirons, cable news coverage, uh, what does he want to be the headline when he goes and makes that big address on Tuesday night? And there is a faction of the Republican conference that uh, is very close to this president. They're trying to do what he wants them to do. And that's the needle that Mitch McConnell has to thread. He has to get those guys to go along uh, with the more moderates in his conference. And we know that McConnell, during the last break, was meeting and talking with them, Lamar Alexander, Mitt Romney, Susan Collins, others who uh, perhaps are a little bit more focused on how this trial makes the Senate look yeah. uh, as opposed to how it makes the president look. So it seems yeah. as though we're seeing all of those dynamics and discussions playing out uh, live in front right. of you on the Senate floor. And look, one of the reasons, you know, in 1999, the senators didn't want to do public statements because remember, the allegations were salacious. Yeah. So nobody wanted to have this conversation about the, sex the, the sexual nature of that and it was not something to feel as if I want to share with the public my views on the president's sex life and how much that involves. This is about the operations of the presidency, how government works. This is this. So I would assume there is more of a desire to give a more public explanation to this. So I think that is why also I think that they don't want to do this behind closed doors. We know why they wanted to do it behind closed doors 20 years ago. They didn't want to talk about the allegations in public. And that uh, that serious meeting appears to have broken up. I think we still see the top of uh, uh, Leader McConnell's uh, head, but uh, that conversation that he was... Uh, I guess they haven't found a quorum part. yet, Lester. <laughs> right? They're not. searching for a quorum, yeah, right? That's the I, technical term. Yeah, and I was wondering if anybody, any of these senators have ventured out in, in the hallway yet, Casey? Oh, I'm sorry, Lester. Yeah, I, have, have any of the, I'm sorry to catch you off guard, any of the no, senators no. Uh, made their way into the hallway? Well, so that's actually just what I was trying to figure out, so my apologies. Um, they, this uh, place where we're positioned, the Senate floor is right above my head. There's a stairwell to my left that goes down into the basement where senators walk through, and there's a senators only staircase right behind me. There's a little sign that says members only. So occasionally they come up and down this staircase, and the fact that we haven't seen any of them, I actually find to be rather telling. It suggests to me that they are all still corralled in the cloakrooms up on the floor, basically having been told, don't go very far. And we, I know, have some cameras positioned outside the chamber that we're cycling through now. Um, this one, uh, that's the, the subway. That's right actually underneath uh, my feet. Uh, and it doesn't look to me as though we're seeing any senators being caught on any of those cameras either. So uh, that, um, you know, says to me that, hey, they're still really engaged in these conversations. Our team's also reporting uh, that Roberts, the Chief Justice, just walked off of the Senate floor. Uh, so that's also a potentially uh, intriguing development. I'm interested to know uh, perhaps where he's conducting those conversations. Like. Yeah, I guess technically the trial is uh, is still underway, uh, uh, so... Yeah. We are under yeah. impeachment trial rules, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I've been waiting for days to see what was going to happen when we got to this point because I was looking at both the organizing rules that uh, Mitch McConnell put out at the beginning of this trial and also uh, the, the general rules of uh, Senate impeachment trials, which have been in effect for a couple of decades now, but can be changed at any time by vote of the Senate. And, um, you know, it's like railroad tracks that just sort of stop and disappear uh, when it gets to this point, you know, whether there are going to be deliberations or not, whether those deliberations will be open or not. Um, all of this is very unclear. This is, I believe, a live picture of the president uh, just arriving at uh, Joint Base Andrews on um, Marine one and about to get an Air Force One to Halley. He's heading down to Florida, correct? He is, Lester, yeah. Uh, and it's funny, I just, well, while you were having that conversation with Carol and Chuck, I was on the phone with a couple of sources trying to get more information here. On and I just wanted to listen, Lester. Good idea. Someone shouted. Yep. Our, our pool pals doing their job, so right, now. Yeah, yeah. So what you heard there, just to explain to folks and pull back the curtain a little, there are about a dozen or so of our colleagues in the White House press corps who travel with the president at all times. They stand under the wing of Air Force One, and they always get this shot, right? We always have the president going up the stairs, waving before he gets in the door and then going in. At times, the president has walked over to that group of reporters under the wing and spoken with them. And you heard one of our colleagues, I think, very capably try to shout that question of when do you want this trial to end? When do you want this acquittal vote to happen, essentially? Uh, and the president, as he has done now, 
I think seven times in a row ignoring questions in these settings uh, when he's had the ability to answer questions. He is not stepping in this, at least not right now. You saw him with the first lady. This is a, uh, uh, as much as any president can take, not a business trip, but a pleasure trip. That is what this is this weekend. He is going to Mar-a-Lago, uh, which is a place that he often goes in the winter on weekends for some downtime. Obviously, the office of the presidency goes with him. And you can see his acting chief of staff, Mick Mulvaney, getting on the plane with him as well. I imagine, based on my understanding of how these conversations go, that there will be a conversation about this on the plane. So we're going to try to report that out and get back to you. Let me go to uh, Pete Williams right now. Hallie, Pete. Well, um, I've just talked to some uh, uh, some officials uh, who who say that they have uh, an inkling of what this discussion was all about, and it, it's going to come as no surprise to anybody that it's about the schedule, about going longer. Uh, apparently, one of the big concerns is the State of the Union message on Tuesday, because that that presents, of course, the political dimension, but as much of a concern as anything is the security dimension that parts of the capitol building are shut down sequentially as you get nearer and nearer the state of the union message now obviously that's on the other side of the capitol it's in the house chamber what you're looking at now is the senate floor so it's not directly involved but it just becomes a logistical nightmare for people to get back and forth so apparently one of the things being discussed is not having a session tomorrow uh, if this is going to go into next week, uh, and there's apparently some interest in doing this uh, in both parties, of not having it wrap up immediately. So that would mean probably no session tomorrow, no session on State of the Union Day, and that would mean possibly all of this wrapping up on Wednesday. So I would just caution that this is according to one person who, as I say, has an inkling of what this discussion is about and what it has been over the past hour. So. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just curious why that discussion not. I'm not suggesting you have the answer, but it is. Uh, it seemed rather, uh, rather abrupt. Um, well, no, I think it's been something that's that's that. You, I mean, remember that 45-minute, uh, uh, 15-minute break <laughs> that we just had yeah. in the in the last break. Uh, that's where this started, and I guess it just hasn't been resolved yet. All right, Pete, thank you. We watched some of the, uh, Senator Inhofe, by the way, mm -hmm. so some of the senators have, in fact, left the chamber. Senate TV, though, has left that camera up inside the Senate chamber. There's uh, Chief Justice John Roberts down to the That's uh, a left. good sign when it's staffers and not senators up there. You would assume they're starting to at least perhaps explain to the parliamentarian what they're about to do. What's going on, yeah. All right, we'll continue to watch that picture. We are going to take a brief pause here, however, to allow some of our stations to return to regular programming. For the rest of you, our coverage of the Senate impeachment trial of President Trump continues. And we are in a holding pattern right now, as, uh, as my friend Chuck here says. We're trying to figure out how to land this airplane, uh, what we believe may be uh, conversations about scheduling. Uh, this occurred as uh, Adam Schiff wrapped up his allotted amount of time to make the case that uh, witnesses, specifically John Bolton, should be called. Additional uh, uh, evidence should be called. The expectation is, is that a vote will follow very shortly on that very question. The uh, president's lawyers had made their case and have some remaining time, in fact. We don't know, however, if they have uh, concluded. Uh, their argument on that particular question when this uh, quorum call was announced uh, by Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. On the right hand of your screen, the president's plane about to depart uh, for Mar-a-Lago, uh, where he will spend the weekend. Uh, as Howie Super Bowl weekend down there. Super, no, Super Bowl weekend. And, uh, he and it's in Miami. I, have a, I imagine that, um, you know, Mr. Kraft, the owner of the Patriots, is I think a Mar-a-Lago uh, frequent guest, if not a member. I have a, I have a feeling that some of his football owner friends are... Yeah. Might be stopping by Mar-a-Lago this weekend. And the weekend. president is scheduled to give an interview on uh, on Fox, uh, yeah, kind his of a Super traditional uh, Super Bowl interview, and right. uh, uh, he may not be able to have that interview with this thing resolved yet. Well, that's the question, Lester. Uh, that is scheduled. Fox, as is traditional for a president to do, although this president has not done it every year, as, as you know. Yes. Um, but oftentimes the He'll president skip will it. give it. Depends interview. on the network. I have a feeling, <laughs> well, Hallie. You know, uh, he he is giving one this year to, to Fox, uh, and and it is going to be Sean Hannity. Well, not to one of their journalists, to Sean Hannity. Yeah. Well, he's also a friend of the president's, Chuck, as right. I think folks know. Um, somebody the president talks to outside of the sort of on-camera piece of it. Uh, the, the question had been, listen, up until about, I think, 9, 10 o'clock this morning, the expectation, or at least the thinking had been, that the president would be able to, not to torture a sports metaphor here, but potentially spike the football if this vote had been finished by Saturday morning uh, in this pre-Super Bowl interview that he is going to be conducting. 
that may not happen now. And so I think that that uh, is part of the calculus. Remember, this is a president who, who understands his coverage. He likes to watch his coverage. And this is based on years of covering him and, frankly, his public tweets about it. Remember, just a week ago, he tweeted about, as you can see, it looks like the back of Senator Romney, I think. Um, this is a president who tweeted that Saturdays are the death valley of TV coverage when his lawyers were starting the opening arguments for his trial. So he's clued in on how his media coverage is. The bigger thing, though, I think is less the Super Bowl piece of it, and he will be engaged in that this weekend. It's the State of the Union, as we keep talking about here. Um, and I think Pete's point and Pete's note on the restrictions and security issues surrounding that is certainly an interesting one. We know uh, some of what the president is talking about. The theme this year of the State of the Union broadly is going to be the great American comeback, according to an administration official who describes what the president will say as a relentless vision of optimism. Uh, would not discuss or get into just how much the president would be talking about impeachment, either if it's over, if it's not, if it's still going on, if the trial's still happening or what, but did say that obviously the president is adaptive, as we all know, to including things in his speeches right up until the moment uh, that they happen. So I would, I would certainly anticipate the president to address it in some form or fashion on Tuesday night. Yeah, interesting. And, and Hallie, you've noted uh, once again we saw him take a pass on on questions from reporters right. as he got on Air Force One. But he's, he's tweeting uh, tweeting away in the last hour. Uh, so the radical is. left do nothing. Democrats keep chanting fairness when they put on the most unfair witch hunt of the history of the U.S. Congress. So he's obviously still very engaged and continuing that uh, uh, that's that series of, of, of tweets, even as he maintains a, a silence uh elsewhere. And that's an excellent point, Lester. And frankly, it's a point that the president uh, has made repeatedly, and his aides have too, that he doesn't need to take questions from reporters, right? He has Twitter. He has, by last count, as I'm looking now, 71.9 million followers on Twitter. And the White House uh, and his aides believe that that is an effective platform for him to get his message out because, frankly, he tweets and then you and I and the rest of the media sphere talk about it because that is a statement from the president of the United States. So yes, he is vocal. Uh, what he is saying, though, I, I am looking for news out of his tweets, and I don't know that we've seen that yet, um, an indication, because right now the president is continuing to air some of the issues that he has with this impeachment overall, calling it a witch hunt, uh, saying that the Democrats are scamming America in some of his recent tweets. That is language we have heard from the president before. I'm looking to see if the president will tweet something about the timing of this uh, and and read the tea leaves and any signals that he may be sending publicly to Republican leadership via his Twitter account. We know he has the ability and often does tweet from Air Force One, as you can see it on the right side of your screen taken off. There is a there is Wi-Fi on that plane, Lester. Yeah, there's a, there's certainly you know, and TV if you're, ability. If you yeah. recall the last 11 days of the presidential race, Donald Trump was actually somewhat disciplined when it came to both Twitter and his ability to spout off those the last 11 days when Comey reopened that investigation. Someone reminded him, you actually might win the presidency if you don't, don't get in your own way. And it was the most disciplined he was on, on sort of spouting off, whether it was on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's interesting. It's sort of, you know when he's got discipline, it's when literally his future is in the hands. I mean, this is a case where somebody did get to him and said, you know, you go the wrong way and this trial could end up going but three weeks. But look at how much of the House manager's so. case was built on those clips Exa of the president standing there with a chopper in the background. Uh, As you know. Nancy Pelosi used to love to say, he self-impeaches. You know, that used to be her point because he himself would essentially confirm the, quote, hearsay. You know, they love to talk about Gordon Sondland's hearsay. Well, the president went on the White House uh, South Lawn and said, when asked what did he want the Ukrainians to do, he said, well, if they were smart, They'd open an investigation on the Biden. So he China, himself yeah. has been his own worst enemy in this trial. And perhaps somewhat, look, people get to him. You can ask Hallie. They try to get him to not do this all the time. It's always interesting the moments he actually listens to that advice. This appears to be, for him, one of those moments. Yeah, in two weeks in this trial, this is the first time we've at least been able to see on TV uh, senators uh, kind of enjoying themselves. Uh, it's uh, King, uh, that's it's Angus right. King, Ted Cruz, Lamar Alexander, so even bipartisan chit-chat. Yeah, How about uh, that? And then uh, Mitch McConnell there in the, at the very bottom, the, uh, the back, right. of, back of his head. Uh, there were, appeared to be, as we said, some serious discussions going on now. It seems like uh, cordial uh, conversations. The uh, Chief Justice continues to uh, have conversations uh, with, with folks as, uh, as we try to get some sense of, of what's happening. As Pete Williams told us, uh, this may very well be uh, some uh, questions about scheduling. Uh, Casey Hunt also is getting a bit of a read on things. Casey? Uh, so uh, one Democratic aide has described this situation as, quote-unquote, 
anarchy, um, which okay. <laughs> seems to uh, be the current state of affairs here in terms of what the schedule is going to be. Basically, the bottom line uh, seems uh, seems to be that we're going back and forth on scheduling. Each side obviously has opposite political demands, and nobody can seem to figure out exactly how to go forward. The, the suggestions are coming quickly, furiously. Uh, we have some reporting that suggests there may have been a counteroffer sent from Mitch McConnell and the Republicans over to Democrats, but that their counteroffer perhaps put some of those 2020 Democrats who want to go to Iowa in a box. Uh, so you can see each side trying to play up their own uh, interests here. And the White House uh, aides, one of our uh, team members saying uh, they've seen some White House aides looking less than pleased. Uh, so we, we're going to try to dig around and, and see, get some more insight uh, into that. Because remember, all of this is limited by, there are rules that govern how the Senate operates. And the reason why you're seeing this at all is because the only way the Senate can override any of its rules or you know make a decision about what to do is to have all 100 of them agree, which uh, is not you know easy on a normal day, let alone when the stakes uh, are this high. And you know McConnell could, in theory, do whatever he wanted to do if he can get 51 of his people on board. But even that uh, is pretty much uh, is is a is a much more significant challenge than it might be under different circumstances. Yeah, we've year. lost a sight of uh, of Chuck Schumer. We had saw him, we saw him down there a bit earlier with uh, uh, Leader McConnell. Uh, do we do we know if he's still in the chamber? So he had walked out of the chamber and then he had returned. And we're not sure if he's returned back again or not. I will put that question uh, to our team here. Casey, and see if we can find the out. fact yeah, that Chuck, McConnell is not, and Ms. Schumer are not, I mean, this sort of would feed your notion that McConnell sent his counteroffer, and now it's now up to Schumer to go figure out um, yeah. what he so can that's, accept. That's, I mean, if you were to just read body language there. Right. No, that's that uh, that that drives exactly with our reporting, Chuck. And as you can see, that that's now what was a bipartisan chat session has now um, turned into a Republican-only conversation. And you've got kind of like all the wings of the Republican conference represented in that frame: McConnell, the leader, Lamar Alexander, uh, the moderate Ted Cruz, who's been doing a lot of the White House's work behind the scenes here, uh, John Barrasso, another member of leadership, and and Cornyn, somebody who uh, has had a lot of conversations with both sides, and who also, as you know, is up for re-election. Election in 2020, kind of another piece uh, of the conference uh, in terms of how kind of all those things balance out. The absence of Democrats uh, does line up with, you know, our reporting that it seems as though an offer has gone back to the Democrats. Now they're going to have to decide what to do with it. So I think all of us are feeling like suddenly this, what seemed like it might be a short night tonight, is extending out into the future. Uh, but I think the timing on when we might have an acquittal vote is more uncertain than ever because, uh, you know, if in fact the proposal is as we've uh, outlined, and I, I want to be careful because we're still trying to nail down some of these details with our sources, but uh, one possible idea of floating out there would be an open mic session, quote unquote, uh, through the weekend with an acquittal vote on Monday. That's saves the White House, uh, their State of the Union, uh, but and gives Democrats a chance to talk, but it pins the uh, 2020 Democrats here uh, in Washington. So uh, unclear if that will fly. You know, I think, I think Democrats are a little split on this question, too. There are some of them who do want to go out and hit the campaign trail, and uh, it's a relatively significant number of them. Others, you know, feel as though uh, they are much more, uh, they, they need to stay here, and they need to use every tool at their disposal in the Senate to make a point about this because it's their last chance uh, to do it. Uh, and, you know, there's a political dimension to that. There's also, I think, you know, for some of them, a moral dimension to it as well. So uh, I think all of that probably uh, being worked out behind the scenes uh, right now. It's, it's really quite something to me that we get to uh, kind of have this unfold while the cameras are still live on the Senate floor. I mean, I, I think we should just underscore for people how rare uh, that is, even if you happen to be watching, you know, C-SPAN 2 on a given uh, Tuesday when they're under normal business, you still don't get a chance uh, to see uh, as many extended conversations as are, as are playing out right now for everyone to watch. And wouldn't we love to be a fly on the wall there uh, in, in this and many of the conversations going on? In the, we'll be disappointed. They're probably talking, so? about, probably talking about less than you think. You know, yeah. Did you catch? Are you going to binge the new season of BoJack? You You're know. such a jaded Washington, I, you know. Washington guy. It's, it's good to see a little decorum uh, back in the Senate again, but it reminds me of a phrase I once heard, which is uh, a cocktail party without the cocktails. That's what it looks like to me. Well, and actually, back in the old days in the U.S. Senate, um, 
It, the cocktails would be down there anyway. <laughs> well, but I have to tell you, I mean, the, 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 the difference here in two weeks, we watched uh, when this trial began, we watched, you know, Democratic resolution after resolution get shot down. Uh, Republicans were, were controlling this process apparently from, from beginning to end. And now we hit this point in the road uh, where, I don't know, it's too strong to call it negotiations, but there's uh, clearly some serious conversations. Uh, uh, Judge Roberts, uh, Justice Roberts has, has taken his seat. Let me go to uh, Pete Williams right now, who has a bit more information. Or at least hovering near his seat anyway. Uh, so what my understanding of what's happening here is this, in terms of the thinking within the Republican side here, is um, they are sort of pulled between the desire of the White House to have this wrapped up by the time the president gets up there on Tuesday for the State of the Union message. But on the other hand, uh, my understanding is that some of the Republican moderates, who basically uh, the, 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 the party is very beholden to right now because, of, because they're not going to vote for witnesses, that spares the president having to have this trial go into hearing witnesses. There's a desire to accommodate them, and they're the ones who want this not to end quickly. Uh, on the other, you know, on the one hand, they, they don't want the moderates, I'm told, don't want to hear witnesses. But on the other hand, they don't want that to drive a sudden end to this. So that may mean moving it into Wednesday uh, because they, uh, under this theory, they would not meet on the State of the Union Day because of logistical and, and security problems. So at least that's one of the uh, one of the equities that's being discussed here. And, of course, there will be the argument that it, you look at that amount of time, witnesses could have, in fact, been dis, uh, deposed in, in that window of opportunity. But clearly, uh, it seems clear, at least, uh, um, that that's not going to happen, that there will be a vote. And we still believe uh, uh, sometime this afternoon or early evening on the question of allowing witnesses. Uh, both sides have made their arguments. As I noted, the president's attorneys still have time available under the rules of, of the Senate if they wish to continue to make their case against witnesses. Their, uh, their argument has been uh, that the House had its opportunity um, and brought a, uh, a, a, a damaged uh, case before the Senate here, and therefore they do not have the right for witnesses, live witnesses here. So you see the senators on the floor. Uh, we did see the uh, Chief Justice Roberts take his seat. We don't know if that uh, signals are about to get back in, uh, into order here. There's, there's really never, um, uh, I guess it technically remained in session when this uh, quorum call uh, occurred. Uh, as, as, uh, There's Diane Feinstein now. Yeah, in the blue, yeah. Yep, in yeah. the blue there, talking. Uh, oh, there we go. There's Some, uh, Senator Bennett. Chad Brown. Chad Brown coming through. So um, many of them taking advantage. We don't know if they've been part of discussions or simply uh, taking care of personal business. Uh, but they have left the chambers. And under what instructions? How much time they've been they've been given to return is a little bit unclear. Uh, but this is a this is a day unlike the last few days where we kind of knew the schedule. This is a day we were all uh, driving seat of the pants kind of seeing where this is going and uh, what we heard one staffer calling this anarchy that may be too strong a term but that's at least how one person is characterizing what's going on Look, right Democrats now. have some leverage here too because you know if, if they don't like the rules there is some you know they can do what they did the other day when they dragged the first day of the trial yeah. that you saw and so it, it it is there's so many different factions you have to please here and while there is a general consensus that they all kind of want to get to the same they know what the reality is going to be, so they want to get to the same place. You get toward the end here, and it's like, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You're going to jam this on us? Well, if you do that, we can jam you this way. Yeah. And there is a little bit of that. But, they're, but they're sensitive to the optics. They are, and I think the, 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 the Republicans know that the Democrats, they jam the Democrats too much on this, too much on the State of the Union. Well, I think people... I think Republicans' problems is the problem is they realize that 75% of the public thinks we ought to have witnesses. I'm not a lawyer, but I know enough to know what the public knows, and that is that you can't have a real trial without witnesses and testimony uh, and evidence. And they know that the public won't. Republicans intuitively now understand that if they're answering their phones or looking at their mail, they understand the public thinks this is this is not a real trial if they don't have witnesses like you do at every trial in Richland County, Ohio, or Toledo, or Cleveland. So what's the next step here? Maybe I don't know. I think we vote on witnesses, and um, it appears that almost no Republicans have, I mean, you've got, you've got, Donald Trump doesn't want witnesses. 
because he knows how damaging they'd be. They were in the room. Mitch McConnell's a lapdog for the president, and apparently not more than a couple Republicans have grown a spine. Democrat Sherrod Brown stopping to talk to reporters in the hallway there. But didn't have insight on what was actually no, happening no, on no the floor No insight on this, but yeah. uh, just continuing, continuing with the, uh, the Democratic mantra that you can't have a trial without witnesses. And that was the point of, uh, of the last uh, few hours of uh, uh, House managers making their case and also the president's attorneys uh, who are fighting against the idea of, uh, of witnesses. And now we await to see uh, the outcome of this uh, impromptu uh, conference or a series of conversations and whether they will in fact move as expected to the vote on whether to allow witnesses. Carol. And uh, to, to Chuck's point that the Democrats have a few tools um, in their toolbox left, uh, the, I just want to point out that the organizing rules for this particular impeachment trial say that following the disposition of the question whether, uh, whether to have a debate um, and a vote on subpoenas and witnesses, uh, which is still pending now, other motions provided under the impeachment rules shall be in order. So the Democrats can, uh, you know, and there's, there's no constraint That's on... It's pretty open-ended. Yeah, yeah. On, on what type of motions the Democrats could raise. Procedural, substantive, uh, they could do... They uh, could force all sorts of, of roll call votes. And that's right. one of those things that, you know, the, the, it's what gives you power as an individual senator. It's what gives you power sometimes as the Senate minority is you can... You can do things you can like tap this. The brakes. You can. You can slow things down. You may not get what you want. If you're in the minority in the House of Representatives, you're essentially an elected pundit. In the United States Senate, if you're in the minority, you actually you actually can um, participate certainly in the in the process a lot more uh, and, and a lot more favorably. Yeah. And the uh, chamber seems to be. I don't want to say emptying out, but fewer people. Are, all the House managers have left uh, left their seats there. Pretty burned out on milk and water there. <laughs> Lester, I yeah. think the opportunity to... Uh, and you know. uh, Mitch McConnell has pretty much remained in that position there at the bottom of the screen. I can't tell who he's, he's speaking to right now uh, or where these discussions are going on. They may, in fact, be happening outside. And one of the cloakrooms or outside the Senate chambers. Well, the fact that McConnell is there and not huddling with Schumer says that the, it's, they are still waiting for a... A ca whatever counter or response that they Jay, that the, from Jay, the Democrats. Jay Sekulow, the president's attorney, now joining that conversation, as it appears to. In this case, he says, without the electronics, and you know, all of us have plenty of sources who usually are very electronic friendly. A little more difficult under yeah. the uh, circumstances of the rules of this trial. Casey Hunt, you learning anything? Yeah, well, I just wanted to jump in on the conversation that we can see. Um, I am, as Chuck noted, texting sources who are not currently on their cell phones. So it's a bit of a challenge. But this circle that you see here, I think, helps explain a little bit of what we understand is going on behind the scenes. And that's to say, that's Ted Cruz right there. And that's the White House defense team. You also have John Barrasso and Marco Rubio in there. The dynamic, as we understand it, uh, is that the White House was, and you know, this shouldn't surprise any of us, uh, not happy about the idea of this acquittal vote stretching out to Wednesday after the Super Bowl, after the State of the Union, uh, even though all signs here on the Hill pointed to McConnell being relatively fine with that. So there is some tension inside the Republican conference between even potentially McConnell, who as you can see is having his own conversation at the front of your screen, uh, and the White House defenders inside the Senate Republican conference uh, who have been, uh, I don't want to say spearheaded by Ted Cruz because there's a number of them and it's kind of a loose group, but Ted Cruz has certainly been uh, one of the ones out front uh, being willing to uh, toe the White House line on everything that they want here. So uh, it, it seems to us from this vantage point right now, we're trying to figure out, uh, bridge this gap between the White House and frankly, it seems possibly everybody in the Congress uh, with the exception uh, of this group that's, that's backing uh, the White House uh, up on this. Look, the, the group that, the, the person that has the least amount of leverage here is the president in the White House. They're getting their acquittal. And I think my guess is that there's some, some attitudes in that Republican conference are like, uh, what more do you want? And you want this timing, too. It's sort of, as a parent, you may think, when, you know, sometimes you deal with your child and you're like, you know, you don't get everything. Yeah. You know, you're getting a lot here. Sometimes you don't get everything. And I think that uh, particularly those moderates who are not happy with what the president did, I'm sure some of them are bulking at the idea of going, yeah, wait a minute. He's getting, I decided not to vote to get Bolton here, saved him that embarrassment. I'm acquitting him, saved him that embarrassment, and now he wants to jam us on this too? But this is a president who, uh, who's not afraid to pick up the phone. And put, and it's put a reminder, he's on. not going to be chastened by this. 
Yeah. Right. This is, you know, I had Mike Braun, a Republican senator, said he thought that that the president that that what happened here would be instructive to the president in the future. We'll see if uh, that is true. You know, Lamar Alexander and a few others had, had registered their concern about the propriety of, of, of the president's actions, even as they've said they'll vote to uh, uh, not allow witnesses. But do you think that Senate Republicans will will remain the cheerleaders of the president in terms of a, you know, you're exonerated, you're, you're scot-free, you're clean? I think you're going to see the same dance that we've seen for some time. There's a group of senators, Lester, that basically try to duck the press. Casey knows who they are. There are a whole group of them. I think Rob Portman of Ohio, people that we used to hear from all the time, who now, you know, feel as if, if you don't have anything nice to say, or if you want to, don't want to get involved in that debate, or if you tell them what you really think, it, it raises the ire of the president's base. And, and there's about a dozen of them. I think you're going to continue to see more like that, where senators try to not go out of their, almost go out of their way to almost avoid talking about the specifics of this, because you could tell, look, Marco Rubio went to Medium to explain his concern that this is an impeachable offense, but the political climate makes it impossible to do for him right now. I think there's, 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 uh, there's some of that. And uh, we continue in our, uh, our holding pattern to continue to use the aviation uh, um, metaphors as we uh, watch the senators at the bottom of your screen. Keep in mind here we have uh, used a little digital magic and blown up this part of the picture because it's the most interesting to watch, and that's the... Uh, that's the raw picture coming to us. We don't know if TV. after two hours of waiting here, they have to go back to the gate to let you off. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we we're don't not know. quite yes. sure if that's what's going to happen here with the senators. Yeah. Exactly. You circle the airport and end up back at the gate. Uh, the uh, chief justice uh, has taken his seat. It's not clear whether he's really clued in on, on what's happening here. Uh, we've seen some senators in the hallway that don't really seem to uh, have, a, have a sense of what's happening either. Uh, this all uh, happened with a quorum call. Um, and then uh, these series of sidebar meetings, and we're waiting for information. The anticipation, the expectation was that this would move very quickly to a vote on witnesses. Uh, Republicans seemed to, when we woke up this morning, it was clear they had pretty much locked up what they needed to avoid having to call witnesses and, uh, and evidence. And there's the Chief Justice Ooh. now being summoned. Uh, well, it's hard to know what, what the conversation is. I know. He these. moved real quick there for a second, and we thought, ooh. Yes. And then, uh, the dangers of reading body language. Yeah. Uh, Carol, uh, you know, we, you, we put you in the position of you, you try trials, uh, cr criminal trials and civil trials and that sort of thing. Uh, it's, it's remarkable that we're talking in terms of, you know, at, at this, staging the, the time of acquittal, the vote to acquit. Right. That's, that's very strange. And, and yeah. imagine a trial where uh, after... Uh, after arguments by the attorneys, the judge says, all right, jurors, now you all talk amongst yourself and decide how we're going to go forward from here, because that's what we have going, going on here. And, uh, you know, it's a little, um, it's actually a little bit surprising to me that more of this hadn't been worked out ahead of time as to what the procedure was going to be and what the timing is. I mean, there wasn't really a, um, a lot of uh, secret or surprise about what was going to happen today. We knew there was going to be about two to four hours of, of argument and that happened and uh, everyone just seems to not know what to do at this point. Well, they didn't, in fairness, they didn't yeah. know until about about 9.30 last night, I think, when Lamar Alexander made it known that he was going to be a no on witnesses and that that would have done it. And I think... That's true, but this, it, was, one, this was sort of one of two two possibilities true. Right? And, and things were, were coming up. So, true. But people have been busy um, trying to... Uh, lobby and uh, get their arguments together. So. Well, the president, who may or may not be uh, playing some role in whatever discussions are, are taking place right now, uh, or at least looming over those discussions, he's on his way uh, airborne right now on his way to Mar-a-Lago. Let's go to Hallie Jackson at the White House with uh, her reporting there. Hallie? Yeah, work in some sources here, Lester, as you are having this conversation. And and what I am, what I can share here from a source familiar with the thinking tracks in line with what our Hill team is hearing, which is that there is a question now from from the president's allies: Why would we want to wait until Wednesday? And I think that that is a reversal of some of the thinking that you had seen initially from other sort of allies of the president earlier in the day. Of you know, any delay would be okay. I, I am told the president is not particularly 
upset or angry at this point from, from one source. Um, and forgive me as I look at some notes here, but, but the question is, if we're close, why allow this to, to drag out another several days, essentially? Um, the points that Chuck is making about leverage and all of that, I think, still stand. But that seems to be the state of play now. So there is some pushback you are seeing coming from White House allied folks to the way that this potential agreement that Casey and our Hill team have been reporting has been going down. Uh, and there is a sense that if they're here all night and if Democrats want to introduce sort of unlimited amendments and, or do whatever they can do to continue to drag this procedure out, uh, the, the White House would be, I think, at least sources close to the White House would be willing to accept that at this point. I will say this, there, there, there is the question of, and I hate to sound overly sort of politically cynical here, but but leverage, right? And the thing that I keep hearing from sources is, well, you have Democrats, some of them, who want to get to Iowa, who have other things to be doing, and how does that come play a factor? Now, I, I'm not sure if the white, if uh, sources sort of in and around the White House are overestimating the the sway that some of those Democratic candidates might have on this front, but it does seem to be that that is where the holdup is, push up, push back now um, from from people close to the president and his allies, according to one source who's involved in these or close to the conversations about the wait time here. Why wait? Why continue it to go until Wednesday uh, when, if that is the date, when you could wrap this up sooner rather than later, if you will. So Hallie, I think that that helps give I, us some clarity. Can yeah. I be, if you want to be totally politically cynical here, if you take the president's campaign team and what they are hoping for, it's in their interest to find a way to get Bernie Sanders to Iowa. They would like to see Bernie Sanders to Iowa. <laughs> if you, and perhaps there are a bunch of Democratic senators there that would prefer to see Joe Biden have Iowa to himself. So, you know, if, you're gonna, if we're going to go down that road, it's actually a much more complicated road politically than people might realize. And so I think that there's, there's two, way that, two ways that leverage works, Tally. That's sure. I think that's fair. Chuck, I, you're a political animal, and I, I think that's a fair point. I, I will say this. I think that some of this, based on my sense from reporting this out over the last series of hours here, is that um, it, it appeared earlier in the day that the, the president's allies were willing to rather quickly say, okay, sure, let's, let's do this next week if we have to. And now there are some, I think, uh, others getting involved trying to pump the brakes on that and, and, and put in some pushback, if you will. It seems to me like that's my sense of where this is at the moment, um, based on sources that we've been talking to. All right. The uh, members of the Senate here uh, having uh, what appear to be cordial, good-natured conversations and some of the uh, president's legal team there as well. As uh, we wait out whatever these discussions are, clearly something about the schedule and uh, we're following along with it. We're going to uh, uh, return many of you now to your regular programming. We'll come back on the air as soon as the Senate takes up this crucial vote on whether to call witnesses. Remember, that's one stage uh, that certainly precedes the issue of guilt or innocence. So, We'll invite you to stay close. We'll see you shortly. Uh, for now, I'm Lester Holt, NBC News in New York.
Okay, colleagues, if everyone would return to their desk. He needs to gavel back. I ask consent that further proceedings on the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. The Democratic leader and I have had an opportunity to have a discussion, and it leads to the uh, following. We'll now cast a vote on the witness question. And once that vote is complete, I would ask that the Senate stand in recess, subject to call of the chair. Thank you. Without objection. So ordered. The question is, shall it be in order to consider and debate under the impeachment rules any motion to subpoena witnesses or documents? The yeas and nays are required under Senate Resolution 483. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. No. no. Ms. Baldwin. Aye. Aye. Mr. Barrasso. No. No. Mr. Bennett. Aye. Mrs. Blackburn? No. no. Mr. Blumenthal? Mr. Blunt? No. no. This is an NBC News special report. The trial of Donald J. Trump. Here is Lester Holt. We want to take you back to the U.S. Mr. Senate right now. Senators voting on the question uh, of whether to allow Mr. witnesses, Burr. new witnesses, and evidence no. in the impeachment trial of President Trump. Aye. Mrs. Capito? No. Mr. Cardin? Aye. Mr. Carper? Aye. Mr. Casey? Aye. Mr. Cassidy? No. No. Ms. Collins? Aye. Mr. Coons? Aye. Mr. Cornyn? No. Ms. Cortez Masto? Aye. Mr. Cotton? No, Mr. Kramer. No, Mr. Crapo. No, Mr. Cruz. No, Mr. Danes. No, Ms. Duckworth. Aye, Mr. Durbin. Aye, Mr. Inzi. No, Ms. Ernst. Mrs. Feinstein. Aye, Ms. Ernst, no. Mrs. Fisher? No. No. Mr. Gardner? No. No. Mrs. Gillibrand? Aye. Aye. Mr. Graham? No. No. Mr. Grassley? No. Ms. Harris? Aye. Aye. Ms. Hassan? Aye. Aye. Mr. Hawley? No. No. Mr. Heinrich? Aye. Aye. Ms. Hirono? Aye. Mr. Hoven? No, Mrs. Hyde Smith. No. No, Mr. Inhofe. No, Mr. Johnson. No. No, Mr. Jones. Aye. Mr. Kane. Aye. Mr. Kennedy. No. No, Mr. King. Aye. Ms. Klobuchar. Aye. Aye. Mr. Lankford. No. No. Mr. Leahy. Aye. Mr. Lee? No. No. Mrs. Leffler? No. No. Mr. Manchin? Aye. Aye. Mr. Markey? Aye. Aye. Mr. McConnell? No. no. Ms. McSally? No. no. Mr. Menendez? Aye. Aye. Mr. Merkley? Aye. Mr. Moran? No. no. Ms. Murkowski? No. Mr. Murphy? Aye. Aye. Mrs. Murray? Aye. Aye. Mr. Paul? No. no. Mr. Purdue? No. no. Mr. Peters? Aye. Aye. Mr. Portman? No. Mr. Reed? Aye. Aye. Mr. Risch? No. no. Mr. Roberts? No. no. Mr. Romney? Aye. Aye. Ms. Rosen? 
Aye. Mr. Rounds? No. No. Mr. Rubio? No. no. Mr. Sanders? Aye. Mr. Sass? No. Mr. Schatz? Aye. Mr. Schumer? Aye. Mr. Scott of Florida? No. No. Mr. Scott of South Carolina? No. no. Mrs. Shaheen? Aye. Aye. Mr. Shelby? No. no. Ms. Cinema? Aye. Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Ms. Stabenow? Aye. Aye. Mr. Sullivan? No. No. Mr. Tester? Aye. Aye. Mr. Thune? No. no. Mr. Tillis? No. no. Mr. Toomey? No. no. Mr. Udall? Aye. Aye. Mr. Van Hollen? Aye. Mr. Warner? Aye. Aye. Ms. Warren? Aye. Aye. Mr. Whitehouse? Aye. Aye. Mr. Wicker? No. no. Mr. Wyden? Aye. Aye. Mr. Young? No. no. Mr. Blumenthal? Aye. Are there any senators in the chamber wishing to change his or her vote? If not, the yeas are 49. If not, the yeas are 49. The nays are, 50. the nays are 51. The, the motion is agreed to. Is not agreed to. The motion is not agreed to. Under the previous order, the Senate stands in recess subject to the call of the chair. And there you have it, uh, not unexpected, but that bid to allow witness testimony in the impeachment of President Trump has been defeated along the lines that we had uh, anticipated. What we didn't anticipate was a lengthy delay leading up to that vote. Still a little unclear, as you heard, this uh, trial is as adjourned uh, un until the, the, the call of the, uh, of the leader, and we don't know when that is going to happen. Let's go to Casey Hunt, who's at the Capitol. Casey, what more do we know about what happens next? Well, at this late hour, Lester, there has been just an intense back and forth between Democrats and Republicans, but also among the Republican Party itself. You've seen this playing out in real time on the floor. Senate Leader uh, Mitch McConnell uh, speaking with Schumer, and then a group of Republicans talking to the White House's legal team. The big question mark hanging out there tonight, Lester, uh, is where the president stands on all of this. There had been uh, something of an understanding here at the Capitol this this morning uh, that both Republicans and Democrats seemed to be in agreement that they wanted a little bit more time to make closing arguments, to allow senators uh, to make speeches, to, to put something in the record about where they stood on this trial. Uh, there was an agreement, there has been agreement, I think, that people are interested in having the weekend off after two very long weeks, uh, especially uh, those uh, Democratic senators who are running for president and have been stranded here just days before the Iowa caucus. Uh, but as the afternoon wore on, uh, it all seems to uh, have fallen apart. And now here, uh, Leader Schumer is uh, standing uh, right outside. Uh, he is about, we think, to step to the cameras here uh, in the subway, Lester. So maybe we'll learn a little bit more. Yeah, so uh, is, is, there, is there any possibility that they would take, uh, is there anything between now, uh, what they've done now, and voting on, on guilt or innocence? 
So, Lester, that's exactly what they're talking about doing. So, the the, the thing that they're fighting, that they're wrangling over, is the set okay, of rules that will lay it out. And here's Schumer. <clears throat> okay. To not allow a witness, a document, no witnesses, no documents, in an impeachment trial is a perfidy. It's a grand tragedy, one of the worst tragedies that the Senate has ever overcome. America will remember this day, unfortunately, where the Senate did not live up to its responsibilities, where the Senate turned away from truth and went along with a sham trial. This, if the president is acquitted with no witnesses, no documents, the acquittal will have no value because Americans will know that this trial was not a real trial. It had no witnesses, no documents. It is a tragedy on a very large scale. I will be now going up to my caucus to discuss what we're doing next. I will not talk about it here. Okay? Thanks. And Chuck Schumer, minority leader, calling it a grand tragedy, the vote that has uh, blocked any chance of bringing new witnesses and uh, evidence into the uh, trial of, of, of President Trump. And now the question of what happens next, even uh, the minority leader uh, didn't really have an answer for that, Chuck. Look, it means he's got to go back to his conference. And what, he, what that means is they got to figure out how do they want it. Again, it goes back to the <coughs> metaphor we've been using, how do they want to land this plane politically, okay? They... There is, just Casey, as we've been talking about, there is conflicting priorities inside his caucus. There's conflicting priorities inside the Republican conference. So we, we see that playing out. Obviously, there is a proposal that Schumer is dealing with that he's got to go deal with his Democrats on. And if they're not going to accept those terms, they've got to come up with a counter. Um, it looked like they were close. Uh, I... I am surprised the president's allies are, are, if this is indeed what's going on, that they're pushing, you know, saying, no, 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 we, we want everything. It, it, it does seem as this is how it blows it all up, if you're not I careful. Kind of didn't bother me when I first came here. Yeah. <laughs> Their response was, how old were you then? I said, 30, 34. Do you have any idea what happens now, Senator? No. Yeah, I think a lot of folks are walking out, shaking their heads, just in terms of really not knowing what happens now. Uh, could this could this trial come to an end tonight? I guess anything is possible at this point. It is, but again, as Carol has been going back through the rules itself, if they're going to try to move to this verdict tonight, let's say, which member Bar John Barrasso had sort of intimated to us a couple of days ago, uh, Democrats could really gum it up, and I and I and I don't know if that's the if that's the uncomfortable way Republicans want to end. Again, I think they're uncomfortable about dark of night. Democrats could make this go dark of night. Imagine that. No witnesses, no evidence, middle of the night acquittal, right? That, that is something that the Democrats could force if that becomes this. They can't sort of come to a, an agreement that my guess is Democrats are not interested in giving the president State of the Union, yeah. uh, his State of the Union victory party. Casey, what do you learn? Well, Lester, I just want to underscore the number of times and, and kind of draw some parallels to, to you just saw Leahy come to the mic and say that he has no idea what's going on. When are the other times in the Trump administration when something like this has happened, when we here on the Hill have been facing a big moment, we think we know it, how it's going to unfold, and then suddenly it changes at the last minute? It's always because the president has done something suddenly behind the scenes that has thrown his Republican allies for a loop. And we're still reporting all of this out, but my, my big question uh, is whether that is what is going on here. Uh, this is, I believe, Senator Carper, if uh, you want to listen in. Uh, as the truth comes out in the days ahead, and it will, uh, they will lose the war. And uh, in doing so, the American people will win because we'll have the truth. And we're going to act on the truth. Do you expect the, your Republican colleagues to try to force through an acquittal vote tonight? I don't. I don't. I do not. How do you see this playing out? Uh, I see this uh, playing out in the next uh, couple of weeks. Additional information, additional people step forward with uh, in, uh, with knowledge of what, what actually went down mm -hmm. and uh, paint a clearer picture, fuller picture. And I think at the end of the day, uh, and it, probably, it, it may well come before Bolton's book is actually published. Would, would you, cons would you uh, encourage your Democratic colleagues in the House now to pursue John Bolton through subpoenas or other means, since it won't happen we're in gonna, the Senate? We're going to have a caucus right now, and let me think about that. I don't know. Okay, thank, thank you all.
All right, uh, Senator Thomas Carper, Democrat, uh, stopping uh, to, to speak to reporters. And a lot of confusion. Uh, Hallie Jackson, uh, the president, uh, is still airborne. What do we know uh, uh, about what role he may have played in what we just saw? Uh, my sense, Lester, uh, pardon me, I'm looking at my notes uh, on my phone here. As you can imagine, that the, the texts and the phone calls and the emails are flying fast and furious at this moment. Um, the sense, Lester, is that, yes, there is pushback now that has emerged in these sort of later hours in the day that didn't exist earlier in the day to the idea that they, the White House allies and, and people close to the president would be okay with letting this go until Wednesday. That seems to have, based on my read, uh, essentially trickled up to, to certain officials here who, who are essentially arguing, why wait? Why wait when this witness vote has gone down now, as they have ex had expected it to, once Senator Alexander in particular came out and said that he was going to vote no on witnesses? That is the moment they had been looking for and what they waited for. Now, to Chuck's point, and I heard him say er, just a moment ago in this special report, you know, why, blow, why take the risk of blowing it up, essentially? Um, I am still working on reporting out whether or not this is a red line, in fact, for this White House and for the president, right? Or if this is just, we got to put up a fight. We got to see where we go with this. We got to at least make the effort that this doesn't drag out until next week. And we have to push that. Uh, but ultimately, sort of deferring to Senator McConnell in the way that this is going to be palatable for everybody in the Senate to get this done. Uh, but there, there obviously is more of a resistance now to this uh, and an eagerness, listen, to get this wrapped up. The, the witness vote has happened. The sense seems to be we don't need to wait any longer. Make you know if the senators need to work through the weekend, then they need to work through the weekend. And and I'm paraphrasing here, but the sense is kind of why should we allow Democrats to get to Iowa if they need to go to Iowa to do campaigning rather than push back a little bit on what is going down here? So that seems to be sort of the view from sources close to the president from from uh, that I've been talking to this afternoon. One source close and familiar to the process. Um, but listen, this is one of those moments you you are watching. I think live the reporting process unfold as this is all happening. I think it's notable the. And senators are coming to the camera saying, you know, we don't know where this is going either. Right. Uh, and they're the ones who are the principals involved in this in this whole discussion. Yeah. And, uh, and Hallie, if this thing this if, if this thing goes to Wednesday, as one of the suggestions have been, who knows what more is going to come out? As, as you noted earlier, uh, there was more from the John Bolton book, purportedly from the John Bolton book yes. that came out this morning that kind of began our day. That's right, Lester. And we saw something similar happen on Sunday, right? And one of the things with, with uh, the, the initial revelations from that soon-to-be-published or yet-unpublished uh, book from the former national security advisor, John Bolton, saying that the president, and most recently today, held a meeting in early May in which he directed John Bolton to work with his personal attorney in order to put pressure on Ukraine to investigate his political rivals, including the Biden. So what I have heard all week long from sources on this end, close to the president and close to the legal team, has been sort of the caveat we don't know what other news of day might come out, right? And that's what you've heard from allies. They know and they understand that at any day, at any moment, you could see some of these things unfold as it did this morning, which I think is also part of the incentive for wanting to get this wrapped up. Now, the witness vote is done, right? And that was that was the key thing that everybody had been looking to. So it, it sort of remains to be seen that if there were more wild cards, that might hurt politically more than procedurally, if you will, given that you now have Senator Alexander, Senator Murkowski, and others who are on the record voting no on witnesses. You can't stick that toothpaste back in the tube. Uh, but that is absolutely something that is still hanging over all this, because I'll tell you what, J John Bolton himself talked a little bit in Texas last night about this. We don't know what other leaks may come out from his manuscript that could potentially be damaging or at least perceived as damaging. He has not commented yet so far today, although the president and his personal attorney have both said that the meeting that is described in this reporting by The New York Times on the book did not happen and is not true. Uh, and so that is another piece of the dynamic moving forward. You know, I, it's interesting, Ali. It, it is amazing to me, and it just shows you sort of the backwards nature of the Republican Party these days, that the president, who right now has less leverage than he should, have, should ever have any, any, at any moment in time. I mean, at any moment in time, he can get kicked out of office. Actually, we're in the midst of, of a right moment. Now, he's a As defendant. of right now, he's a defendant, and, and 20 votes could go, you know, 20 more votes jump over to the other side. My point being, it's amazing that he's trying to dictate the terms of how this ends when currently he doesn't technically have leverage, but of course he feels he's got political leverage. But I have to say, it's sort of testing the limits of even how you define leverage. I mean, you have the new allegation this afternoon which directly implicates the president's lead counsel 
of which you could have senators feel offended as if the president's lead counsel was misleading them about sort of withholding evidence. So it just is sort of strikes me as odd that, the, of all things, the White House won here. And it's like winning isn't enough. They have to have their orchestrated uh, plan here. And I just think it, they risk this, they risk sort of having this get uglier when they can't seem to take yes for an answer. Chuck, let, let's look, look back. A, a, lot of, a lot of Democrats had put their faith in, in the Mueller report. And right. It didn't turn out quite the way ne they necessarily like. Now this apparently is on its route to failure. Have Democrats used their last arrow against this president? I think it, that before November, I think so. I mean, I think at this point, they're, if, 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 the goal, if their goal is to, to hold him accountable, keep him out of office, um, at this point, the election, I mean, that, that's essentially what the United States Senate is telling them, that they're not going to do this. So you, you, you need to do this uh, in the campaign trail. So, you know, I, I don't know. I think the House should try to get it, you know, for the purposes of trying to re-strengthen the legislative branch. They may attempt to try to do more oversight, follow through with those lawsuits that they're waiting for the federal courts to decide, you know, does the president have to turn over his tax returns or does the president or Don McGahn, his former White House counsel, have to testify? I think you'll see them continuing to push those process attempts at trying to finish their oversight here. But um, I do think the voters in general, the electorate in general, particularly the middle of this electorate, is exhausted from impeachment and would prefer to just make this about the campaign. All right, let's go to Casey Hunt right now on uh, at the Capitol right now. We, we saw some bewildered senators not clear what to do. Have uh, They're subject to the call of the chair. Does that mean they have to hang loose there and be ready to come back in a moment's notice? Basically, yes, uh, Lester. I mean, typically that is uh, code for, you know, you're free to go about your business and head home for the evening, uh, but not in this kind of a circumstance. I mean, we did see senators scatter from the floor. They're no longer uh, bound to be there on pain of imprisonment, quote unquote. Uh, Senator Sherrod Brown uh, walked past us and uh, echoed what we've heard from many other senators that, you know, people just simply don't know how this ends. So Mitch McConnell, uh, the leader, just put out a statement. Uh, it's most mostly focused on that witness vote, uh, which of course was the major turning point in this trial that we've been focused on for so long, and they did definitively shut the book on any additional witnesses uh, in this vote. And so he uh, says, uh, you know, his statement is framing this in the context of the Clinton trial. This is a situation where uh, you can, to a certain extent, frame the precedent, depending on which side you sit, um, either way. Uh, but I think the note, uh, as far as what happens next, it simply says, senators will now confer among ourselves with the House managers and with the President's counsel to determine next steps as we prepare to conclude the trial in the coming days. So uh, he uses days, plural. We'll have to see. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we uh, we all circled that. Yeah. As we got a copy Plural of that statement. Was something here. else there, Casey? Basically, yeah. wondering if we'll be here all night or uh, in the days to come. But uh, yeah, there sounds like a lot of uh, a lot of conversations. And uh, Casey had pointed out sometimes when they see this kind of abrupt change, it usually means the president's fingerprints or phone calls are on it. And it's obvious that whatever agreement Schumer and McConnell seem to have loosely come to this morning, somebody blew it up and it's clearly it happened on the Republican side. Hallie Jackson, what are you hearing at the White House? I want to just emphasize, the we've been using this word a lot today, but I got to just bring us back to it, which is the fluidity of this process, right? Because you're right, and that this has changed, and there have been a lot of caveats that we've been putting in our reporting for this reason, from what, when we went up on the air here for this special report just before one o'clock this afternoon to now, and it may change again. Um, and I just want to be very transparent for viewers here that this is actually unfolding as we speak here. There were indications from our team's reporting earlier in the day that the, the administration may have been open, or at least some uh, people in the administration may have been open to this kind of a deal. There are indications now that that is not the case, that there is some pushback that is being felt. The conversations are still happening literally as we speak while the president uh, is on, by the way, Air Force One, still on Air Force One, heading down to, to Palm Beach for his weekend at his Mar-a-Lago resort, Lester. So th this is changing literally uh, by the minute, and we're trying to stay on top of all of it. Any opportunity to hear from him prior to his uh, Super well, Bowl interview? When he gets off the plane, he has another opportunity, if he wants to, to stop and try to talk. We haven't seen him do that lately, though. 
And I haven't checked my phone. Has he tweeted in the last few minutes? I just did the, I did, yeah, I just did the check. Yeah, I don't see anything. Not that my Twitter alerts have gone off for Lester. So. <laughs> All right. So let's let's catch folks up where we are. Uh, that vote has finally, after a period of uh, what appeared to be negotiations or conversations, that vote was taken on the issue of whether to allow new witnesses in this trial. And it was defeated. You see the numbers on your screen. It went down 51-49. There were two Republicans that sided with Democrats, but again, it failed. We are uh, going to uh, leave the air here shortly. This is a consequential vote uh, still ahead for the Senate, the final vote on whether or not to acquit the president. And the question, will that vote come before or after the president's State of the Union speech to Congress Tuesday night? A lot of moving parts here, a lot of discussions taking place. We're watching it all. We'll be here for all of it. And I will see you shortly on NBC Nightly News. For all of us here at NBC News, I'm Lester Holt in New York. Good evening. I'm Allison Morris. You're watching NBC News Now. Special coverage of President Trump's impeachment trial. Senators just voted not to call witnesses in this trial. Let's get straight out to Leanne Caldwell. She is on Capitol Hill. And wow, Leanne, it has been a crazy uh, couple of hours. Let's just start with the witness vote that just happened. Walk us through what happened there. Sure. Well, Allison, the witness vote finally happened, um, and it happened as we expected, as we heard uh, these from these final remaining senators on how they were going to vote. Of course, it failed on a vote of 51 to 49. They voted not to move on toward to have witnesses and more documents in this trial. Uh, the two Republicans who voted with all Democrats, as expected, were Senator Collins and, um, and uh, Senator Romney. They've been saying all along that they would want witnesses. But late last night, we heard from the two other ones who might support witnesses saying that they weren't, Senator Alexander. And then today, Senator Murkowski really was the one to put the nail in the head, saying that she was not going to support witnesses. So we didn't have a tie. We didn't have to deal with that. Uh, there was a clear vote that the Senate, led by Republicans, the Republicans in the Senate anyway, did not want to prolong this trial, did not want to hear from John Bolton, did not want more documents, and instead they wanted to end this, Allison. Leanne, the unusual thing Thing really happened before that witness vote. We sort of saw, I don't know if you want to call it a recess, but the uh, trial took a break. The senators all stayed on the floor. They were talking and discussing. That went on for some time. Explain to our viewers, if you will, what was going on there, because we're all sort of scratching our heads wondering what was happening. Yeah, so what they're trying to figure out is what happens next. Uh, the vote on witnesses is not the end. The, they still have to vote to acquit this president. So now what they're discussing is how they're going to get to that vote. Um, and a lot has changed in the past four and five hours, Allison, and we don't know where it's going to end up. So I'll walk you through it a little bit. So, you know, late late this morning, we heard that, um, the, that Senator McConnell and Senator Schumer, the two leaders, um, they presented to their own caucuses uh, that they would be uh, no session this weekend, that they would come back Monday and Tuesday, have closing arguments, senators would have time to speak, and then there would be a vote on acquittal on to be relatively signed off on that. The White House, uh, some in the White House anyway, um, you know, the Republican and Democratic leadership. But it seems to have all fallen apart at this point, Allison. Uh, there's uh, now a lot of negotiation among Republicans um, on how to move forward because there's a group of Republicans who are wondering, why were we going to wait till Wednesday to have this vote to acquit? That is after the State of the Union. Why wouldn't we want to do this before? Why would we give more time between now and then? And so they are pushing back and they're not in agreement yet. And it seems like they have the support of the White House to keep pushing on this. And so it's completely unknown how this ends up. Um, they're working on it right now. And uh, that's why they're in this kind of recess trying to figure it all out, Allison. All right, Leanne, I want to talk to you a little bit more about what is going on uh, with the senators, what they're trying to figure out. But first, I would love to play Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, he gave a very brief statement after the witness vote, uh, uh, talking about that and then also alluding to where he was heading off to. Let's play that. To not allow a witness, a document, no witnesses, no documents in an impeachment trial is a perfidy. It's a grand tragedy 
one of the worst tragedies that the Senate has ever overcome. America will remember this day, unfortunately, where the Senate did not live up to its responsibilities, where the Senate turned away from truth and went along with a sham trial. This, if the president is acquitted with no witnesses, no documents, the acquittal will have no value because Americans will know that this trial was not a real trial. It had no witnesses, no documents. It is a tragedy on a very large scale. All right, the words uh, Schumer saying there that we cut him, Leanne, he was saying he was going to go back to his caucus. They were going to figure out what's next, and he was not going to discuss that at all with the press at this time. But Schumer saying a grand tragedy. The Senate did not live up to its responsibilities and turned away from the truth. Certainly no question about how uh, the Democratic leader in the Senate feels tonight. No, and that's the point that Democrats have been making all along, that, that this wasn't even a trial because there were no witnesses. They point to past precedent where the previous two impeachment trials of presidents had witnesses. Other impeachment trials that included for cabinet members and uh, judges also had witnesses as well. Um, and so they're saying that this is uh, a process that was not played out. And they think that they have public opinion on their side. There's been a slew of polls recently, Allison, that say that a big majority of people want to see witnesses. They want to see um, John Bolton come testify, perhaps Mick Mulvaney. Some of those people in those polls also want to see people like Hunter Biden come testify as well. And so Democrats are for sure going to keep hounding this issue because they think that Republican, that the public anyway, are going to blame Republicans for trying to cut this off and distract and what Democrats say uh, engage in a cover up of the president's actions. Allison. Leanne, how much do we know about what's going on in terms of the debate and where the pushback is coming from? Uh, We've heard some reporting that perhaps the White House is saying absolutely no way uh, this needs to get done sooner. Uh, we've heard also that within the Republican Party, perhaps there is still this notion that they might try to lock this down and have the acquittal vote tonight. Uh, though some of the senators coming out uh, kind of indicating that that looked like it wouldn't be possible. But what do we know about where the pushback is coming from here and maybe what the you know competing arguments are? There's a lot of proposals right now, and the pushback is really coming from a core group of the president's allies. Um, they're the ones who are saying, who are who are furious that that McConnell and others would agree to hold a vote on Wednesday, five days away. And so they are saying, why the Democrat? They think that the Democrats have no leverage here. Um, but a lot of people are also saying, look, the president and the Republicans won. Um, the president is going to get acquitted. It doesn't matter if it's going to be tonight or tomorrow or the day after the State of the Union. He has won this vote, and so let's let it play out. It's interesting because this morning, um, when when they had had these proposals that they were presenting to their members, it, it kind of seems so civilized. We were wondering, like, why push this till Wednesday? But it kind of seemed like it was something that was going to happen pretty easily. It was smooth. There was going to be agreement things were going to happen, and then it just all blew up. And, uh, the <laughs> too good to be true, right, Leanne? Exactly. I mean, you can ne you, yeah, never talk too soon. So <laughs> it, seems like, it seems like the president, um, got someone got in his ear and said, what is happening? And the people in the White House are trying yeah. to make one last stand to try to get this done and this acquittal done sooner than later, Allison. Leanne Caldwell, thank you so much. I know you've been running around today, and we had to run to get you in front of a camera really quickly. Thank yep. you so much. I don't know how long this is going to go on, but I trust that when we do have some answers, you'll be back with us. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'll be here. <laughs> Thanks. All right, let's turn over to the legal experts for their take on the witness debate. We have NBC News legal analyst Glenn Kirshner. And Glenn, you have been here with me throughout uh, this, this whole witness vote tonight and this whole process. So I know we usually talk to you just from the legal perspective, but I kind of want to talk to you about everything uh, you've been witnessing for starts the witness vote tonight. No real surprises there, huh? You know, no surprises, but I don't think it's hyperbole to say we have all just seen what will go down as a dark day in American history. Fifty-one United States senators just voted to cover up the crimes of an American president, period. That's what we just witnessed. In a thousand courtrooms across the country today, Leanne, I can promise you, judges instruct juries that 
The statements of counsel, the opening statements of the attorneys are not evidence. The evidence comes from the mouths of the witnesses and from the documents that are admitted at trial. All we have seen in this impeachment trial, it's not a trial, it's a hearing, it's a proceeding, it's a matter, it's not a trial. All we've seen are opening statements. We've seen no evidence and opening statements are typically not evidence. So this really is, I agree with Chuck Schumer, a tragedy. So, Glenn, let me ask you this then. That vote is is done. It is in the history books. We will not see witnesses in this trial. So why would it be to the benefit or why would the Democrats be arguing that they want this to continue and that there is more to do before the vote to acquit or to remove? I, I think right now they're running on the sheer adrenaline produced by the injustice of it all. <laughs> I don't know what they can accomplish. I will say, Leanne, taking a step back, I have a feeling that come November 2020, the Dems will probably have more to gain from an unfair trial that resulted in an acquittal than a full fair trial with witnesses resulting in an acquittal. So I, I think this may end up being a real miscalculation by the Republicans. Let me ask you this on the flip side then. I mean, it sounds like uh, from what we're hearing and from the reporting uh, of uh, all of our uh, wonderful folks there on the ground, that it seems like the White House is really pushing back, wanting to get this done tonight. If the president knows or the president believes he is going to be acquitted, what's the difference if it happens on Friday night, if it happens on Monday morning, if it happens on Wednesday? I understand that they really would like this to be done before the State of the Union, but is Friday versus Monday, I mean... With him, it probably has to do with uh, what TV appearances he has coming up so he can tout his great success. But let, let's be clear. This is not, if they vote to acquit, this is not an exoneration. This is a cover-up. And how he was, how he's going to crow about the success of his cover-up uh, is really anybody's guess. I, I want to ask you about something uh, that Marco uh, Rubio said today because it's something that really struck me. Several uh, senators said that they were either not going to vote for witnesses, that they were going to vote to acquit, but. There were caveats to the things that they said. And here is the statement from Senator Marco Rubio today. He said, this is why six weeks ago I announced that for me, the question would not just be whether the president's actions were wrong, but ultimately whether what he did was removable. The two are not the same. Just because actions meet a standard of impeachment does not mean it is in the best interest of the country to remove a president from office. Now, I am not a lawyer, but to me, it sounds like there he is saying that and I'm going to repeat this, just because actions meet a standard of impeachment does not mean it is in the best interest of the country to remove a president from office. Is he essentially saying there that the president engaged in impeachable conduct, but he shouldn't be removed for it? It is an oxymoron. I'll go okay. one step further. It's okay. oxymoronic okay. Is, what, is what it is. Because he said, yes, the president committed impeachable offenses, but he ought not be impeached. That's ba that makes that is confusing no sense. To me. Okay. And, and think, yeah, that, that's lawyer speak. And this is why people don't really care for lawyers. Uh, present company accepted. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, it, it, it just seems like if withholding congressional funds with the GAO saying, Mr. President, you broke the law by doing it, by extorting a foreign country and the president of a foreign country to help interfere with an election is not impeachable. And if completely obstructing Congress, signaling the death of congressional oversight of the executive branch is not removable, well, then nothing's removable. And now we've taken one giant leap on the road to being uh, an autocracy. Let me ask you this then, uh, another question that just, I think a lot of people are confused by this. Rudy Giuliani weighing in today. That's the president's personal attorney for people who are not familiar with that by now. I think most people know that. He tweeted today, new allegations from John Bolton's unpublished book are a lie. Isn't the solution here, if we are arguing over a he said, he said, with the president saying, I did not order John Bolton to order uh, or to arrange a meeting between Giuliani and Ukrainian president. If I did, if he's saying he did not do that and Bolton is saying that he did, wouldn't the only way to find out if Bolton is telling the truth or not is to put him under oath and ask him that as a witness in this trial? That's why trials have witnesses testify okay. and documents produced. And let's face it, I think this result, assuming the next step is an acquittal, I think this result guarantees another round of impeachment inquiries in the House where you can get the Boltons to testify and the Lev Parnezes to testify and provide what we all know is sharply incriminating information about this president. 
I hate to ask because I don't think anybody knows, but do you have any sense? I mean, it sounds to me like this is an argument that is not going to be easily resolved. As Leanne was saying, uh, they were talking earlier today. It sounded like McConnell and Schumer had reached a deal. It sounded like everyone's been using this expression. They had worked out a way to land the plane politically. And now it seems like we don't even know where the plane is what city the plane is landing in and if people have their seatbelts and their oxygen masks on. Yeah, or if the plane is just going to run out of fuel midair and crash. I mean, not to make light of what we just saw, but it was like the worst, highest stakes episode of Survivor ever, and we've just seen democracy voted out of our country. Glenn? It has been quite an evening. Uplifting. Uh, yeah, you're, aren't you feeling pretty good about today? I mean, we've got uh, basically nothing resolved, and we're not sure where we're going, but I have a feeling uh, we may get some more updates uh, throughout the evening, and I know you'll be here, of course, to help us figure this all out. Uh, we are going to go on to talk to the strategists about this. Jenna Ellis is a senior legal advisor to the Trump campaign. She's also a member of the president's defense team. She is joining me now from Washington, D.C., and former chief of staff to the DCCCNA, former director of strategic communications for Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign. Adrian Elrod. Ladies, thrilled to have both of you here with me. Jenna, I'm going to start with you. Uh, we are hearing tonight that uh, we do not know when this is going to end, that we're not sure when an acquittal vote may come, but that the White House seems to be pushing back on dragging this on any further. Why, uh, if the president thinks he is going to be acquitted, why does it matter when? Uh, well, why does it matter when uh, the, the Senate should simply hold a vote uh, and should end this? Uh, and we know that it will be in an acquittal. But I want to push back on something that Glenn, I think it was your former guest, uh, that just said about this being, you know, the darkest day and all of this partisan rhetoric, which is absolutely irresponsible uh, for him to be talking like that, because it's absolutely constitutional that the uh, Senate has sole power to try all impeachments. They determined in their sole power not to call additional witnesses. And it is absolutely a lie of Chuck Schumer to say that there were no witnesses or no documents. The House per, the House Democrats heard from 17 witnesses in public, actually 18, and 192 clips of testimony from 13 witnesses were heard in the Senate, as well as receiving by the Senate over 28,000 documents and pieces of evidence. So to say that there was no evidence or testimony in this is absolutely ridiculous. What is not happening uh, is calling any new testimony or new witnesses, which has never happened in the history of a presidential impeachment. And so any of uh, the analogies to former impeachments are simply false. This is partisan rhetoric, and this is something that those 51 senators who actually had the backbone to stand up for the United States Constitution, I give them props because they did the right thing. This should be the Constitution and the country over partisan politics. All right, Adrian, I imagine you have a different take on this. Let me ask you this. Why then, on the flip side, why would uh, the Democratic senators, why would the Democrats want to keep this going any longer? Well, because there are still some many, many unanswered questions, Allison, and I think that that's what they're trying to determine. I mean, everything happened so hastily. This was such a, a fast trial, a sham trial, and I want to push back on something that Jenna said. One of the reasons why Democrats were pushing for witnesses to come forward is not only because that's part of a trial process. But because we've learned of so much more new evidence that's come out, especially today's New York Times story, that showed that John Bolton was aware that Trump wanted to pressure Ukraine even earlier than we initially thought. So the fact that we have all of this new information, that witnesses were still not called, that we only had two Republican votes um, in, in favor of calling witnesses, this is such a sham trial, such a sharp sham process. And Glenn Kirshner is actually right. This is one of not just a dark day in American democracy, but one of the darkest days that we've ever witnessed in American democracy. <clears throat> Glenn getting a whole lot of attention here, and he's not even on camera anymore. My goodness. Adrian, let me push back on this, though, and just ask you. Uh, we have heard a lot of new information. Of course, the new Bolton news uh, that the New York Times reported today. But it has not changed anything. Uh, if this were to go on for a couple more days and we still got more information, I mean, do you think it will actually push the needle? We have not seen uh, either party move in either direction. You know, Allison, I don't know, but I think it's up to senators to at least make an effort and try. I mean, this is literally an impeachment of the president of the United States. So we should give it the time that it deserves. I don't know if anything's going to change. I think what Chuck Schumer and other Senate Democratic leaders right now are doing is trying to figure out what other recourses do they have? What other steps can they take to try to get more information into this? Um, but yes, this was a big, big loss for Democrats or for rather democracy tonight that witnesses were not allowed to be called.
Uh, Jenna, let me ask you this. Sources have been reporting, people have been reporting that uh, the president does not want this to drag on beyond the State of the Union. Is the State of the Union a factor in why the president would like this wrapped up sooner rather than later? Well, I'm not going to get ahead of the White House on that, and that's, of course, up to the Senate. They have sole uh, power to trial impeachments. That includes when they call for the vote on the ultimate question uh, here of acquittal. And so they'll do that in the time that they prefer. But pushing back as well on uh, the Bolton issue, this is not new evidence. This is not anything new. Uh, this is something that is a presumption and a leak through the New York Times that has zero credibility. What we do have uh, is, is the video of John Bolton saying that this was a, a co collegial phone call. It was something that was congratulatory. There is nothing here that the Senate uh, needs to contemplate beyond the four uncontested facts here, which is that Ukraine got the aid within the year it was appropriated for. Uh, the alleged victim here, uh, Ukraine president, and Ukraine has al always said that they felt no pressure. They got the meetings that they wanted and that without uh, any announcement of any investigation. That goes to the ultimate question. So all the Democrats have been trying to do here is to continue this sham circus just to continue their partisan in political campaign for 2020. And so, again, it's highly appropriate and it's in keeping with constitutional precedent of the past impeachment trials to not call any new testimony or new witnesses. And again, this isn't any new evidence. It's simply a new presumption and it's a new strategy of the Democrats that thankfully failed tonight because the Constitution was upheld. Well, then l let me ask you about this then. Uh, the new Bolton information in particular that we're talking about this evening is not about the July 25th phone call. It's about a meeting in May in which John Bolton alleges that uh, the the president directed him to arrange a meeting between Rudy Giuliani and the Ukrainian president. If there is any question about who is telling the truth here, whether it's the president, whether it's John Bolton or anyone else involved, wouldn't the way to solve that to be to put them under oath, to put them before the Senate and ask them in that setting? It's still a presumption. And again, those four uncontested facts remain. And so all you're not answering my question would the way to solve not... that to be to ask these people those questions question. under oath. I am answering that question that the two people on the phone call, which is the substance of the issue here, absolutely not. We don't We're not need to talking call about the phone call, John though, Bolton. in this situation. No, yes, we actually are, though, because that's the substance of what goes to the articles of impeachment. And so as the president's legal team in his brief said, the articles can't allege multiple instances and just say, oh, hey, Senate, try um, on anything that you want on any instance. Let's find abuse of power somewhere. And because now we know we don't get it through the July 25th phone call, let's now pivot and try to make it about a main meeting. Let's try to make it about something else that's not even alleged here. That's absolutely uh, their own abuse of power and their own abuse of impeachment authority that has absolutely no place in a legal proceeding, even though this is only quasi-judicial. This is purely partisan on the Democrats and has absolutely no relevance here. All right, Adrian, I'm going to ask you the question then, because it's a yes or no question, and I think we can answer it uh, with a yes or no answer and then perhaps back it up. Is the way to get the, the truth about these allegations, if they are he said, he said, is to put the people involved under oath and to ask them those questions in a court of law or it, it, on the Senate floor? Yes, of course, the Allison, Senate is that's why. Law. On the okay, Senate can floor, I, can I answer then, ma'am. This is, this, is, this is my question. Yes. Absolutely, Allison, that is absolutely the case. And that's why I'm surprised that, frankly, you didn't see more Republicans come forward on this because, you know, you've got Cory Gardner, you've got Martha McSally, m members of the Senate who are in very tough re-election, so this is ultimately, ultimately going to come back to bite them. But the point that Jenna is missing here is that even if this information was not part of the House proceedings, this is new information that is relevant to the actual substance of the trial. So it should, witnesses should be able to come forward to talk about this. And this is something that John Bolton's writing in his book. His words are, are on paper. The New York Times, which by the way, is not a sham publication. The New York Times is one of the most credible journalistic entities that we have in this country. Maggie, Maggie Haberman, who broke the story, is one of the most uh, integral journalist to the process. This is something that John Bolton wrote, and it should absolutely be part of the Senate trial, and it should be something that senators hear from. They should hear from John Bolton, and they should hear from Mick Mulvaney and perhaps others, but they should at least have the chance to hear from these witnesses. And what we saw it play out today was highly disappointing. Jenna, do you want to respond to that? Back. Yeah, real quick. Sure, um, no, so take if, 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 uh, if, the, if the senators wanted to hear from those witnesses, then the House should have called them and not pushed through a ridiculous sham investigation and should have actually subpoenaed Bolton, should have actually done, gone through the legal process and the judicial parameters, allowed the president to exercise his rights and privileges under the United States Constitution and done this all in the House inquiry phase, like we've seen in past presidential impeachment uh, precedent.
This is not for the Senate to cure the record and to say, oh, because now there's new evidence simply because the House didn't call for it. That's absolutely not a valid argument, and it is not for them to cure the record of the House. This isn't new. This is simply um, a lack of inquiry on the House and a sham forced process because the Democrats had a deadline of Christmas and they have a deadline of the 2020 election. Let, let me ask you this then, Jenna. Let's just say put the information that we got uh, today aside uh, that you feel is not new. If we were to have new information, let's just say we did have new information today, why would it be a problem to have witnesses in the Senate if that is potentially part of the process of a Senate trial? Well, that's that goes back to the fact that the House rushed their investigation. They didn't allow for the full process. No, but they I'm asking about right now. There is the possibility to have witnesses called in a Senate trial. Why do you feel that we should let's not talk about the House anymore? That's over. There can but be that's, witnesses but that's in the Senate relevant. trial. There can be, but they have to be the witnesses and the evidence that were part of the House record. We don't have any precedent whatsoever that the Senate calls new witnesses or anything beyond the scope of the investigation. That's precedent, and that's absolutely appropriate here. And so while the Senate could, for anyone to say that just because uh, these 51 senators voted against uh, witnesses that were not called in the House inquiry phase, to say that for some reason this is a cover-up is absolutely ridiculous and just doesn't conform with past uh, precedent. And there's no need or value here because, again, the uncontested facts we have on the record and we have the two individuals that were actually on the phone call have stated very clearly on the record that there was no pressure and the ultimate question of fact can be resolved without any other further inquiry from the Senate to resolve the House uh, inquiries problems. So if that's what you're saying, then would then you also argue that any witnesses that the Republicans might have wanted to see a Hunter Biden, for example, the whistleblower, that those then would also be invalid? because they weren't part of the House inquiry? I didn't say they wouldn't be invalid or that they wouldn't be relevant, but I don't think I think it was a wise vote that uh, the Senate decided to call no new witnesses. What should have happened is that Republicans should have been able to call those witnesses that they wanted to and were shut out of in the House inquiry phase. Again, this was a, a partisan process that the House didn't allow the uh, the GOP minority during the inquiry phase to call the witnesses that they preferred. We were entirely shut out of that process. How about the members of the committees, the Republican members of the committees that were included, though, in that process? I mean, you know, in the skiff room, there were Republicans there as well. But they were not allowed to call their witnesses. And so while they were included, it wasn't meaningful input. And it certainly was not uh, the ability for the minority party to participate meaningfully and call the witnesses that they preferred simply because they were the minority party. Are you saying that the Republicans didn't provide meaningful input in that process? I'm saying that they were not allowed to provide full, meaningful input through calling their own witnesses. Don't twist my words. I'm saying I didn't. that they I asked were you allowed question. to participate. I said that they were allowed to participate, but they weren't allowed full, meaningful input. And that's actually a legal term to say that uh, they were not allowed to fully participate in the process. They were shut out of their witnesses. And that it, should not have been allowed in the House inquiry. Adrian, so I'd love to give you an opportunity partisan. to respond. You've been sitting here uh, very patiently. Yeah, Allison, I just simply want to remind um, your viewers here that Democrats tried to get more witnesses called in the House process, but they were blocked by the White House. The White House made it very clear they wanted to go through months and months of litigation to try to get some of their witnesses to testify. And I think the House ultimately made, it was something that Nancy Pelosi declared pretty publicly, made it very clear that it was not worth it for the House to go through months and months and months of litigation and drive the impeachment process into the fall election. That was not something that Democrats wanted. Um, it was not something that the American voters wanted. So they were sort of, their hand was sort of forced by the fact that the Trump administration time and time again blocked witnesses from being able to testify. And something else that Jenna said that I want to push back on, Jenna, you keep saying that precedent is what is basing the legal strategy of Republicans and of the White House. When we look, we, when we look at precedent when it comes to, for example, the Clinton impeachment trial, new evidence did not come out that was relevant to the trial between the House process and then going to the Senate. So this is new evidence. What came out today in the New York Times regarding John Bolton, that is new evidence. And that is why you saw so many Democrats. And by, by the way, that is why three out of four Americans want to see witnesses come forward in the Senate trial. This is something that's going to hurt Republicans and is definitely going to hurt Donald Trump going into the fall. I'd maybe like to give the House should have taken mm -hmm. their time. <laughs> I'd love to give each of you an opportunity to say what you would hope to see and what you would like to see as we wait for the senators to decide what will be next. Jenna, I'll let you go first. 
Yeah, I would love to see the Senate come back and uh, call the motion on the ultimate question, which is to acquit the president. And here the House has not made their case. They carry the burden of proof. They chose to rush this inquiry. They chose to not have uh, any of the witnesses uh, or very few of the witnesses that the GOP called. And for all of those things that Adrian said as far as uh, blocking the, uh, the the subpoenas and all of that from the White House, it is absolutely the prerogative of the, the White House to put, push back on witnesses the Democrats were trying to call. I was talking about about not allowing the GOP to have their meaningful input through their witnesses. So those are completely different questions. But what I would love to see is the Senate actually calling a vote. We know that the president is going to be fully acquitted and exonerated, as he should be, because the House has not met their burden of proof beyond uh, the legal standard, nor have they even articulated articles of impeachment that fulfill the constitutional standard under Article 2, Section 4. Adrian, what would you like to see going forward? Yeah, Allison, you know, what I'd like to see is um, Democrats and the Democrats take their time and try to figure out what other additional recourse actions they can take right now to try to bring justice to American democracy. And there's so much at stake right now. We are setting a precedent. We are saying right now, if Donald Trump is acquitted, the United States Senate is telling the American people that any future president, Democrat or Republican, who wants to pressure a foreign government for their own political gain, that's fair game. That is allowed. So Chuck Schumer, Senate Democrats should take as much time as they need to figure out what other steps, whether what other legal maneuvers, what other Senate procedural tactics they can use right now to make sure that justice is served and that all the facts lay out on the table. Adrian, Elrod, Jenna Ellis, thank you both so much for being here on such an important night. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Allison. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Good afternoon from the spin room. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. An impeachment inquiry. Pushing Ukraine to look into the Biden. Read the transcript. They want to move quickly. Removing the president from office. We're going inside impeachment with the reporters of NBC News. Article 2 Inside Impeachment. Hosted by me, Steve Kornacki. All eyes on the 2020 election. Follow the latest on the candidates with the NBC News mobile app. Stay connected with breaking news, top stories, live video, and your favorite NBC News shows. Text NBC News to 66866 to get the app. The journey has begun. It'll take us through the debate stages, along the trails of Iowa and New Hampshire, onward to the town halls and convention halls, into the spin rooms and ballrooms. And as this journey unfolds, we'll be on the ground, at the big board, navigating the twists and turns every step of the way. We have nearly two and a half centuries of examples where the checks and balances of the constitutional system have worked. The framers designed the government for a moment like this. We weren't supposed to just give a pass to somebody whose team we decided to be on. We were supposed to actually think for ourselves. That's why we fought the revolution. That's why we've struggled again and again and again to make real those promises. Dateline episodes are now available as podcasts. Listen anytime, anywhere. Subscribe now so you don't miss a twist. Washington feels more chaotic than ever. It's my job to ask the tough questions, left and right, and help you make sense of it all. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. An insider's take on politics and more with some of my favorite reporters. Get it for free wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. One nearly 90% from the spin. It's line. news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern.
We are going to start with something different tonight. This is one of those things that you have not been otherwise hearing about in the news, but stick with me. Feed your mind with fresh perspective. Get your favorite MSNBC shows now as podcasts. We are getting some new details about how the rest of this night in the Senate may play out. Leanne Caldwell is on Capitol Hill. And Leanne, last we saw you, we had so many questions about what might happen. The Senate voting against witnesses, but we didn't know what would happen next. So what do you know? So it sounds like just in the last few moments, uh, we are hearing from senators on the record that the two leaders, Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer, have reached an agreement on how this is going to move forward. And what that looks like is, um, you know, now we're past this vote on witnesses that failed. So now it's just how to get to this vote to acquit this mm-hmm. president. And so what does it look like? It looks like tonight they're going to vote on a resolution written by uh, Mitch McConnell. They'll take a couple of mo- votes trying to amend that. Um, and then and that resolution lays out what happens next. And then what does happen, there will be no session this Saturday and Sunday. They're going to take the weekend off, return on Monday. On Monday, each side, the defense and the closing and the House impeachment managers are going to provide their closing arguments. And then on Tuesday, senators will have the time to come to the floor and really opine, uh, give their own speeches about what transpired in this impeachment trial. And then on Wednesday, this is the big day a final vote on acquitting this president. That's supposed to happen Wednesday afternoon. So um, it's a a big agreement between the two that have been reached. Um, It happens after the State of the Union. Uh, We know that the president and some Republicans wanted to use the State of the Union as his victory lap to really spike the football. But that doesn't look like it's going to be Mm -hmm. able to happen as they've agreed that this vote is going to take place on Wednesday, Allison. Leanne, I know you're not going to pat yourself in the back, so I'm going to do it for you. But unless I'm missing something here, this sounds almost precisely like what you said was going to happen just a few hours ago. It is. um, (laughs) But and is there anything different? We were initially reporting that they would take the weekend off. And this is all based on your reporting. I I should be very clear about that. We didn't get any of this information. You did. But it initially looked like they would take the weekend off, come back Monday for closing arguments, and then the vote would be uh, on Wednesday. Has anything uh, changed from what you were originally hearing? The only thing that changed is a few hours of chaos in between that. Okay. Um, so there was a tentative deal this morning. Uh, there was some, uh, after they presented it to their caucus, their respective caucuses, mm-hmm. the Republicans and Democrats, there was some outrage among a very small group of Republicans who had the backing of the of the president. And, and so that's, things kind of went all up in the air at that, but it seems like things have calmed down again, um, and now they're back to where they were uh, earlier this uh, earlier today, Allison. Leanne, uh, and if you don't know the answer to this, I apologize. I'm putting you on the spot. Do we have any sense that it was a matter of uh, getting the president in on uh, in on this and his agreement on this? I know he's been traveling tonight. Was it a matter of, of getting more of the senators, the Republican senators in on this? Was it a combination of the two? Or at this stage, do we simply have no idea who it was that was holding out the most? So what we do know based on our reporting and especially our reporting from our White House team Mm -hmm. that there were aspects of the White House that were okay with this original agreement that a vote on Wednesday. Of course they would like it before the State of the Union but you know they had kind of had the mindset like an acquittal is acquittal we're going to move on so that's fine. Um, But then there was another faction of the White House who uh, were not so happy with that and so they tried just this last minute push to get things changed. How McConnell uh, reined him back in, we don't know those details yet, but um, you know, McConnell has a lot of sway around here, especially among his members. And, um, you know, sometimes he can whisper in the ear of the president and get him to come along. So I don't know if that's what happened. Um, if, you know, past his precedent, then possibly. Uh, but it does seem that things are back where we started and it's going to take about four or five days till we get to that vote. But, but, It's going to happen, and that's what Republicans, you know, keep telling us. Like, yes, we would like it sooner, but if it happens, it happens, and that's all that matters is acquittal, Allison. All right, so, Leanne, just to recap, as you've been saying, it looks like they may have a tentative deal or an agreement that they will not vote to acquit uh, or vote on acquitting the president until Wednesday, but they will be back tonight uh, to vote on a resolution to sort of lay all of that out. 
That's exactly right. So we'll still, there'll be more session tonight. We'll still see, hear from senators. Um, we could hear from the majority leader on the floor at any moment. All right, Leanne Caldwell, I have a feeling it just might not be the last time we talk tonight. Thank you so much for filling us in. Thank you. All right, so we have some sense of where the impeachment trial goes from here, but we really don't know exactly where the impeachment trial goes from here. Former Watergate prosecutor Nick Ackerman is here with me now. And Nick, what an interesting day in the Senate. Uh, I, I, interesting, I, but very predictable. And Glenn is right. This was a cover-up, mm -hmm. and it was a cover-up from day one. I mean, Mitch McConnell's whole strategy was to wear people down, wear his caucus down, so that he could keep from getting those 51 votes to call witnesses. I mean, if they had, right from the get-go, decided to call witnesses, put that up for a vote, put up the uh, documents for a vote, it'd be completely different. People's attitudes would have been different. But he did this on purpose. I mean, this is part of the continuing cover-up that we are watching in real time being played out in this so-called impeachment trial. I mean, the only reason that we had any kind of little pushback today on the deal was because Donald Trump wants to get to Mar-a-Lago to celebrate and to have his interview at the Super Bowl with Hannity on Fox News. I mean, that's what this is all about. I mean, it just shows you what kinds of petty things are fueling this administration and this president. And this is on just this one item, but this is everything that happens out of this White House. None of it is based on reality and based on the good of the American people. It, you know, Nick, it shows you how wrapped up we've all been in impeachment that when you said that, I had to think, oh, my goodness, that's right. It is Super Bowl Sunday this weekend. It just seems like right. we keep joking, right? January is the is the longest year ever. Uh, let me ask you this, though. We've the longest been, month ever. No, we've been saying it's the longest year ever because it sure right? feels like it. That's what that's yesterday. We said felt like the longest the longest month ever. It just seems like days have turned into months, months into years. Uh, let me ask you this. Right. Are you surprised by all of the wrangling and haggling over, uh, as we've been saying, landing this plane over figuring out when to vote on on acquittal or removal? No, because I, I think it still has to play itself out. I mean, I think who knows what else is going to come out between now and Wednesday. I mean, the longer they can drag this out with the Democrats, the better. It's going to be drip, drip, drip. There's going to be more information. Um, there's going to be more stuff coming out on the Bolton book. Uh, and this is not going away. I mean, even after he is acquitted, supposedly, of all these crimes, there's going to be other stuff. I mean, the other big milestone coming up are the tax returns in June when the Supreme Court has to decide whether or not the financial information and the tax returns is going to be, are going to be produced. And I think they will be. So that's even going to be another bombshell here that's just going to keep continuing right up through Election Day. Let me ask you this, though. Will it will it have any impact? Will it make any sort of difference? Because some people, you know, might argue we had this information from John Bolton today that many people are calling a bombshell. We have had information trickling out. I mean, again, it seems like quite a long time ago, but there were the Lev Parnas interviews, the information he has since released, and we are still exactly where we thought we would be with the Senate, uh, you know, not voting for witnesses and perhaps on the brink of acquittal. Does it matter at this point if we get any more information? Well, I think it does. How come? Because, well, because I think people have to understand who the president is. I mean, this all goes to the election. We're only 10 months away from the presidential election. And I think there's information that's going to come out. I mean, for example, on the tax returns, um, I, I just can't believe that what he was doing before that the New York Times was reporting about his taxes and about his cheating and what his family was doing to try and evade taxes from being paid to the U.S. government, that those returns are going to show that he is a tax cheat in spades. I mean, it just has to be. There's no reason not to produce those tax returns. And I mean, any legitimate reason, unless he's trying to hide something. And so the question is, what is he hiding? The only possible thing he could possibly be hiding is a continuation of the same tax fraud that his father started many years ago. I mean, there's no reason to think that that has changed one iota. So I, I think we're just going to be looking at more and more of the same. And keep in mind, OK, he gets acquitted by the Senate. This Senate really, when you come right down to it, these hundred members represent like uh, I mean, a, a small portion of the population. I mean, most of our population is on the coasts and in other states. So to get 100 senators to, you know, to get a majority or two-thirds to convict is pretty difficult, particularly when he's got all of these people tied up in the possibility of Republican primaries that would undermine 
you know, these people if they came out against the president. I mean, the person that you've really got to give credit to here is Mitt Romney. I mean, here's a guy, he's not up for re-election. Um, he easily could have gone along with the program with everybody else, but he took it upon himself to say, you know, this, there, there's something wrong here. I want to hear from witnesses. I mean, he's the one guy without any bad motive. I mean, Look, how about, about Collins? I was just going to ask, how about yeah. Collins? She was the Collins, only other one to vote. She's up for election. She's trying to make herself look like she's a goody two-shoes. Is that what you think the, that was? Yeah. Posturing? Uh, total okay. posturing. I mean, she knows that her vote by throwing in there for um, documents and witnesses isn't going to mean anything. I mean, she knows that it was only going to be two of them at that point. But, you know, Mitt Romney, he's not up for re-election. I mean, you've got to give him a lot of credit for doing the right thing here and coming out on the right side of this. I'd love to ask you another question uh, about the witness vote. And, and I just want to check if we have the sound bite here. Uh, do we have Schiff? Excellent. Thank you, guys. I just didn't want to set up my control for right. something that we couldn't handle here. Uh, Adam Schiff argued today that senators would be undermining their own authority going forward if they vote against witnesses. Here's what he said before the vote. A no vote on the question before you will have long-lasting and harmful consequences long after this impeachment trial is over. We agree with the President's counsel on this much. This will set a new precedent. This will be cited in impeachment trials from this point to the end of history. Do, do you agree with that? Is he right? Do you think the Senate is making itself less powerful with well, this vote? It make, it's making itself less powerful. How so? Be, because it's basically saying you can do anything you want and there's no check on you. There's nothing we're going to do. There's no consequences. There's no payback here for what you did. You can, you can extort. You can bribe. You can kill somebody on Fifth Avenue and we're not going to do anything about it. I mean, what's really scary here is whoever becomes a nominee, whoever is running for president this time, has really got to create their own internal police force because you know Donald Trump is going to have the Russians doing this again. He's going to have whoever else he can involved in this campaign to give him whatever corrupt advantage he can get because he knows he can get away with it. He got away with it with the Russians. He got away with it now with this Ukraine situation. So, I mean, I'm just hoping whoever becomes the Democratic nominee is going to have to create their own internal security force that has got to be as good or better than any government security force. I mean, this is the kinds of things that we're looking at because the election is clearly not safe. There is no question that Donald Trump now has a free pass to do whatever he wants, and there's no question he's going to do it. Nick, you, I, I would thank you just for being with us this evening, but you have been with us, uh, as we've been saying, I mean, it seems like for days now. I walk on set and, and <laughs> Nick is here, Glenn is here, uh, helping us kind of go through all of this. So thank you so much. And uh, from what Leanne says, it sounds like this may not be the last night that we were talking about all of this, that we'll probably be back next week. So Sounds that way. <laughs> yeah. Nick Ackerman, thank you so much. Just two other presidents in American history have had Senate impeachment trials, Andrew Johnson and Bill Clinton. So how does President Trump's trial compare to theirs? Dasha Burns digs through the NBC News archives to find out. Throughout U.S. history, only three presidents have ever been impeached. Andrew Johnson, Bill Clinton, and now Donald Trump. President Nixon resigned before his trial went to the Senate. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. So the process we're watching today is incredibly rare, but not unprecedented. And we might be able to learn a little something now by understanding what happened back then. The most useful comparison is Clinton's impeachment. In this episode of Now and Then, we'll take a closer look at how that played out in the 90s and compare it to what we see today. In both cases, things played out in a changing media landscape. Clinton was on trial in the early days of 24-7 cable news. New allegations that President Clinton had an affair with a former White House intern and then urged her to lie about it. The salacious nature of the allegations meant this was a made-for-TV event. Did you have sex with the president or did he, and if, or did he ask for it? something like that. I want you to listen to me. I'm going to say this again. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. 
But by the time the trial came around, all of the most shocking details had already been aired and re-aired all day, every day. So it wasn't quite as captivating anymore, especially because the results of the trial felt like a foregone conclusion. The parties were polarized and everyone expected the vote would fall pretty much on party lines, which it did. That's not so different from today, as most experts and voters think the Senate will acquit the president. We all know how it's going to end. There's no chance the president's going to be removed from office. But Trump's impeachment is also coinciding with a new media landscape. He's the first president to master the use of Twitter and social media to circumvent cable and broadcast news and talk directly to the public. Anytime, anywhere, any way he chooses often using the platform to bash impeachment and call it a hoax. And social media has made it even easier for people to choose the news that suits their views, exacerbating the echo chambers and the divide between the left and right. Meanwhile, the actual impeachment process has been drawn out, especially when it comes to witnesses. And calling witnesses was a sticking point in Clinton's trial as well. All 100 senators will meet in private tomorrow. The dispute escalated after House Republican prosecutors pressed to call more than a dozen witnesses, starting with Monica Lewinsky. What is wrong with witnesses? And there's even some overlap in the cast of characters. And significantly in this particular juncture in America's history, the Senate is being called to sit as the high court of impeachment all too frequently. Indeed, we're living in what I think can aptly be described as the age of impeachment. Any privilege can be invoked no matter how unmeritorious one thinks it is, that that's not an abuse. Perhaps we live in such a litigious age that that's the new way of doing things. I disagree with that. Another striking similarity is the geopolitical backdrop. At the White House tonight, the president is commander in chief of Operation Desert Storm and almost certainly just two days away from being impeached by the full House of Representatives. Compare that to today. It was a U.S. military strike that has killed Qasem Soleimani. Think of this as a three-eye morning, Iran impeachment in Iowa. He is taking us to the edge of war. But that doesn't mean they weren't commenting on impeachment while dealing with the international conflict. Here's what Clinton said about whether he'd resign as president. Do you intend to resign as did President Nixon? I have no intention of resigning. It's never crossed my mind. But there are also significant differences. Clinton's impeachment took longer as they appointed an independent counsel to lead an investigation. And it was months between Congress receiving a report and actually impeaching Clinton. But Trump's impeachment moved faster. The Justice Department declined to investigate. Instead, the House Intelligence Committee conducted an investigation, and the House impeached Trump just two weeks after releasing a 300-page report. And of course, there are the articles themselves. Clinton was impeached for perjury and obstruction of justice. He faced accusations much more personal in nature, stemming from a sexual harassment lawsuit and allegations of an affair with White House intern Monica Lewinsky. And then, of course, lying about it under oath. They did not constitute sexual relations as I understood that term to be defined at my January 17, 1998 deposition. Whereas Trump has been impeached for obstruction of Congress and abuse of power, all centered around allegations that he pushed Ukraine to find dirt on a political opponent and withheld congressionally approved aid in the process. You know what? There was no pressure. And you know there was, and by the way, you know there was no pressure. All you have to do is see it, what went on on the call. You will hear their testimony at the same time as the American people. That is, if you allow it if we have a fair trial. And as for public opinion, Clinton maintained approval ratings in the 60% range during impeachment hearings, and his approval even spiked to 73% after the trial. And although Trump's approval ratings are lower in the 40s range, there hasn't been a sizable shift in his ratings throughout the impeachment process so far. Clinton's Senate trial lasted for six weeks, and he was ultimately acquitted. Now that the Senate has fulfilled its constitutional responsibility, bringing this process to a conclusion, I want to say again to the American people how profoundly sorry I am for what I said and did.
trigger these events and the great burden they have imposed on the Congress and on the American people. We'll see if President Trump ends up singing a similar tune in the weeks to come. For some expertise and perspective on the impeachment trial, let's bring in MSNBC News contributor Jill Wine Banks. Jill, we haven't seen you in about a week. It's great to have you back on the show. Uh, and let's just kick it off on a light note tonight because uh, it's been a little bit uh, stressful. We had a lot going on. Tell us about the pin. <laughs> the pin is the Queen of Hearts from Alice in Wonderland. And I'm paraphrasing what she said by saying, verdict first, witnesses never. And that's really a sham trial. Glenn was quite correct. The <laughs> Senate has covered up what the evidence is. They don't want the facts. They don't want the documents. They don't want the witnesses. And the American people do. 70% of America wants to hear what the witnesses have to say. And my advice to the House is issue a subpoena right now for John Bolton. Let him come in front of the public. There's going to be a break. He can come in tomorrow. He can come in on Monday. Let him testify. Let us hear what he has to add to the evidence of wrongdoing by Trump. Jill, I'm going to reference Glenn because he is sitting here nodding along with you. And everyone who has been on the show tonight has referenced Glenn, whether they love or hate what he is saying. <laughs> but let me ask you, uh, how could that play out? Because a lot of people might be thinking, wait a second, they voted no witnesses. Is it too late to subpoena Bolton at this point? Well, it's not the House. The House is a completely different entity, and they can. Bolton has said he would testify for the Senate. Why won't he testify for the House? And it's too late for them to do anything about the articles of impeachment, although there's also another, um, you, you brought up the Clinton impeachment. There is now a black coat, which is the equivalent of Monica Lewinsky's blue dress. And there's been a request for DNA testing of the president because one of his rape victims has a black coat, which she has had DNA testing done on. And she wants to have his DNA to show that it was him who raped her. So there could be a whole nother thing coming. Um, it's a really interesting time in America, but I, I definitely think this was a dark day that this is not what the Senate is supposed to be doing. They are supposed to be trying this case. They are supposed to be getting the truth out. And in this situation, so much has happened between the articles of impeachment. You had Lev Parnas, and now you have John Bolton, and you have leaks, drip, drip, drip. And during Watergate, the drip, drip, drip of information was very harmful to Richard Nixon. If he had said everything all at once, it would have been much less harmful than letting it drip out a little bit at a time. And I would like to see all of it come out. And I think we need to have witnesses somehow come out publicly. That's what we need. Jill, let me ask you this then, because I've been asking several of our guests uh, uh, questions along the lines of, is it too late? But Leanne Caldwell, uh, our Capitol Hill correspondent, was reporting back to us that it sounds now uh, like the Senate in principle has reached an agreement in which they would vote on a resolution tonight to sort of lay out how the rest of this trial would look. They would take the weekend off. They would have closing arguments perhaps Monday, uh, opining, as she said, on Tuesday, and then the vote on Wednesday. Could anything actually change? Could enough come out uh, to have an impact? Impact between a now and Wednesday? I don't honestly think that any Republican is listening to any of the evidence. They have shut their eyes, they have shut their ears, they are blind and deaf to the facts, but the American people are seeing them, and to have the American public see a live witness like Bolton would be very dramatic. Remember, these people have to run for re-election. And once they do go out into their constituencies, I think they're going to be surprised about how many of their constituents are angry at them for covering this up and for preventing witnesses. So will anything change their minds? It would appear that there is nothing that will change their minds. I don't even know why we need closing arguments. They've already decided. You heard Mitch McConnell say it. You just played the clip where he said, we're going to get to acquittal. That's the goal. And they're working with the president to do it. So what's the point of even having any more arguments? It will not change any votes in the Senate, but it could in November. So I would add to what Glenn said that not only is this bad, I think the best 
that we can say of this is that the American people see what's happening, and this could dramatically impact how November goes, both in terms of who wins the presidency, but in terms of who is ousted. McConnell is running for re-election, and he is the leader of this cover-up. So I think everyone in his home state ought to take account of that, and he has a very strong competitor running against him. And so he may be out of the Senate, and he, even if he's back in the Senate, he may not be in charge of the Senate. He may lose the majority because of how they're handling this trial. So there is, you know, if I'm looking for some good news along <laughs> with the humor of my pen. <laughs> you always do. I try to do that. <laughs> but, but this one really could be the good news is that American voters are going to wake up. And I think that last election, there were a lot of people who said, well, I don't love Hillary. I don't like him. So I'm just going to sit it out. Or Bernie didn't get the nomination, so I'm not going to vote for anybody else. I think that Democrats now realize that they must vote in this election. Turnout is key, and we have to make sure it's vote blue no matter who. I have my preferences, but I would vote for any Democrat against Donald Trump because I view him as a danger to democracy, as a danger to the Justice Department, as a danger, in fact, to our whole justice system. You can't have trials like this. And he has somehow gotten power over the senators and actually in the House because, except for Amash, and let's point out that Amash was a Republican. He was kicked out of the party because he wouldn't support what was going on. So really, the impeachment articles did have a Republican supporting them, Justin Amash. And we had at least two brave Republican senators vote to have witnesses. It only was, you know, one short of having it be a tie and raising the issue of would the Chief Justice have interfered, not interfered, would he have exercised his power to break the uh, tie, or we were too short of having a pure victory. But it is what it is. That's what's happened. And voters need to take that into account when they vote for the Senate and when they vote for the president. And the um, Senate, even Lamar Alexander, who ended up voting against having witnesses, said, I'm accepting that everything is true. I'm accepting that the president did pressure Ukraine to get something of political benefit to himself, but I just don't care. And that's what all of the senators who voted against witnesses were voting. And they did this now in full knowledge that John Bolton has some very strong and condemning uh, evidence. He was in the room. I mean, you know, I feel like breaking out into song from Hamilton uh, where it happens in the room, being in the room where it happens. He was in the room where it happens, and he could tell us exactly what the president knows. And in fact, the president said he shouldn't testify because he does know what the president was thinking. So why don't we want him to testify? Why don't we want him to tell us the truth about why the money was withheld, about the fact that the president didn't do it for our benefit, nothing to do with America. It had to do with him winning re-election. And that takes us to the ridiculous argument of Alan Dershowitz that if the president believes it's in the public interest for him to be elected, then he can do anything he wants to reach that goal. And it includes doing what he did in Ukraine, which is to extort the president of Ukraine to do something. And let's point out that it's not, I, I have a hashtag, say this, not that. He didn't ask to have dirt dug up. There was no dirt to dig up. He asked that an announcement be made of an investigation to muddy the picture, to make Biden looked bad because he thought Biden was the strongest candidate that would run against him and he wanted to hurt him. So that's what he did. It wasn't digging up dirt. There was nothing to dig up. It was to announce an investigation. So let's call it what it is. It was just part of another cover up and part of just trying to make someone look bad when there was no evidence that he did anything. He acted in accordance with American policy and European policy. The entire European community wanted the removal of that particular prosecutor because he was corrupt. He was not investigating corruption. So what Joe Biden did was actually contrary to his son's interests 
because if they had gotten a good prosecutor, that could have led to something being actually investigated. So, you know, there's just so many misrepresentations here and so much damage has been done to our uh, way of life. Jill Weinbanks, always great to see you and your pin. Uh, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you, Allison. All right, let's get the uh, view from the administration on all of this. NBC's Kelly O'Donnell is in West Palm Beach, Florida, uh, where the president is headed, and it looks like the weather is a whole lot warmer. Kelly, has the president made it there yet? We know he was en route just a short time ago. He has not yet touched down in Palm Beach, but we expect that uh, fairly soon. It is raining here, although it is quite lovely <laughs> uh, temperature wise. So I don't know if that would affect uh, his timing, but he is expected this evening and then to spend the weekend here, Allison, with a Super Bowl party planned, an annual event at Mar-a-Lago. Obviously, that all seems so secondary to what's happening in Washington. And so the president will at least have the opportunity to be in one of his favorite places while there is all this turmoil around its presidency and the future of the Senate trial happening back in Washington. Kelly, let's talk about that because that is the hot topic tonight. Uh, we know that the Senate was debating for quite some time about how they would proceed after deciding not to call witnesses and then having to make the decision about when they would have that acquittal vote. Uh, what do we know uh, on the White House side of things about the role the White House played in all of this back and forth? Well, certainly the White House has had its counsel on the Capitol grounds, its uh, head of legislative affairs, interacting with Mitch McConnell and lawmakers sure there. And of course, the president's preference would be to do the State of the Union on Tuesday after the conclusion of a trial where he presumes there will be an acquittal. And that's the state of the reporting we have at this point is that it's headed in that direction. Of course, we want to let those events play out. But as it stands now, the timing and schedule that we believe is getting locked in in the Senate would be for a final vote on Wednesday, the day after the State of the Union. So it is potential that uh, the president could have to address uh, the chamber and have to do that with the specter of impeachment and the trial still hanging over his head. And of course, the State of the Union is a constitutionally required event. It does not have to be a speech, but the president is required to provide to the Congress a state of our union. And usually they come up with with a term or a phrase to describe the state of things right now. You could expect the president to talk about a strong economy or other things in how he would declare that and then lay out all of the agenda items he would have for his final year in office of this first term. He, of course, is trying to get a second term by running for re-election. So can the White House change that? Well, the president only speaks in front of the House chamber at the invitation of the speaker. She set that date. The White House had originally agreed to it for Tuesday night. So one of the big questions is, will there be any change to the State of the Union? We don't have any indication now other than they would certainly prefer that the president would be able to appear after the trial concludes. But that's something we'll be watching closely over the next few days. Allison? Kelly, also something I think people might be wondering is whether the president would bring up impeachment at something like the State of the Union. We know he is not hesitant to do so at a campaign rally, but this is a very different type of event. It is. And the State of the Union speech in past presidents and certainly even in the first few years where President Trump has delivered one, it is a speech that is uh, sent through all the different departments when there are issues and information that relate to different areas. For example, right now we've got uh, the health concern with the coronavirus. So the uh, Department of Health and Human Services or other medical agencies might review that section of the speech. Things that relate to defense would be reviewed by defense. So all of that gets shared pretty widely in, inter in an interagency process. But the president also likes to go off script. We've seen that time yes. and time again. Might he reference it? It would almost seem like a test of his impulse control. Could he look at uh, the Speaker of the House, shake her hand, address the chamber without referencing in some way? We just don't know yet, uh, but that would certainly be something that would affect uh, the tone and the tenor of the evening, a night that for most presidents is supposed to be one of their biggest nights of the year with one of the biggest audiences, which is why, of course, he would prefer to do it with the trial behind him, where you could almost certainly imagine that he would make reference to it. Uh, but we'll have to see how that plays out. But it is not the kind of thing that fills the body of a typical State of the Union address.
Kelly, uh, is there any expectation this week, uh, this evening rather, that when the president touches down that you might hear from him? I know typically that is the case, that he's opportunities when he's taking off or landing, that he will stop and speak with the press, but that he hasn't been doing that quite as often, uh, at least not in 2020. We have been tracking that, and <laughs> often when he arrives in Palm Beach, nighttime conditions and so forth, it is raining here, seems less likely. But the times when the president normally talks to us and is often very engaged is when he departs the White House. And uh, he has not been doing that of late, and he's been showing some uh, message control while this trial has been unfolding. We don't know if he's been advised by the lawyers not to engage with reporters who would certainly ask about various things like John Bolton uh, and the questions about whether his former National Security Advisor would at some point testify or even just the, the expectations of what is in the book. So the president has been backing off on that, uh, still seeing and engaging with reporters, but not taking questions at the pace that we've been accustomed to. Allison? Kelly O'Donnell, thrilled to hear that even though it is raining there, it is still warm as it should be in Florida this time of year. Thank you so much. No complaints. <laughs> You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Good afternoon from the spin It's room. news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. An impeachment inquiry. Pushing Ukraine to look into the Biden. Read the transcript. They want to move quickly. Moving the president from office. We're going inside impeachment with the reporters of NBC News. Article 2 Inside Impeachment. Hosted by me, Steve Kornacki. All eyes on the 2020 election. Follow the latest on the candidates with the NBC News mobile app. Stay connected with breaking news, top stories, live video, and your favorite NBC News shows. Text NBC News to 66866 to get the app. The journey has begun. It'll take us through the debate stages, along the trails of Iowa and New Hampshire, onward to the town halls and convention halls, into the spin rooms and ballrooms. And as this journey unfolds, we'll be on the ground, at the big board, navigating the twists and turns every step of the way. We have nearly two and a half centuries of examples where the checks and balances of the constitutional system have worked. The framers designed the government for a moment like this. We weren't supposed to just give a pass to somebody whose team we decided to be on. We were supposed to actually think for ourselves. That's why we fought the revolution. That's why we've struggled again and again and again to make real those promises. Dateline episodes are now available as podcasts. Listen anytime, anywhere. Subscribe now so you don't miss a twist. Washington feels more chaotic than ever. It's my job to ask the tough questions, left and right, and help you make sense of it all. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. An insider's take on politics and more with some of my favorite reporters. Get it for free wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. One nearly 90 percent. from the spin. It's line. news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. We are going to start with something different tonight. This is one of those things that you have not been otherwise hearing about in the news, but stick with me. Feed your mind with fresh perspective. Get your favorite MSNBC shows now as podcasts. We are getting some new details about how the rest of this night in the Senate may play out. Leanne Caldwell is on Capitol Hill. And Leanne, last we saw you, we had so many questions about what might happen. The Senate voting against witnesses, but we didn't know what would happen next. So what do you know? 
So it sounds like just in the last few moments, uh, we are hearing from senators on the record that the two leaders, Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer, have reached an agreement on how this is going to move forward. And what that looks like is, um, you know, now we're past this vote on witnesses that failed. So now it's just how to get to this vote to acquit this mm -hmm. president. And so what does it look like? It looks like tonight they're going to vote on a resolution written by uh, Mitch McConnell. They'll take a couple of votes trying to amend that. Um, and then that resolution lays out what happens next. And then what does happen, there will be no session this Saturday and Sunday. They're going to take the weekend off, return on Monday. On Monday, each side, the defense and the closing and the House impeachment managers are going to provide their closing arguments. And then on Tuesday, senators will sure. have the time to come to the floor and really opine, uh, give their own speeches about what transpired in this impeachment trial. And then on Wednesday, this is the big day a final vote on acquitting this president. That's supposed to happen Wednesday afternoon. So um, it's a, a big agreement between the two that have been reached. Um, it happens after the State of the Union. Uh, we know that the president and some Republicans wanted to use the State of the Union as his victory lap to really spike the football. But that doesn't look like it's going to be mm -hmm. able to happen as they've agreed that this vote is going to take place on Wednesday, Allison. Leanne, I'm, I know you're not going to pat yourself in the back, so I'm going to do it for you. But <laughs> unless I'm missing something here, this sounds almost precisely like what you said was going to happen just a few hours ago. It is. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> And is there so, anything different? We were initially reporting that they would take the weekend off, and this is all based on your reporting. I, I should be very clear about that. We didn't get any of this information. You did. But it initially looked like they would take the weekend off, come back Monday for closing arguments, and then the vote would be uh, on Wednesday. Has anything uh, changed from what you were originally hearing? The only thing that changed is a few hours of chaos in between that. Okay. Um, so there was a tentative deal this morning. Uh, there was some, uh, after they presented it to their caucus, their respective caucuses, mm -hmm. the Republicans and Democrats, there was some outrage among a very small group of Republicans who had the backing of the of the president. And, and so that's, things kind of went all up in the air at that, but it seems like things have calmed down again. We're dipping back in to the Senate trial where the Senate is back on the floor. Further, that I be recognized to make a motion to table the amendment after it's been reported with no intervening action or debate. Is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. The Democratic leader is recognized. Mr. Chief Justice, I have a parliamentary inquiry. The Democratic leader will state the inquiry. Is the Chief Justice aware that in the impeachment trial of President Johnson, Chief Justice Chase, as presiding officer, cast tie-breaking votes on both March 31st and April 2nd, 1868? I am, Mr. Leader. Uh, the one concerned a motion to adjourn. The other concerned a motion to close deliberations. Uh, I do not regard those isolated episodes 150 years ago as sufficient to support a general authority to break ties. If the members of this body, elected by the people and accountable to them, divide equally on a motion, the normal rule is that the motion fails. I think it would be inappropriate for me, an unelected official from a different branch of government, to assert the power to change that result so that the motion would succeed. Now, Mr. Chief Justice, I send an amendment to the desk to subpoena Mulvaney, Bolton, Duffy, Blair, and the White House, OMB, DOD, and State Department documents, and I ask that it be read. The clerk will report. <clears throat> Senator from New York, Mr. Schumer, proposes an amendment number 1295. At the appropriate place in the matter following the resolving clause, insert the following. Section, notwithstanding any other provision of this. The amendment be considered as read. Objection, so ordered. <laughs> the majority leader is recognized. I move to table the amendment and ask for the yeas and nays. Is there a sufficient second? There is. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Aye. 
Mr. Alexander, aye. Ms. Baldwin, no. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Barrasso, aye. Mr. Bennett, Mr. Bennett, no. Mrs. Blackburn, aye. Mrs. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Blumenthal, no. Mr. Blumenthal, no. Mr. Blunt, Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Booker, no. Mr. Booker, no. Mr. Bozeman. Mr. Bozeman, aye. Mr. Braun, Mr. Braun, aye. Mr. Brown, Mr. Brown, no. Mr. Burr, Mr. Burr, aye. Ms. Cantwell, Ms. Cantwell, no. Mrs. Capito, Mrs. Capito, aye. Mr. Cardin, Mr. Cardin, no. Mr. Carper, Mr. Carper, no. Mr. Casey, Mr. Casey, no. Mr. Cassidy, Mr. Cassidy, aye. Ms. Collins, Ms. Collins, aye. Mr. Coons, Mr. Coons, no. Mr. Cornyn, Mr. Cornyn, aye. Ms. Cortez Masto, Ms. Cortez Masto, no. Mr. Cotton, Mr. Cotton, no. Mr. Cotton, aye. Mr. Kramer, Mr. Kramer, aye. Mr. Crapo, Mr. Crapo, aye. Mr. Cruz, Mr. Cruz, aye. Mr. Danes, Mr. Danes, aye. Ms. Duckworth, Ms. Duckworth, no, Mr. Durbin, Mr. Durbin, no, Mr. Enzi, Mr. Enzi, aye, Ms. Ernst, Ms. Ernst, aye, Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Feinstein, no, Mrs. Fisher, Mrs. Fisher, aye, Mr. Gardner, Mr. Gardner, aye, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mrs. Gillibrand, no, Mr. Graham, Mr. Graham, aye. Mr. Grassley, Mr. Grassley, aye. Ms. Harris, Ms. Harris, no. Ms. Hassan, Ms. Hassan, no. Mr. Hawley, Mr. Hawley, aye. Mr. Heinrich, Mr. Heinrich, no. Ms. Hirono, Ms. Hirono, no. Mr. Hoven, Mr. Hoven, aye. Mrs. Hyde Smith, aye. Mrs. Hyde Smith, aye. Mr. Inhofe, aye. Mr. Inhofe, aye. Mr. Johnson, aye. Mr. Johnson, aye. Mr. Jones, no. Mr. Jones, no. Mr. Kane, no. Mr. Kane, no. Mr. Kennedy, aye. Mr. Kennedy, Aye, Mr. King. No. Mr. King, no. Ms. Klobuchar. Ms. Klobuchar, no. Mr. Langford. Mr. Langford, aye. Mr. Leahy. Mr. Leahy, no. Mr. Lee. Aye. Mr. Lee, aye. Mrs. Leffler. Mrs. Leffler, aye. Mr. Manchin. Mr. Manchin. No, Mr. Markey, Mr. Markey, no, Mr. McConnell, Mr. McConnell, aye, Ms. McSally, aye. Ms. McSally, aye, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Menendez, no, Mr. Merkley, Mr. Merkley, no, Mr. Moran, aye. Mr. Moran, aye, Ms. Murkowski, Ms. Murkowski, Aye, Mr. Murphy. Mr. Murphy, no. Mrs. Murray. Mrs. Murray, no. Mr. Paul. Mr. Paul, aye. Mr. Purdue. Mr. Purdue, aye. Mr. Peters. Mr. Peters, no. Mr. Portman. Mr. Portman, aye. Mr. Reed. Mr. Reed, no. Mr. Risch, Mr. Risch, aye. Mr. Roberts, Mr. Roberts, 
Aye. Mr. Romney. Aye. Mr. Romney. Aye. Ms. Rosen. Ms. Rosen. No. Mr. Rounds. Aye. Mr. Rounds. Aye. Mr. Rubio. Aye. Mr. Rubio. Aye. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sanders. No. Mr. Sass. Mr. Sass. Aye. Mr. Schatz. Mr. Schatz. No. Mr. Schumer. Mr. Schumer. No. Mr. Scott of Florida. Aye. Mr. Scott of Florida. Aye. Mr. Scott of South Carolina. Aye. Mr. Scott of South Carolina. Aye. Mrs. Shaheen. Mrs. Shaheen. No. Mr. Shelby. Mr. Shelby. Aye. Ms. Cinema. Ms. Cinema. No. Ms. Smith. Ms. Smith. No. Ms. Stabenow. Ms. Stabenow. No. Mr. Sullivan. Aye. Mr. Sullivan. Aye. Mr. Tester. Mr. Tester. No. Mr. Thune. Mr. Thune. Aye. Mr. Tillis. Aye. Mr. Tillis. Aye. Mr. Toomey. Aye. Mr. Toomey. Aye. Mr. Udall. Mr. Udall. No. Mr. Van Hollen. No. Mr. Van Hollen. No. Mr. Warner. No. Mr. Warner. No. Ms. Warren. No. Ms. Warren. No. Mr. Whitehouse. No. Mr. Whitehouse. No. Mr. Wicker. Mr. Wicker. Aye. Mr. Wyden. No. Mr. Wyden. No. Mr. Young. Aye. Mr. Young. Aye. Does any member in the chamber wish to change his or her vote? If not, the yeas are 53, the nays are 47. The motion is agreed to. The Democratic leader is recognized. Mr. Chief Justice, I send an amendment to the desk to subpoena John R. Bolton, and I ask that it be read. The clerk will report. The Senator from New York, Mr. Schumer, proposes an amendment number 1296. At the appropriate place in the resolving clause, insert the following. Section, notwithstanding any other provision of this resolution pursuant to rules five and six of the rules of procedure and practice in the Senate when sitting on impeachment trials, the Chief Justice of the United States, the Secretary of the Senate, shall issue a subpoena for the taking of testimony of John Robert Bolton, and the Sergeant at Arms is authorized to utilize the services of the Deputy Sergeant at Arms or any other employee of the Senate in serving the subpoena authorized to be issued by this section. The majority leader is recognized. I move to table the amendment. I ask for the yeas and nays. Is there a sufficient second? There is. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Aye. Aye. Ms. Baldwin. Yes. No. Mr. Barrasso. Aye. Aye. Mr. Bennett. No. no. Mrs. Blackburn. Aye. Aye. Mr. Blumenthal. No. no. Mr. Blunt. Aye. Aye. Mr. Booker. No. no. Mr. Bozeman. Aye. Aye. Mr. Braun. Aye. Aye. Mr. Brown. No. Mr. Burr. Aye. Ms. Cantwell. No. Mrs. Capito. Aye. Mr. Carden. No. Mr. Carper. 
No, Mr. Casey. No, Mr. Cassidy. Aye, Ms. Collins. No, Mr. Coons. No, Mr. Cornyn. Aye, Ms. Cortez Masto. No, Mr. Cotton. Aye, Mr. Kramer. Aye, Mr. Crapo. Aye, Mr. Cruz. Aye, Mr. Danes. Aye, Ms. Duckworth. No, Mr. Durbin. No, Mr. Inzi. Aye, Ms. Ernst. Aye, Mrs. Feinstein. No, Mrs. Fisher. Aye, Mr. Gardner. Aye, Mrs. Gillibrand. No, Mr. Graham. Aye, Mr. Grassley. Aye, Ms. Harris. No, Ms. Hassan. No, Mr. Hawley. Aye, Mr. Heinrich. No, Ms. Hirono. No, Mr. Hoven. Aye, Mrs. Hyde Smith. Aye. Aye, Mr. Inhoff. Aye, Mr. Johnson. Aye. Aye, Mr. Jones. No, Mr. Kane. No, Mr. Kennedy. Aye, Mr. King. No, Ms. Klobuchar. No, Mr. Lankford. Aye. Aye, Mr. Leahy. No, Mr. Lee. Aye, Aye Mrs. Leffler. Aye. Aye, Mr. Manchin. No, Mr. Markey. No, Mr. McConnell. Aye, Ms. McSally. Aye, Mr. Menendez. No, Mr. Merkley. No, Mr. Moran. Aye, Ms. Murkowski. Aye, Mr. Murphy. No, Mrs. Murray. No, Mr. Paul. Aye, Mr. Purdue. Aye, Mr. Peters. No, Mr. Portman. Aye. Mr. Reed. No, Mr. Risch. Aye. Mr. Roberts. Aye. Mr. Romney. No, Ms. Rosen. No, Mr. Rounds. Aye, Mr. Rubio. Aye, Mr. Sanders. No, Mr. Sass. Aye, Mr. Schatz. No, Mr. Schumer. No, Mr. Scott of Florida. Aye, Mr. Scott of South Carolina. Aye, Mrs. Shaheen. No, Mr. Shelby. Aye, Ms. Cinema. No, Ms. Smith. No, Ms. Stabenow. No, Mr. Sullivan. Aye. Aye, Mr. Tester. No, Mr. Thune. Aye, Mr. Tillis. Aye, Aye Mr. Toomey. Aye. Aye, Mr. Udall. No, Mr. Van Hollen. No, Mr. Warner. No, Mr. Ms. Warren. No, Mr. Whitehouse. No, Mr. Wicker. Aye, Mr. Wyden. No, Mr. Young. Aye.
Are there any senators in the chamber wishing to vote or change his or her vote? If not, the yeas are 51, the nays are 49. The motion is agreed to. The Democratic leader is recognized. Mr. Chief Justice, I send an amendment to the desk to subpoena John R. Bolton, provided further that there be one day for a deposition presided over by the Chief Justice and one day for live testimony before the Senate, both of which must occur within five days of the adoption of the underlying resolution, and I ask that it be read. The clerk will report. The Senator from New York, Mr. Schumer, proposes an amendment number 1297. At the appropriate place of the matter following the resolving clause. Be considered as read. Without objection. So order. The majority leader is recognized. I move to table the amendment and ask for the A's and A's. Are there, is there a sufficient second? There is. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Aye. Mr. Alexander, aye. Ms. Baldwin. No. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Barrasso. Aye. Mr. Barrasso, aye. Mr. Bennett. No. Mr. Bennett, no. Mrs. Blackburn. Aye. Mrs. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Blumenthal. Mr. Blumenthal, no. Mr. Blunt. Aye. Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Booker. No. Mr. Booker, no. Mr. Bozeman. Aye. Mr. Bozeman, aye. Mr. Braun. Aye. Mr. Braun, aye. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown, no. Mr. Burr. Mr. Burr, aye. Ms. Cantwell. Ms. Cantwell, no. Mrs. Capito. Mrs. Capito, aye. Mr. Cardin. Mr. Cardin, no. Mr. Carper. Mr. Carper, no. Mr. Casey. Mr. Casey, no. Mr. Cassidy. Mr. Cassidy, aye. Ms. Collins. Ms. Collins, no. Mr. Coons. Mr. Coons, no. Mr. Cornyn. Mr. Cornyn, aye. Ms. Cortez Masto. Ms. Cortez Masto, no. Mr. Cotton. Aye. Mr. Cotton, aye. Mr. Kramer. Mr. Kramer, aye. Mr. Crapo. Mr. Crapo, aye. Mr. Cruz. Mr. Cruz, aye. Mr. Danes. Mr. Danes, aye. Ms. Duckworth. Ms. Duckworth, no. Mr. Durbin. Mr. Durbin, no. Mr. Enzi. Mr. Enzi, aye. Ms. Ernst. Ms. Ernst, aye. Mrs. Feinstein. Mrs. Feinstein, no. Mrs. Fisher. Mrs. Fisher, aye. Mr. Gardner. Mr. Gardner, aye. Mrs. Gillibrand. Mrs. Gillibrand, no. Mr. Graham. Mr. Graham, aye. Mr. Grassley. Mr. Grassley, aye. Ms. Harris. Ms. Harris, no. Ms. Hassan. Ms. Hassan, no. Mr. Hawley. Mr. Hawley, aye. Mr. Heinrich. Mr. Heinrich, no. Ms. Hirono. Ms. Hirono, no. Mr. Hoven. Mr. Hoven, Aye, Mrs. Hyde Smith. Aye. Mrs. Hyde Smith. Aye, Mr. Inhoff. Aye. Mr. Inhoff. Aye, Mr. Johnson. Aye. Mr. Johnson. Aye, Mr. Jones. No. Mr. Jones. No, Mr. Kane. No. Mr. Kane. No, Mr. Kennedy. Aye. Mr. Kennedy. Aye, Mr. King. No. Mr. King. No, Ms. Klobuchar. Ms. Klobuchar, no. Mr. Langford. Mr. Langford, aye. Mr. Leahy. Mr. Leahy, no. Mr. Lee. Mr. Lee, aye. Mrs. Leffler. Mrs. Leffler, aye. Mr. Manchin. Mr. Manchin, no. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey, no. Mr. McConnell. Mr. McConnell. Aye. Ms. McSally. 
Ms. McSally, aye. Mr. Menendez, yeah. Mr. Menendez, no. Mr. Merkley, Mr. Merkley, no. Mr. Moran, aye. Mr. Moran, aye. Ms. Murkowski, aye. Ms. Murkowski, aye. Mr. Murphy, Mr. Murphy, no. Mrs. Murray, Mrs. Murray, no. Mr. Paul, Mr. Paul, aye. Mr. Perdue. Mr. Perdue, aye. Mr. Peters. Mr. Peters, no. Mr. Portman. Mr. Portman, aye. Mr. Reed. Mr. Reed, no. Mr. Risch. Mr. Risch, aye. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts, aye. Mr. Romney. No. Mr. Romney, no. Ms. Rosen. Ms. Rosen, no. Mr. Rounds. Mr. Rounds, aye. Mr. Rubio. Mr. Rubio, aye. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sanders, no. Mr. Sass. Mr. Sass, aye. Mr. Schatz. Mr. Schatz, no. Mr. Schumer. No. Mr. Schumer, no. Mr. Scott of Florida. Aye. Mr. Scott of Florida, aye. Mr. Scott of South Carolina. Aye. Mr. Scott of South Carolina, aye. Mrs. Shaheen. Aye. Mrs. Shaheen, no. Mr. Shelby. Mr. Shelby, aye. Ms. Cinema. Yes. Ms. Cinema, no. Ms. Smith. Ms. Smith, no. Ms. Stabenow, Ms. Stabenow, no. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Tester, Mr. Tester, no. Mr. Thune, Mr. Thune, aye. Mr. Tillis, aye. Mr. Tillis, aye. Mr. Toomey, aye. Mr. Toomey, aye. Mr. Udall, Mr. Udall, no. Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Van Hollen, no. Mr. Warner, Mr. Warner, no. Ms. Warren, no. Ms. Warren, no. Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Whitehouse, no. Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wicker, aye. Mr. Wyden, Mr. Wyden, no. Mr. Young, Mr. Young, aye. Is there any member in the chamber who wishes to vote or change his or her vote? If no, the yeas are 51, the nays are 49. The motion is agreed to. Mr. Chief Justice. The Senator from Maryland. Mr. Chief Justice, I send an amendment to the desk to have the Chief Justice rule on motions to subpoena witnesses and documents and to rule on any assertion of privilege. And I ask that it be read. The clerk will report. Thank you. The senator from Maryland, Mr. Van Hollen, proposes an amendment number 1298. At the appropriate place in the matter, following the resolving clause, insert the following. Notwithstanding any other provision of this resolution, the presiding officer shall issue a subpoena for any witness or any document that a senator or a party moves to subpoena. If the presiding officer determines that the witness or document is likely to have probative evidence relevant to either article of impeachment before the Senate and consistent with the authority of the presiding officer to rule on all questions of evidence, 
shall rule on any assertion of privilege. Leader is recognized. Mr. Chief Justice, I move to table the amendment and ask for the yeas and nays. Is there a sufficient second? There is. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Aye. Aye. Ms. Baldwin. No. Mr. Barrasso. Aye. Aye. Mr. Bennett. No. Mrs. Blackburn. Aye. Aye. Mr. Blumenthal. No. Mr. Blunt. Aye. Aye. Mr. Booker. No. Mr. Bozeman. Aye. Aye. Mr. Braun. Aye. Aye. Mr. Brown. No. Mr. Burr. Aye. Ms. Cantwell. No. Mrs. Capito. Aye. Mr. Cardin. No. Mr. Carper. No. Mr. Casey. No. Mr. Cassidy. Aye. Ms. Collins. Aye. Mr. Coons. No. Mr. Cornyn. Aye. Ms. Cortez Masto. No. Mr. Cotton. Aye. Mr. Kramer. Aye. Mr. Crapo. Aye. Mr. Cruz. Aye. Mr. Danes. Aye. Ms. Duckworth. No. Mr. Durbin. No. Mr. Inzi. Aye. Ms. Ernst. Aye. Mrs. Feinstein. No. Mrs. Fisher. Aye. Mr. Gardner. Aye. Mrs. Gillibrand. No. Mr. Graham. Aye. Mr. Grassley. Aye. Ms. Harris. No. Ms. Hassan. No. Mr. Hawley. Aye. Aye. Mr. Heinrich. No. Ms. Hirono. No. Mr. Hoven. Aye. Mrs. Hyde-Smith. Aye. Mr. Inhoff. Aye. Mr. Johnson. Aye. Mr. Jones. No. Mr. Kane. No. Mr. Kennedy. Aye. Mr. King. No. Ms. Klobuchar. No. Mr. Lankford. Aye. Mr. Leahy. No. Mr. Lee. Aye. Aye. Mrs. Leffler. Aye. Mr. Manchin. No. Mr. Markey. No. Mr. McConnell. Aye. Mrs. Ms. McSally. Aye. Mr. Menendez. No. Mr. Merkley. No. Mr. Moran. Aye. Ms. Murkowski. Aye. Mr. Murphy. No. Mrs. Murray. No. Mr. Paul. Aye. Mr. Purdue. Aye. Mr. Peters. No. Mr. Portman. Aye. Mr. Reed. No. Mr. Risch. Aye. Mr. Roberts. Aye. Mr. Romney. Aye. Ms. Rosen. No. Mr. Rounds. Aye. Mr. Rubio. Aye. Mr. Sanders. No. Mr. Sass. Aye. Mr. Schatz. No. Mr. Schumer. No, Mr. Scott of Florida. Aye. Aye, Mr. Scott of South Carolina. Aye. Mrs. Shaheen. No, Mr. Shelby. 
Aye. Ms. Cinema. No. no. Ms. Smith. No. Ms. Stabenow. No. Mr. Sullivan. Aye. Aye. Mr. Tester. No. Mr. Thune. Aye. Mr. Tillis. Aye. Aye. Mr. Toomey. Aye. Aye. Mr. Udall. No. Mr. Van Hollen. No. Mr. Warner. No. Ms. Warren. No. no Mr. Whitehouse. No. no. Mr. Wicker. No. Aye. Mr. Wyden. No. no Mr. Young. Aye. Is there any senator in the chamber wishing to vote or change his or her vote? If no, the yeas are 53, the nays are 47. The motion is agreed to. Right now. The question occurs on the adoption of Senate Resolution 488. Is there a sufficient second? There is. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Aye. Mr. Alexander, aye. Ms. Baldwin. Aye. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Barrasso. Aye. Mr. Barrasso, aye. Mr. Bennett. No. Mr. Bennett, no. Mrs. Blackburn. Aye. Mrs. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Blumenthal. Aye. Mr. Blumenthal, no. Mr. Blunt. Aye. Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Booker. Mr. Booker, no. Mr. Bozeman, Mr. Bozeman, aye. Mr. Braun, aye. Mr. Braun, aye. Mr. Brown, Mr. Brown, no. Mr. Burr, Mr. Burr, aye. Ms. Cantwell, Ms. Cantwell, no. Mrs. Capucho, Mrs. Capucho, aye. Mr. Cardin. Mr. Cardin, no. Mr. Carper, Mr. Carper, no. Mr. Casey, Mr. Casey, no. Mr. Cassidy, Mr. Cassidy, aye. Ms. Collins, Ms. Collins, aye. Mr. Coons, Mr. Coons, no. Mr. Cornyn, Mr. Cornyn, aye. Ms. Cortez Masto, Ms. Cortez Masto, no, Mr. Cotton. Aye. Mr. Cotton, aye. Mr. Kramer, Mr. Kramer, aye. Mr. Crapo, Mr. Crapo, aye. Mr. Cruz, Mr. Cruz, aye. Mr. Danes, Mr. Danes, aye. Ms. Duckworth, Ms. Duckworth, no. Mr. Durbin, Mr. Durbin, no. Mr. Renzi, Mr. Renzi, Aye, Ms. Ernst. Ms. Ernst. Aye. Mrs. Feinstein. Mrs. Feinstein. No. Mrs. Fisher. Mrs. Fisher. Aye. Mr. Gardner. Mr. Gardner. Aye. Mrs. Gillibrand. Mrs. Gillibrand. No. Mr. Graham. Mr. Graham. Aye. Mr. Grassley. Mr. Grassley. Aye. Ms. Harris. Ms. Harris. No. Ms. Hassan. Ms. Hassan. No. Mr. Hawley. Aye. Mr. Hawley. Aye. Mr. Heinrich. Mr. Heinrich. No. Ms. Hirono. Ms. Hirono. No. Mr. Hoven. Mr. Hoven. Aye. Mrs. Hyde Smith. Aye. Mrs. Hyde Smith. Aye. Mr. Inhofe. Mr. Inhofe. Aye. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson. Aye. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. No. Mr. Kane. Mr. Kane. No. Mr. Kennedy. 
Mr. Kennedy, aye. Mr. King, Mr. King, no. Ms. Klobuchar, Ms. Klobuchar, no. Mr. Langford, Mr. Langford, aye. Mr. Leahy, Mr. Leahy, no. Mr. Lee, Mr. Lee, aye. Mrs. Leffler, Mrs. Leffler, aye. Mr. Manchin, Mr. Manchin, no. Mr. Markey, Mr. Markey, no. Mr. McConnell, Mr. McConnell, aye. Ms. McSally, Ms. McSally, aye. Mr. Menendez, Mr. Menendez, no. Mr. Merkley, Mr. Merkley, no. Mr. Moran, aye. Mr. Moran, aye. Ms. Murkowski, Ms. Murkowski, aye. Mr. Murphy, Mr. Murphy, no. Mrs. Murray, Mrs. Murray, no. Mr. Paul, aye. Mr. Paul, aye. Mr. Perdue. Mr. Perdue, aye. Mr. Peters, Mr. Peters, no. Mr. Portman, Mr. Portman, aye. Mr. Reed, Mr. Reed, no. Mr. Risch, Mr. Risch, aye. Mr. Roberts, order. Mr. Roberts, aye. Mr. Romney, Mr. Romney, aye. Ms. Rosen, Ms. Rosen, no. Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rounds, aye. Mr. Rubio, Mr. Rubio, aye. Mr. Sanders, Mr. Sanders, no. Mr. Sass, Mr. Sass, aye. Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schatz, no. Mr. Schumer, Mr. Schumer, no. Mr. Scott of Florida, Mr. Scott of Florida, Aye, Mr. Scott of South Carolina. Mr. Scott of South Carolina. Aye, Mrs. Shaheen. Mrs. Shaheen, no. Mr. Shelby. Mr. Shelby, aye. Ms. Cinema. Ms. Cinema, no. Ms. Smith. Ms. Smith, no. Ms. Stabenow. Ms. Stabenow, no. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan. Aye, Mr. Tester, Mr. Tester, no. Mr. Thune, Mr. Thune, aye. Mr. Tillis, aye. Mr. Tillis, aye. Mr. Toomey, Mr. Toomey, aye. Mr. Udall, Mr. Udall, no. Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Van Hollen, no. Mr. Warner, Mr. Warner, no. Ms. Warren. No. Ms. Warren. No. Mr. Whitehouse. Mr. Whitehouse. No. Mr. Wicker. Mr. Wicker. Aye. Mr. Wyden. Mr. Wyden. No. Mr. Young. Mr. Young. Aye. Is there any member in the chamber who wishes to vote or change his or her vote? If no, the yeas are 53, the nays are 47. The resolution is agreed to. Mr. Majority Leader. Mr. Chief Justice, <clears throat> I ask unanimous consent that the secretary be authorized to include statements of senators explaining their votes, either given or submitted during the legislative sessions of the Senate on Monday, February 3rd, Tuesday, February 4th, and Wednesday, February 5th, along with the full record of the Senate's proceedings, 
and the filings by the parties in a Senate document printed under the supervision of the Secretary of the Senate that will complete the documentation of the Senate's handling of these impeachment proceedings. Without objection, so ordered. <laughs> Further, I ask unanimous consent that when the Senate resumes legislative session on Monday, February 3rd, Tuesday, February 4th, and Wednesday, February 5th, the Senate be in a period of morning business with senators permitted to speak for up to 10 minutes each for debate only. Without objection, so ordered. <clears throat> and finally, I ask unanimous consent that the trial adjourn until 11 a.m. February 3rd, and that this order also constitute the adjournment of the Senate. Without objection, so ordered. We are adjourned. <laughs>
out, make it appear like they're having a more fair process. And also, uh, Republicans say that Democrats had threatened to really throw, you know, throw everything off the rails by offering vote after vote after vote, and they had no idea when it was going to end. And so they knew it could get very messy if they did not have this resolution, something that the moderates agreed to and something that Democrats agreed to, and that is a vote on Wednesday. And so that is how they brought the White House on board, Allison. Leanne, no impeachment trial proceedings tomorrow, nothing on Sundays. Does that mean several senators uh, were running out of, uh, uh, out of Capitol Hill today trying to catch planes to head over to Iowa? Yeah, not only some were catching planes to go home, others were catching planes to go to Iowa. Remember, there's uh, four senators, uh, Bernie Sanders, uh, Elizabeth Warren, Amy Klobuchar, and uh, Senator Bennett, who are all still in this presidential race, and they had not been able to spend a lot of time in Iowa over the past couple weeks, and so they are on immediate flights uh, to Iowa. Uh, there is one waiting for uh, Bernie Sanders at Reagan National, um, and Amy Klobuchar has an event first thing tomorrow morning. And so they are thrilled that they can get in one last weekend of campaigning before caucus day, Allison. Leanne, of course we know that they'll all want to be back uh, for the vote on Wednesday, but are they required to be here for the closing arguments on Monday and Tuesday as well? Do we know that? It's an excellent question. They are required to be here on Monday for the closing arguments. They're only expected to take four hours, so that could leave some time for these uh, senators to get back to Iowa for caucus night. Um, as far as Tuesday is concerned, they do not have to be here. It is not going to be part of the impeachment proceedings. It's going to be outside of that. It's going to be a day reserved for senators to come and talk. So, no, the senators do not have to sit in the chamber, so those candidates can continue on to New Hampshire to continue campaigning campaigning. They will have to be back Wednesday at 4 o'clock, though, for this vote. Leanne Caldwell, you have filled in so many details for us tonight, and I will remind uh, our viewers that you were the first to lay out what this schedule might look like, and the schedule that you predicted did, in fact, come to be. So some great reporting today. Thank you so much for bringing it to us. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, let's get a legal take on this. And for that, we are going to go to legal expert, uh, NBC News legal analyst, Glenn Kirshner. Glenn, I think you have set a record this evening as the most referenced guest we have ever had. Every single person we had on tonight, uh, whether they agreed with what you're saying or they didn't, brought you up tonight. Uh, let's get your views, your thoughts on how things played out this evening, on the motions, on the, the schedule laid out. What do you make of it? So, first of all, I am now determined never to use the term impeachment trial in connection with what we are watching. I'm going to call them impeachment speeches. We heard opening statements, speeches, not evidence. We're now going to go to closing arguments, speeches, not evidence. This is not a trial. A trial has witnesses, documents, and evidence. This is a sham. This is a cover-up. This is a rush to an unjust acquittal. That's what we've just seen. Now, I agree with Jill and with Nick who have said, now it's time to actually subpoena fact witnesses, albeit in the House of Representatives. You know what? Governmental oversight by the Congress of the executive branch doesn't stop just because we are headed toward a sham acquittal. What the president did was a crime. It constituted a high crime and misdemeanor. He bribed and extorted President Zelensky trying to get unlawful foreign interference in our election. He obstructed Congress. That is an enumerated offense in the United States Criminal Code at 18 U.S. Code 1505. He committed crimes. The fact that the Republican senators have declined or will decline to hold him accountable doesn't mean congressional oversight of executive branch crime, corruption, abuse has to stop. In fact, it has to continue because everyone in the executive branch who assisted Trump in those crimes needs to be investigated, needs to be held accountable. We just heard um, Bolton implicate Sip alone in potential wrongdoing. We just heard Lev Parnes implicate Barr in potential wrongdoing. That has to be investigated. Barr won't investigate it. He's, he should be conflicted out. But basically, he's saying anything that could touch me, I've exonerated myself. So I won't even open an investigation. So congressional 
oversight needs to continue. You know, in my 30 years as a trial court prosecutor, I lost plenty of cases. When I lost a case against somebody and I knew that person was still engaged in criminal conduct, I didn't stop. You know what I did? I opened another grand jury investigation. I investigated it. If the evidence supported it, I indicted them. And I went back to trial, win, lose, or draw. That's what the Congress needs to continue doing. You don't just throw up your hands because you lost. You continue to attack wrongdoing. I have so many questions here. The first, though, I think, uh, look, you have the, the courtroom experience here. Most of us, the only courtroom experience we've ever had is if we're on jury duty, as reporters, if we've covered it from the outside looking in, as viewers, watching shows like Law & Order and things like that. But I think most people can tell you that they're used to seeing some sort of arguments, some sort of witnesses questioning, cross-examination testimony, and some sort of closing. It almost seems here like we've got a sandwich that doesn't have the meat in it, that we've got the bread. I think some people might be wondering, well, how can this happen here? It wouldn't happen in a court of law. We know this is different, but how? what is different about this process? How can this happen in the Senate? Um, it can happen if the majority in the Senate decide that fairness is not important. 75%, the recent polls show, of the American people want witnesses. So now the good news is the House of Representatives has the opportunity to give the people what they want and what America deserves witnesses. And that's not vindictive. People will say, well, you lost this round, so you're going to vindictively continue to go after Trump and company. No, there are crimes that have gone unaddressed. There are witnesses with sharply incriminating information about the president, about Pompeo, about Mulvaney, and others. That needs to be addressed. You don't just stop. Let me ask you this then. Let's just say, playing devil's advocate for argument's sake, let's just say he didn't commit crimes here. But he's on trial, and you hear from witnesses, and then the jurors, the Senate, then still have the decision to acquit, correct? Yeah. I mean, even if, let's just say, even if the president did not commit any of the, the crimes that you're saying he committed here, you go on trial, you hear from the witnesses, and he should be cleared, correct? Yeah. And if the president didn't commit crimes or didn't commit impeachable offenses, then it would have been good to see the witnesses and the evidence that could prove to back that. that up, correct? So we could have confidence in the result. Now, no one, no thinking person will ever have confidence in the coming acquittal that we all suspect we're going to see next week right. because there was no evidence to support that acquittal. There was simply partisan politics. What do you expect? I know that we expect an acquittal on Wednesday. I know that you have said that you think uh, or you would like to see uh, this this not be the end of it, that there will continue to be witnesses. What do you think will happen? I mean, does, does, do we wake up on Thursday and does a whole new process start where uh, the House is, is looking into subpoenaing witnesses and, and sort of I don't want to say having an impeachment all over again, but continuing the investigating? Yeah, and whether it results in additional articles of impeachment against the president, whether it results in articles of impeachment against Bill Barr. For 24 years, before I recently retired, the Department of Justice was my home. And my heart breaks for the hardworking men and women, more than 100,000 of them, and I still speak with all of my friends and colleagues who are there, my heart breaks for them having to labor under a corrupt attorney general who is doing the president's bidding, not protecting the country. So regardless of whether there are additional articles of impeachment that could potentially touch the president, Bill Barr, Mulvaney, Pompeo, or others, Congress still has oversight responsibilities over the executive branch. That doesn't stop because of this orchestrated acquittal that we all see coming. Glenn Kirshner, we got the answer on witnesses tonight, but we still don't have the official answer on acquittal. We'll get that on Wednesday. No doubt we'll see you again before then. Thank you for spending so much time with Thank us. Thank you, Allison. Appreciate it.
All right, for more legal analysis, let's go to former assistant U.S. attorney in the Reagan administration, David Katz. He is joining us now. David, great to see you here. Uh, let me just ask you uh, off the top here, what do you make of what we saw tonight? It was a, a bit of an interesting evening. We had a very long pause uh, before the vote on witnesses tonight. We now know that was uh, the Democrats and the Republicans trying to work out a deal on how to land the plane, so to speak, in terms of uh, finishing up this Senate trial. What do you think of what we saw tonight? Well, it was a sad day uh, for the Senate, and I agree with Glenn that looking at it on balance, it's a sad day for the Department of Justice that we're all so proud to have been with, all of us who are former uh, you know, assistant United States attorneys. I, I do think that Adam Schiff acquitted himself extremely well. I used to work with him in the government, and I think he really will emerge as a hero. You know, we had another great uh, Congress member in uh, Abraham Lincoln, also a great debater. And uh, Adam Schiff really did a fine job. And I think the people who are gloomy about the rule of law and gloomy about the result, uh, it was always a foregone conclusion that there wouldn't be 20 Republican senators uh, who would agree to remove the president, no matter what was shown. I mean, there's just too much in the bag for Trump. So you look at politically what happened out of this, and I think the Republican senators lost the Senate. I think there's no doubt about it. Uh, 75 to 20 percent of uh, voters, including in their districts, wanted to see witnesses. They just voted against witnesses. And you know, Allison, the Trump talking point is that, well, uh, there were some witnesses in Adam Schiff's House Intelligence Committee. Yes, there were some witnesses, but you'll remember they were not allowed to bring in documents. Uh, President Trump stonewalled all the agencies from bringing in documents. He didn't allow there to be any kind of a fair hearing, even of the witnesses who were called in the Intelligence Committee. But the fallacy with the argument is not just the lack of documents and the stonewalling by Trump of the documents. The fallacy is that in any trial, even if you could call it somewhat of a trial because there were some statements that were repeated in the opening statement, you could say that they were sort of like witnesses. But once you had a denial by the president on certain bases, like it's all hearsay, that any judge in his or her right mind would allow the prosecutor to call rebuttal witnesses. Where was Bolton as a rebuttal witness to rebut the idea that it was all hearsay? Bolton was in the room where it happened. He could say exactly what the president said. It debunked all of those arguments, Allison, and yet they weren't allowed to be uh, presented. Uh, so, of course, this was just a farce today. They wouldn't even allow the chief justice. Now, here are the Republicans who control the Senate who won't allow a chief justice appointed by a Republican president, the, 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 uh, the chief justice who's known for Citizens United and other cases that are totally pro-Republican, the Republican senators wouldn't even allow him to call whether subpoenaed witnesses should be allowed like Bolton. And on top of Bolton, Allison, you have people like Mulvaney. He's so obviously relevant. He's another person who was in the room where it happened. Pompeo, the person who's told the DOD, the person from OMB who told DOD, don't release the funds, what was it, two hours after Trump's phone call. And then you have all of this huge amount of evidence. So I agree with Glenn very much when he said that I do expect that the House Intelligence Committee and maybe the Judiciary Committee to start issuing subpoenas quite promptly for Bolton, I think Pompeo, and maybe he's right even as to Barr. It has certainly not been a glorious day, a uh, glorious time for the Department of Justice since Barr took over, since the Attorney General is supposed to be the attorney for the people of the United States, not the personal attorney like Giuliani, just for the president and the president's political agenda, which is what Barr is certainly perceived as being. And I think when you look at what he did in the Mueller probe, where he issued that uh, report over the weekend, that kind of diverted the whole purpose that uh, uh, was in Bolton's report. Excuse me, that was in um, Mueller's report. Mueller's report, yep. It's, it's, been, it's, been a, it's, been a bad, it's been a bad couple of uh, uh, months and years with the Mueller investigation and Trump stonewalling that investigation, too. Uh, David, I know you said that this was a farce, but can I ask you just to, to look at the flip side? Was there anything uh, in the arguments from the, the president's lawyers, any point that they made that you said, uh, OK, I can get behind this. This is a valid point. I see this argument. Uh, this works for me. Well, I, I think not, because the, the best argument, one that Trump is incapable of making because he doesn't have self-reflection and he doesn't have remorse, was I made a huge mistake. I won't do anything like that again. I won't urge China to uh, you know, investigate the Bidens. 
I'm sorry I did it, and I'm going to run a clean re-election campaign, and I'm going to make sure that it's clean. That he would never do. That was sort of what Clinton did. Clinton said, I did wrong. It was a personal matter, but I did wrong. Please forgive me. And uh, the country split, unfortunately, on partisan basis. But I think a lot of people thought that Clinton certainly did not engage in conduct for which he should have been removed. But when you turn to the arguments that they actually made, you know, look at what Rubio and Alexander basically said. They said what the president did was wrong, it was inappropriate, but it wasn't impeachable. Al said, why on earth wasn't this impeachable? To shake down a foreign country so that they would give political aid or give an announcement that would be construed or used as political aid, why on earth is that not impeachable conduct to withhold $400 million that these senators who are going to vote to acquit, that these senators voted for, and to hide that and to have it only come out once a brave whistleblower came forward and the president knew that he'd been caught red-handed, put on a secret server so that people wouldn't find it. If that's not impeachable conduct, I don't know what is. It's really worse than Nixon, and Nixon had to resign. David, thank you so much for being with us. Great to see you on such an important night. Appreciate it. Great to be with you. It's an historic night. All right, let's see what the White House and the administration is saying tonight. NBC's Kelly O'Donnell is in West Palm Beach, Florida, where the president was headed tonight. Kelly, do we have word? Has the president arrived in Florida yet? Yes, he is in Florida with family here. He'll be spending the weekend at Mar-a-Lago, his private home and private club, and they have their annual Super Bowl party at that, uh, at the club. So that is what would be a typical weekend for the president in the winter months. Nothing else about this night has been typical, certainly, as you've been discussing with impeachment. And the president also poised to give his own State of the Union address, which is scheduled for Tuesday in the House chamber. And now we know the impeachment trial will not be over by that point, and that is certainly a new wrinkle in the mindset of how the president would be planning for delivering that important address and how the White House is planning for that as well. We don't have any indication that that schedule will change at this point, uh, but it certainly puts the president in a different framework because, of course, he had hoped uh, from basically our reporting and the sources have told us that he wanted to be more of a triumphant arrival in that House chamber, if you can call it that, by having been acquitted. Now, of course, half of the chamber being Democrats, many of them voting against the president in this, it would not be the typical kind of a welcome you might expect for a president. We'll have to see how that plays out on Tuesday night if things go as planned. We're normally out of respect and out of tradition. Uh, there's a certain amount of bipartisanship on a State of the Union night. How will that be different this time? That's something we'll certainly be watching for. There are some questions still remaining about which senators will choose to argue and speak for their positions on the record about why they made their decisions on issues like witnesses that you've been discussing, and then ultimately, of course, the vote whether to convict or acquit the president on these two articles of impeachment. So the president may get a little bit of downtime this weekend, but behind the scenes expect a lot of preparations for the State of the Union address, and maybe to some extent uh, kind of the final uh, turning of the corner toward the end of his trial with any uh, information he might be exchanging back and forth with lawyers. We are told from sources that Senator McConnell did reach the president by phone and laid out this final uh, sort of schedule of the trial and that the president signed off on that, which suggests to us that the president understood that the State of the Union would happen while it is still an open question, although one predicts that he will be acquitted. It will not be a resolved matter uh, when Tuesday night comes about. Allison? Kelly, this is something we asked you about earlier tonight, but in case we have uh, some viewers just joining us, uh, we know that the president has not shied away in the past from addressing impeachment at a campaign rally or other events. We do know the State of the Union is a very different type of evening. Could we expect, uh, with impeachment still going on with the president, uh, the acquittal vote not yet happening, happening, of course, as you mentioned, on Wednesday, could we expect the president to address that Tuesday night, or is this just not that kind of venue? We don't have that guidance yet from mm -hmm. the people who've been crafting the speech. But what we know from our experience is the president is very much aware of big television moments and very much aware of trying to connect either with the audience in the room or the audience watching at home. And if there has ever been an 800-pound gorilla 
uh, or a pink elephant in the room to mix <laughs> yeah. my zoo-like images, uh, <laughs> certainly impeachment in the chamber would be hanging in the air, right? So one could imagine he would make some reference to it. At the same time, he will sort of be uh, kind of trapped by the trappings of the night, having to shake Nancy Pelosi's hand when he has been uh, very uh, critical of her for a long time related to impeachment. That's just one of the issues that is a part of the set dressing of a State of the Union night. So we don't have a specific answer. The purpose of the speech, of course, is different. It's about the agenda items going forward. It's about the state of the country. Uh, but it would be uh, certainly within the president's style to make some reference, even if it is an oblique one, uh, to impeachment, given everything the country has been going through. Allison? Kelly, uh, I don't know if there are any events where we can expect to be hearing from the president tonight, uh, throughout the weekend. I know, of course, you're in West Palm Beach to see what will go on this weekend. Is there anything on the calendar yet or anything we should be watching for when we might hear from him between now and uh, next week when we're back uh, into the impeachment trial? Well, we've gotten accustomed to Saturdays being a full trial day, yeah. and uh, that's not happening this weekend. And the president does not have uh, planned events that are public on his schedule. On Sunday, uh, we do expect to have at least pictures of him related to uh, the Super Bowl party that happens at Mar-a-Lago. Again, not the kind of setting where the president would typically take questions. And we've also seen a trend line in recent weeks where he has been, he's done some interviews, but has not done the kind of interaction with reporters reporters uh, shouting questions at him. He is not engaged in as much of that as he typically would. Uh, and we just we just assume that is a part of wanting to wait for the trial to reach its conclusion before he engages with reporters in the way we've been so accustomed to seeing. So my uh, my expectations are low for <laughs> getting new information from the president in terms of an on camera appearance. Certainly his Twitter feed is up and running 24 seven at his uh, at his will. So we'll be looking for that as well. All right. Low expectations for something on camera. Kelly, we have high expectations that that rain will stop and you'll get some sunshine tomorrow. Thank you so much. <laughs> Good to see you. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Good afternoon from the spin It's room. news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. The journey has begun. It'll take us through the debate stages, along the trails of Iowa and New Hampshire, onward to the town halls and convention halls, into the spin rooms and ballrooms. And as this journey unfolds, we'll be on the ground, at the big board, navigating the twists and turns every step of the way. We have nearly two and a half centuries of examples where the checks and balances of the constitutional system have worked. The framers designed the government for a moment like this. We weren't supposed to just give a pass to somebody whose team we decided to be on. We were supposed to actually think for ourselves. That's why we fought the revolution. That's why we've struggled again and again and again to make real those promises. Dateline episodes are now available as podcasts. Listen anytime, anywhere. Subscribe now so you don't miss a twist. Washington feels more chaotic than ever. It's my job to ask the tough questions, left and right, and help you make sense of it all. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. An insider's take on politics and more with some of my favorite reporters. Get it for free wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. One nearly 90% from the spin. It's room. news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. We are going to start with something different tonight. This is one of those things that you have not been otherwise hearing about in the news, but stick with me. Feed your mind with fresh perspective. Get your favorite MSNBC shows now as podcasts. 
The Senate voted not to call witnesses, but how will this trial, whether President Trump is acquitted or not, weigh in the upcoming presidential election? Joining me to debate this, among other things, Democratic strategist Max Burns and Republican strategist Joseph Pinion. And uh, l let me just start here. I'm going to start with you, Max, but what do you make of what happened tonight? I mean, it was quite an evening, uh, unlike, uh, unlike what we've been seeing in the Senate trial so far. We had the vote on the witnesses, but before that, all of this debate about yep. how uh, this would go on. Uh, on the Democratic side of things, what do you make of what happened tonight? I, this is a profoundly sad day for the American Republic and for the rule of law. I think we've seen how false all these arguments have been on the Republican side. We've been told repeatedly there's just no time to take witnesses. Uh, and now we have a vote postponed into next week. We could take witnesses at any time over the next couple days and get at least toward the truth, which it seems Republicans have completely lost interest in. And it's, it's a shocking thing to see people like Lisa Murkowski say, as if she's not a member of the Senate, that she feels the Senate failed, that she doesn't feel she can do anything to make them advance to the truth. I mean, that's, that's a shocking amount of cynicism for someone empowered to stand up for the laws of this country. Joseph, were you surprised? I mean, I know we got a, a preview. Alexander and several others started saying how they would vote today. Right. But were you surprised that in the end it was just Collins and Romney? Did you think maybe over the past couple of days that it might play out a little differently? No. <laughs> I mean, Not at all. Let, let us be completely clear here. I mean, with the, you know, they are who we thought they were, to quote the late Denny Green, coach of, the, uh, of many great illustrious football teams. I mean, look, Democrats have rushed through this entire process. I think, again, when you look at what transpired here, we could have actually extended this back. People forget that they, the vote in the House occurred, you know, a little over a month ago. So we're not talking about this thing that happened two, three, four months ago. You know, we could have drawn this process out. There was a political decision made not to actually go through that extended process because of the Iowa caucuses, because of 2020. Um, Republicans, again, have no interest um, in helping Democrats. And unfortunately, again, that goes towards getting towards the truth. And so now we find ourselves in this unfortunate place um, where we're not going to hear from witnesses. I mean, Mitt Romney's been un un disinvited from CPAC already. Um, so look, uh, it's, 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 it's really, uh, to your point, I think it is a sad day and ultimately um, who knows what's going to happen between now and Wednesday. You, you say that the Democrats rush things, but had they not, do you think it would have made a difference? I think if for the purposes of actually getting some type of, you know, stipulation from more Republicans, if, you're, if your goal is to compel the American people um, who are persuadable, and if your goal is to get Republicans who might be on the edge um, to actually go along with what's going on as far as getting more witnesses, I think it would have made a difference. I think when the call is coming from within the House, you know, as when a stranger calls, and now we've got, you know, leaks from the Bolton book, I think it would have been persuadable had this thing still been in the House, um, had Democrats demonstrated that they were more interested in truth than trying to actually have political victories happen. I think, yes, there could have been a compelling argument that could have been made to put more pressure on Republican lawmakers to say, yes, we'll call witnesses. Max, do you agree? Because, I mean, uh, look, we, maybe the Republicans weren't there, but by this week we had a poll that showed that 75 percent of Americans or, or registered voters wanted to hear from witnesses. Do you think, had this process gone a little differently, that perhaps the Republicans might have played ball there? Yeah, I think there was an opportunity here to have a real hearing, and it says a lot about where we start started, that we've referred to this the entire time as a countdown to when yeah. Mitch McConnell will vote to acquit President Trump. Uh, but whenever you cross 75 percent of the American people, you take a risk. And there are people who we've seen, like Marco Rubio, who said even if what the president did was impeachable, we can't take the risk of removing him. It's like saying King Kong is beating up the Empire State Building, but think about how expensive it would be to stop him. <laughs> it just it doesn't reflect American <laughs> values. And I think Republicans will pay a price for that. Let me, let me ask you this, then. Do you think Democrats will as well? Because, I mean, from what you're saying, it, it sounds to me like you think they played this wrong as well. Yeah, I mean, I think both sides have played this poorly, and the, the only per people that lose are the American people. Um, you know, to your point, yes, I, I, I think that, you know, people are going to take a hit for this, but I think also... 75% of the American people wanting witnesses does not mean that 75% of the people are going to vote on the fact that those people did not actually call witnesses, right? So there is what people right. pull on, and then there's what people vote, vote on. on. And Big as we get house. closer to Election yep. Day, it's yep. going to be less about they screwed up the impeachment process and more about do I have a job today? The 6 million people that have jobs beneath President Trump have wages gone up? Is my 401k looking rosier? Do I have a better mm -hmm. ability to feel secure in my retirement than I did four years ago? I think the Democrats have 
made a judgment call that they're not going to focus on the things that impact people's everyday lives. And in, in a search of kind of this, you know, silver lining of impeachment, which ultimately I think is going to cost them more than it gains them when we talk about 2020 and in the November elections. I want to ask you about, you brought up Marco Rubio, and Joseph, I want to ask you about this. And I'm going to read this statement because I do not want to misquote him. And I would like your take on this because uh, this is an interesting one to me. He says, that is why six weeks ago I announced that for me, the question would not just be whether the president's actions were wrong, but ultimately whether what he did was removable. The two are not the same, Rubio says. Just because actions meet a standard of impeachment does not mean it is in the best interest of the country to remove a president from office. I read that to be Marco Rubio saying an impeachable action, an action that meets a standard of impeachment is not necessarily removable. What, what do you make of that? I mean, that, that seems exactly what a removal uh, so, explain that one to me i'm so, having trouble look, I, mean, I, I think marco rubio is saying what many republicans have said since day one which is that why are we sitting here parsing language parsing transcripts and just get to we always knew we were going to be here which was saying that perhaps what president trump did was improper perhaps what he did was rightfully trigger an impeachment proceeding but the action in and of itself was not impeachable i think many republicans quietly would have loved to have gone forth with that argument i think Many Republicans have no choice um, but to fall back on that argument now that all of this information has come out with regard to the leaks from John Bolton. And it puts, Demo puts Republicans in an untenable situation because the fact that they are changing in the 11th hour, right, making all of a sudden you're making your closing arguments and suddenly you're presenting a new version of the events um, to the American people. I think that, again, that really, uh, you know, it kind of uh, uh, triggers the cynicism in the American people um, and gives Democrats the opportunity to say, see, we told you so they're not playing ball and they're not playing fairly. All right, so let's talk about how this is going to affect 2020. We have four senators tonight probably running to Iowa or other campaign events to make up for lost time because they were in, uh, in these, involved in these Senate proceedings and have not been campaigning. What did they go back out to the voters and say about what happened tonight? Well, you kind of saw toward the end there some of the 2020 candidates edging to the exits of the Senate <laughs> as they were voting and running out the door. Grabbing their really suitcases and getting out the door. But honestly, what we've seen in the polling is that impeachment is not a big energizing thing for voters when they're thinking about who they vote for as a Democrat. They're looking at kitchen table issues, jobs, economy, health care. Uh, but I think what you're going to see now that this has been made into such a circus that 75 percent of voters, as we mentioned, have been ignored, uh, that makes it an issue for voters. The last thing you want is voters to feel disrespected and talked at like they're stupid. And that's exactly what Republicans have done tonight. What do you make of uh, Collins' vote tonight, and how do you think that will, will play with voters? I mean, was that just uh, uh, posturing to, to play to her... her Look, I, I think we have a lot of people on both sides of the aisle who are wildly gesticulating to uh, television sets that are not being watched. Um, I think a lot of Americans have tuned out. I think we've said this many times that there is information overload. I, I know people who are political junkies who simply cannot take anymore. Um, so I think, you know, for, in the case of Collins, I think she's trying to make sure um, that to the extent that she's going to get hit with incoming, you know, fire from, you know, the outside group spending millions of dollars on her campaign to make sure that she's at least able to stand up there and say, I voted for witnesses and I lost the vote. Joseph, Max, great to have you both with us. Um, I, I have a feeling I'll be seeing you again next week since this isn't over yet. Thank you for being here tonight. Have a great weekend. Just two other presidents in American history have had Senate impeachment trials, Andrew Johnson and Bill Clinton. So how does President Trump's trial compare to theirs? Dasha Burns digs through the NBC News archives to find out. Throughout U.S. history, only three presidents have ever been impeached. Andrew Johnson, Bill Clinton, and now Donald Trump. President Nixon resigned before his trial went to the Senate. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. So the process we're watching today is incredibly rare, but not unprecedented. And we might be able to learn a little something now by understanding what happened back then. The most useful comparison is Clinton's impeachment. In this episode of Now and Then, we'll take a closer look at how that played out in the 90s and compare it to what we see today. In both cases, things played out in a changing media landscape. Clinton was on trial in the early days of 24-7 cable news. New allegations that President Clinton had an affair with a former White House intern and then urged her to lie about it. The salacious nature of the allegations meant this was a made-for-TV event. Did you 
to have sex with the president, or did he, and if, or did he ask for it, or some, something like that? I want you to listen to me. I'm going to say this again. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. But by the time the trial came around, all of the most shocking details had already been aired and re-aired all day, every day. So it wasn't quite as captivating anymore, especially because the results of the trial felt like a foregone conclusion. The parties were polarized and everyone expected the vote would fall pretty much on party lines, which it did. That's not so different from today, as most experts and voters think the Senate will acquit the president. We all know how it's going to end. There's no chance the president's going to be removed from office. But Trump's impeachment is also coinciding with a new media landscape. He's the first president to master the use of Twitter and social media to circumvent cable and broadcast news and talk directly to the public. Anytime, anywhere, any way he chooses often using the platform to bash impeachment and call it a hoax. And social media has made it even easier for people to choose the news that suits their views, exacerbating the echo chambers and the divide between the left and right. Meanwhile, the actual impeachment process has been drawn out, especially when it comes to witnesses. And calling witnesses was a sticking point in Clinton's trial as well. All 100 senators will meet in private tomorrow. The dispute escalated after House Republican prosecutors pressed to call more than a dozen witnesses, starting with Monica Lewinsky. What is wrong with witnesses? And there's even some overlap in the cast of characters. And significantly in this particular juncture in America's history, the Senate is being called to sit as the high court of impeachment all too frequently. Indeed, we're living in what I think can aptly be described as the age of impeachment. Any privilege can be invoked no matter how unmeritorious one thinks it is, that that's not an abuse. Perhaps we live in such a litigious age that that's the new way of doing things. I disagree with that. Another striking similarity is the geopolitical backdrop. At the White House tonight, the president is commander-in-chief of Operation Desert Storm and almost certainly just two days away from being impeached by the full House of Representatives. Compare that to today. It was a U.S. military strike that has killed Qasem Soleimani. Think of this as a three-eye morning, Iran impeachment in Iowa. He is taking us to the edge of war. But that doesn't mean they weren't commenting on impeachment while dealing with the international conflict. Here's what Clinton said about whether he'd resign as president. Do you intend to resign as did President Nixon? I have no intention of resigning. It's never crossed my mind. But there are also significant differences. Clinton's impeachment took longer as they appointed an independent counsel to lead an investigation. And it was months between Congress receiving a report and actually impeaching Clinton. But Trump's impeachment moved faster. The Justice Department declined to investigate. Instead, the House Intelligence Committee conducted an investigation, and the House impeached Trump just two weeks after releasing a 300-page report. And of course, there are the articles themselves. Clinton was impeached for perjury and obstruction of justice. He faced accusations much more personal in nature, stemming from a sexual harassment lawsuit and allegations of an affair with White House intern Monica Lewinsky. And then, of course, lying about it under oath. They did not constitute sexual relations as I understood that term to be defined at my January 17, 1998 deposition. Whereas Trump has been impeached for obstruction of Congress and abuse of power, all centered around allegations that he pushed Ukraine to find dirt on a political opponent and withheld congressionally approved aid in the process. You know what? There was no pressure. And you know there was, and by the way, you know there was no pressure. All you have to do is see it, what went on on the call. You will hear their testimony at the same time as the American people. That is, if you allow it if we have a fair trial. And as for public opinion, Clinton maintained approval ratings in the 60% range during impeachment hearings, and his approval even spiked to 73% after the trial. And although Trump's approval ratings are lower in the 40s range, there hasn't been a sizable shift in his ratings throughout the impeachment process so far. Clinton's Senate trial lasted for six weeks, and he was ultimately acquitted. Now that the Senate has fulfilled its constitutional responsibility, 
bringing this process to a conclusion. I want to say again to the American people how profoundly sorry I am for what I said and did to trigger these events and the great burden they have imposed on the Congress and on the American people. We'll see if President Trump ends up singing a similar tune in the weeks to come. Here to give us some historical perspective on, on what everyone has been calling a historic night, Princeton University politics professor Keith Whittington is with me now. And Keith, just your reaction to the night we saw on the Senate floor. Uh, it's pretty extraordinary. I mean, it's been a very rushed process. It was a rushed process through the House. Now it's a very rushed process through the Senate. Um, it's sort of amazing that they had not worked it out uh, more as to what, how exactly uh, the trial was going to play out. So it's uh, sort of a shocking moment in some ways that the senators genuinely don't know what they're doing and they're struggling to figure it out in real time. Every uh, impeachment trial to date has included witnesses in some way. Absolutely. How, uh, how, what do you say tonight that we officially have the decision, the vote, there will be no witnesses in this trial? I think it's shocking. I mean, just from a perspective of thinking about the Senate as an institution, thinking about how our constitutional processes work, um, it's really just a shocking departure from uh, anything the Senate has done uh, in the past. Um, the Clinton trial mm -hmm. was relatively short, relatively few witnesses compared to other impeachment trials um, all through American history. So maybe Maybe in some ways it foreshadowed uh, what we're getting uh, this time around, uh, but it's really quite remarkable that the Senate was willing to go this route. How about the argument that we've heard so many people making on the Republican side that, well, uh, you did have witnesses, you did have information in the House inquiry. Uh Historically, sure. though, that is not the same. Not the same. I mean, the Senate will not only call some of those same witnesses and some of those same documents um, so that they are asking questions themselves, but in addition, the Senates have historically uh, done their own processes. They've had their own witnesses, own documents introduced that were not introduced in the, in the House. And so the expectation in a Senate trial is they're going to do new, new and additional things uh, beyond what the House of Representatives has done. Uh, here and they just close it off. It's not surprising, I think, the senators uh, were paying attention to what was happening in the House. A lot of them were going to make up their mind based on what was happening in the House. And so certainly you expect them to take that on board, uh, but you expect them to do more than that um, in the Senate as well. Uh, we've been talking quite a bit tonight about Marco Rubio's statement. I'm not going to read it again because I've read it to people at length <laughs> this evening. But just to paraphrase, he made the point that something can rise to an impeachable offense but not be removable. You wrote a, a, right. about this at length yesterday. What, what do you say to that? Yeah, I think that uh, Rubio is pointing in the right direction for Senate Republicans who are looking for an avenue to try to acquit the president. Um, it'd be much more disturbing to me if, the, if they embrace the kind of argument uh, that Alan Dershowitz was making, um, that basically these are not impeachable offenses at all, that abuses of office are completely off the table, um, and the Senate and the House shouldn't be thinking about them. I think it's much more reasonable to say uh, this is within the scope of impeachable offenses, and both the House and the Senate need to exercise some political judgment to decide what to do about these, the nature of these offenses. In the House's judgment, it was worth impeaching moving forward. And it's not unreasonable for the Senate to say, uh, that at least for the majority of the Senate, that in our judgment, this isn't worth removing a president for, even though it may have been bad behavior. We've been talking so much about uh, the Senate trying to figure out, uh, and, and the House managers as well, both sides, trying to figure out how to land this plane, right. if you will. Does it really matter? Is it important politically yeah. how they wrap this up at the end of the day? It will be somewhat important. I mean, mm -hmm. we still have a moment which we've had uh, traditionally where senators will explain their votes. Uh, we'll have some of that, of course, informally. Senators will go back to the constituents and the like. But to some degree, they also will explain their votes formally. They will be entered into the record as to why exactly um, they're voting the way they are. Rubio is foreshadowing what that's going to look like for a lot of other senators. Um, and that will set the stage for thinking about what lessons should we draw away from this impeachment, how are senators thinking about the scope of the impeachment power uh, more generally. I mean, some of this is already baked in at this point, right. though. The fact of how the process worked is going to influence what future Senate impeachment trials um, look like. But it's still the case, I think, that um, what they say in terms of justifying uh, what they're doing and casting the final vote will matter in the long term as well. Keith, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, we yeah. will likely see you again next week because this is not <laughs> over yet. Thanks. No, not yet. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left.